Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter One. One may as well begin with Helen's letters to her sister. Howard's End, Tuesday. Dearest Meg, it isn't going to be what we expected. It is old and little, and altogether delightful, red brick. We can scarcely pack in as it is, and the dear knows what will happen when Paul, younger son, arrives to morrow. From hall you go right or left into dining room or drawing room. Hall itself is practically a room. You open another door in it, and there are the stairs going up in a sort of tunnel to the first floor. Three bedrooms in a row there, and three attics in a row above. That isn't all the house, really, but it's all that one notices. Nine windows as you look up from the front garden. Then there's a very big witch elm, to the left as you look up, leaning a little over the house, and standing on the boundary between the garden and meadow. I quite love that tree already. Also, ordinary elms, oaks, no nastier than ordinary oaks, pear trees, apple trees, and a vine. No silver birches, though. However, I must get on to my host and hostess. I only wanted to show that it isn't the least what we expected. Why did we settle that their house would be all gables and wiggles, and their garden all gambage coloured paths? I believe simply because we associate them with expensive hotels. Mrs. Wilcox trailing in beautiful dresses down long corridors, Mr. Wilcox bullying porters, etc. We females are that unjust. I shall be back Saturday. We'll let you know train later. They are as angry as I am that you did not come too. Really, Tibby is too tiresome. He starts a new mortal disease every month. How could he have got hay fever in London? And even if he could, it seems hard that you should give up a visit to hear a schoolboy sneeze. Tell him that Charles Wilcox, the son who is here, has hay fever too, but he's brave, and gets quite cross when we inquire after it. Men like the Wilcoxes would do Tibby a power of good. But you won't agree, and I'd better change the subject. This long letter is because I'm writing before breakfast. Oh, the beautiful vine leaves! The house is covered with a vine. I looked out earlier, and Mrs. Wilcox was already in the garden. She evidently loves it. No wonder she sometimes looks tired. She was watching the large red poppies come out. Then she walked off the lawn to the meadow, whose corner to the right I can just see. Trail, trail went her long dress over the sopping grass. And she came back with her hands full of the hay that was cut yesterday, I suppose for rabbits or something, as she kept on smelling it. The air here is delicious. Later on I heard the noise of croquet balls, and looked out again, and it was Charles Wilcox practising. They are keen on all games. Presently he started sneezing and had to stop. Then I hear more clicketing, and it is Mr. Wilcox practising, and then a tissue! A tissue. He has to stop too. Then Evie comes out and does some calisthenic exercises on a machine that is tacked onto a green gauge tree. They put everything to use, and then she says, "A tissue," and in she goes. And finally, Mrs. Wilcox reappears, trail, trail, still smelling hay and looking at the flowers. I inflict all this on you because once you said that life is sometimes life. And sometimes only a drama, and one must learn to distinguish t'other from which. And up to now, I have always put that down as Meg's clever nonsense. But this morning, it really does seem not life, but a play, and it did amuse me enormously to watch the W's. Now Mrs. Wilcox has come in. I am going to wear omission. Last night, Mrs. Wilcox wore an omission, and Evie. Omission. So it isn't exactly a go-as-you-please place, and if you shut your eyes, it still seems the Wiggly Hotel that we expected. Not if you open them. The dog roses are too sweet. There is a great hedge of them over the lawn, 
magnificently tall, so that they fall down in garlands, and nice and thin at the bottom so that you can see ducks through it and a cow. These belong to the farm, which is the only house near us. There goes the breakfast gong. Much love. Modified love to Tibby. Love to Aunt Julie. How good of her to come and keep you company, but what a bore. Burn this. We'll write again Thursday. Helen. Howard's End, Friday. Dearest Meg, I am having a glorious time. I like them all. Mrs. Wilcox, if quieter than in Germany, is sweeter than ever, and I never saw anything like her steady unselfishness, and the best of it is that the others do not take advantage of her. They are the very happiest, jolliest family that you can imagine. I do really feel that we are making friends. The fun of it is that they think me a noodle, and say so, at least Mr. Wilcox does, and when that happens and one doesn't mind, it's a pretty sure test, isn't it? He says the most horrid things about women's suffrage so nicely, and when I said I believed in equality, he just folded his arms and gave me such a setting down as I've never had. Meg, shall we ever learn to talk less? I never felt so ashamed of myself in my life. I couldn't point to a time when men had been equal, nor even to a time when the wish to be equal had made them happier in other ways. I couldn't say a word. I had just picked up the notion that equality is good from some book, probably from poetry, or you. Anyhow, it's been knocked into pieces, and like all people who are really strong, Mr. Wilcox did it without hurting me. On the other hand, I laugh at them for catching hay fever. We live like fighting cocks, and Charles takes us out every day in the motor, a tomb with trees in it, a hermit's house, a wonderful road that was made by the kings of Mercia, tennis, a cricket match, bridge, and at night we squeeze up in this lovely house. The whole clan's here now. It's like a rabbit warren. Evie is a dear. They want me to stop over Sunday. I suppose it won't matter if I do. Marvellous weather and the views marvellous. Views westward to the high ground. Thank you for your letter. Burn this. Your affectionate Helen. Howard's End. Sunday. Dearest, dearest Meg, I do not know what you will say. Paul and I are in love. The younger son who only came here Wednesday. End of chapter 1Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 2. Margaret glanced at her sister's note and pushed it over the breakfast table to her aunt. There was a moment's hush, and then the floodgates opened. I can tell you nothing, Aunt Julie. I know no more than you do. We met, we only met the father and mother abroad last spring. I know so little that I didn't even know their son's name. It's all so— She waved her hand and laughed a little. In that case it is far too sudden. Who knows, Aunt Julie, who knows? But, Margaret, dear, I mean, we mustn't be unpractical now we've come to facts. It is too sudden, surely. Who knows? But, Margaret, dear— I'll go for her other letters said Margaret. No, I won't. I'll finish my breakfast. In fact, I haven't them. We met the Wilcoxes on an awful expedition that we made from Heidelberg to Speer. Helen and I had got it into our heads that there was a grand old cathedral at Speer. The Archbishop of Speer was one of the seven electors. You know Speer, Mainz, and Kuhn. Those three seas once commanded the Rhine Valley and got it the name of Priest Street. I still feel quite uneasy about this business, Margaret. The train crossed by a bridge of boats, and at first sight it looked quite fine. Oh, but, oh, in five minutes we had seen the whole thing. The cathedral had been ruined, absolutely ruined by restoration, not an inch left of the original structure. We wasted a whole day, and came across the Wilcoxes as we were eating our sandwiches in the public gardens. They, too, poor things, had been taken in. They were actually stopping at Speer, 
and they rather liked Helen insisting that they must fly with us to Heidelberg. As a matter of fact, they did come on next day. We all took some drives together. They knew us well enough to ask Helen to come and see them. At least, I was asked too, but Tibby's illness prevented me. So last Monday she went alone. That's all. You know as much as I do now. It's a young man out the unknown. She was to have come back Saturday, but put off till Monday, perhaps on account of— I don't know. She broke off, and listened to the sounds of a London morning. Their house was in Wickham Place, and fairly quiet, for a lofty promontory of buildings separated it from the main thoroughfare. One had the sense of a backwater, or rather of an estuary, whose waters flowed in from the invisible sea, and ebbed into a profound silence while the waves without were still beating. Though the promontory consisted of flats, expensive, with cavernous entrance-halls, full of concierges and palms, it fulfilled its purpose, and gained for the older houses opposite a certain measure of peace. These two would be swept away in time, and another promontory would rise upon their sight, as humanity piled itself higher and higher on the precious soil of London. Mrs. Munt had her own method of interpreting her nieces. She decided that Margaret was a little hysterical, and was trying to gain time by a torrent of talk. Feeling very diplomatic, she lamented the fate of Speer, and declared that never, never should she be so misguided as to visit it, and added of her own accord that the principles of restoration were ill understood in Germany. "'The Germans,' she said, "'are too thorough.' And this is all very well sometimes, but at other times it does not do. Exactly, said Margaret. Germans are too thorough. And her eyes began to shine. Of course I regard you Schlegels as English, said Mrs. Munt hastily. English to the backbone. Margaret leaned forward and stroked her hand. And that reminds me, Helen's letter— "'Oh, yes, Aunt Julie, I am thinking all right about Helen's letter. I know. I must go down and see her. I am thinking about her all right. I am meaning to go down.' "'But go with some plan,' said Mrs. Munt, admitting into her kindly voice a note of exasperation. "'Margaret, if I may interfere, don't be taken by surprise. What do you think of the Wilcoxes? Are they our sort?' Are they likely people? Could they appreciate Helen, who is to my mind a very special sort of person? Do they care about literature and art? That is most important when you come to think of it. Literature and art. Most important. How old would the son be? She says younger son. Would he be in a position to marry? Is he likely to make Helen happy? Did you gather— I gathered nothing. They began to talk at once. "'Then in that case—in that case I can make no plans, don't you see?' "'On the contrary. I hate plans. I hate lines of action. Helen isn't a baby. Then in that case, my dear, why go down?' Margaret was silent. If her aunt could not see why she must go down, she was not going to tell her. She was not going to say— I love my dear sister. I must be near her at this crisis of her life. The affections are more reticent than the passions, and their expression more subtle. If she herself should ever fall in love with a man, she, like Helen, would proclaim it from the housetops. But as she loved only a sister, she used the voiceless language of sympathy. I consider you odd girls, continued Mrs. Munt and very wonderful girls, and in many ways far older than your years. But you won't be offended. Frankly, I feel you are not up to this business. It requires an older person. Dear, I have nothing to call me back to Swanage. She spread out her plump arms. I am all at your disposal. Let me go down to this house, whose name I forget, instead of you. Aunt Julie, she jumped up and kissed her. I must, must go to Howard's End myself. You don't exactly understand, though I can never thank you properly for offering. I do understand, retorted Mrs. Munt, with immense confidence. 
I go down in no spirit of interference, but to make inquiries. Inquiries are necessary. Now I am going to be rude. You would say the wrong thing. To a certainty you would. In your anxiety for Helen's happiness, you would offend the whole of these Wilcoxes by asking one of your impetuous questions. Not that one minds offending them. I shall ask no questions. I have it in Helen's writing that she and a man are in love. There is no question to ask, as long as she keeps to that. All the rest isn't worth a straw. A long engagement, if you like, but inquiries, questions, plans, lines of action. No, Aunt Julie, no. Away she hurried. Not beautiful, not supremely brilliant, but filled with something that took the place of both qualities. Something best described as a profound vivacity, a continual and sincere response to all that she encountered in her path through life. If Helen had written the same to me about a shop assistant or a penniless clerk— Dear Margaret, do come into the library and shut the door. Your good maids are dusting the banisters. Or if she had wanted to marry the man who calls for Carter Patterson, I should have said the same. Then, with one of those turns that convinced her aunt that she was not mad, really, and convinced observers of another type that she was not a barren theorist, she added— Though in the case of Carter Patterson, I should want it to be a very long engagement indeed, I must say. "'I should think so,' said Mrs. Munt. "'And indeed, I can scarcely follow you. Now just imagine if you said anything of that sort to the Wilcoxes. I understand it, but most good people would think you mad. Imagine how disconcerting for Helen. What is wanted is a person who will go slowly— "'Slowly in this business, and see how things are, and where they are likely to lead to.' Margaret was down on this. "'But you implied just now that the engagement must be broken off.' "'I think probably it must. But slowly.' "'Can you break an engagement off slowly?' Her eyes lit up. "'What's an engagement made of, do you suppose? I think it's made of some hard stuff that may snap but can't break.' It is different to the other ties of life. They stretch or bend, they admit of degree, they're different. Exactly so. But won't you let me just run down to Howard's house and save you all the discomfort? I will really not interfere. But I do so thoroughly understand the kind of thing you Schlegels want, that one quiet look round will be enough for me. Margaret again thanked her, again kissed her, and then ran upstairs to see her brother. He was not so well. The hay fever had worried him a good deal all night. His head ached, his eyes were wet, his mucous membrane, he informed her, was in a most unsatisfactory condition. The only thing that made life worth living was the thought of Walter Savage Landor, from whose imaginary conversation she had promised to read at frequent intervals during the day. It was rather difficult. Something must be done about Helen— she must be assured that it is not a criminal offence to love at first sight. A telegram to this effect would be cold and cryptic. A personal visit seemed each moment more impossible. Now the doctor arrived and said that Tibby was quite bad. Might it really be best to accept Aunt Julie's kind offer, and to send her down to Howard's End with a note? Certainly Margaret was impulsive. She did swing rapidly from one decision to another. Running downstairs into the library, she cried, "'Yes, I have changed my mind. I do wish that you would go.' There was a train from King's Cross at eleven. At half-past ten, Tibby, with rare self-effacement, fell asleep, and Margaret was able to drive her aunt to the station. "'You will remember, Aunt Julie, not to be drawn into discussing the engagement. Give my letter to Helen, and say whatever you feel yourself, but do keep clear of the relatives.' We have scarcely got their names straight yet, and besides, that sort of thing is so uncivilized and wrong. "'So uncivilized?' queried Mrs. Munt, fearing that she was losing the point of some brilliant remark. "'Oh, I used an affected word. I only meant—would you please only talk the thing over with Helen?' "'Only with Helen?' "'Because—' But it was no moment to expound the personal nature of love. Even Margaret shrank from it and contented herself with stroking her good aunt's hand, and with meditating 
half sensibly and half poetically, on the journey that was about to begin from King's Cross. Like many others who have lived long in a great capital, she had strong feelings about the various railway termini. They are our gates to the glorious and the unknown. Through them we pass out into adventure and sunshine, and to them, alas, we return. In Paddington, all Cornwall is latent, and the remoter west. Down the inclines of Liverpool Street lie Fenlands and the illimitable broads. Scotland is through the pylons of Euston, Wessex behind the poised chaos of Waterloo. Italians realize this, as is natural. Those of them who are so unfortunate as to serve as waiters in Berlin call the Anhalt Bahnhof the Stazione d'Italia, because by it they must return to their homes. And he is a chilly Londoner who does not endow his stations with some personality, and extend to them, however shyly, the emotions of fear and love. To Margaret, I hope that it will not set the reader against her, the station of King's Cross had always suggested infinity. Its very situation, withdrawn a little behind the facile splendours of St. Pancras, implied a comment on the materialism of life. Those two great arches, colourless, indifferent, shouldering between them an unlovely clock, were fit portals for some eternal adventure, whose issue might be prosperous, but would certainly not be expressed in the ordinary language of prosperity. If you think this ridiculous, remember that it is not Margaret who is telling you about it. And let me hasten to add that they were in plenty of time for the train, that Mrs. Munt, though she took a second-class ticket, was put by the guard into a first— only two seconds on the train, one smoking and the other babies, one cannot be expected to travel with babies, and that Margaret, on her return to Wickham Place, was confronted with the following telegram. All over. Wish I had never written. Tell no one. Helen. But Aunt Julie was gone. Gone irrevocably, and no power on earth could stop her. End of chapter two. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter three. Most complacently did Mrs. Munt rehearse her mission. Her nieces were independent young women, and it was not often that she was able to help them. Emily's daughters had never been quite like other girls. They had been left motherless when Tibby was born, when Helen was five and Margaret herself but thirteen. It was before the passing of the deceased wife's sister, Bill, so Mrs. Munt could without impropriety offer to go and keep house at Wickham Place. But her brother-in-law, who was peculiar and a German, had referred the question to Margaret, who with the crudity of youth had answered, no, they could manage much better alone. Five years later Mr. Schlegel had died, too and Mrs. Munt had repeated her offer. Margaret, crude no longer, had been grateful and extremely nice, but the substance of her answer had been the same. "'I must not interfere a third time,' thought Mrs. Munt. However, of course, she did. She learnt to her horror that Margaret, now of age, was taking her money out of the old safe investments, and putting it into foreign things, which always smash. Silence would have been criminal. Her own fortune was invested in home rails, and most ardently did she beg her niece to imitate her. "'Then we should be together, dear.' Margaret, out of politeness, invested a few hundreds in the Nottingham and Derby railway, and though the foreign things did admirably, and the Nottingham and Derby declined with the steady dignity of which only home rails are capable, Mrs. Munt never ceased to rejoice, and to say— I did manage that, at all events. When the smash comes, poor Margaret will have a nest egg to fall back on." This year Helen came of age, and exactly the same thing happened in Helen's case. She also would shift her money out of consoles, but she too, almost without being pressed, consecrated a fraction of it to the Nottingham and Derby Railway. So far, so good. But in social matters their aunt had accomplished nothing. Sooner or later the girls would enter on the process known as throwing themselves away, and if they had delayed hitherto, it was only that they must throw themselves more vehemently in the future. 
They saw too many people at Wickham Place. Unshaven musicians, an actress even, German cousins—one knows what foreigners are. Acquaintances picked up at Continental hotels—one knows what they are, too. It was interesting, and down at Swanage no one appreciated culture more than Mrs. Munt, but it was dangerous, and disaster was bound to come. How right she was, and how lucky to be on the spot when the disaster came! The train sped northward, under innumerable tunnels. It was only an hour's journey, but Mrs. Munt had to raise and lower the window again and again. She passed through the South Wellwyn Tunnel, saw light for a moment, and entered the North Wellwyn Tunnel of tragic fame. She traversed the immense viaduct, whose arches span on troubled meadows, and the dreamy flow of two in water. She skirted the parks of politicians. At times the Great North Road accompanied her, more suggestive of infinity than any railway, awakening after a nap of a hundred years to such life as is conferred by the stench of motor-cars, and to such culture as is implied by the advertisements of antibilious pills. To history, to tragedy, to the past, to the future, Mrs. Munt remained equally indifferent, hers but to concentrate on the end of her journey, and to rescue poor Helen from this dreadful mess. The station for Howard's End was at Hilton, one of the large villages that are strung so frequently along the North Road, and that owe their size to the traffic of coaching and pre-coaching days. Being near London, it had not shared in the rural decay, and its long high street had butted out right and left into residential estates. For about a mile a series of tiled and slated houses passed before Mrs. Munt's inattentive eyes, a series broken at one point by six Danish tumuli that stood shoulder to shoulder along the high road tombs of soldiers. Beyond these tumuli habitations thickened, and the train came to a standstill in a tangle that was almost a town. The station, like the scenery, like Helen's letters, struck an indeterminate note. Into which country will it lead? England or suburbia? It was new, it had island platforms and a subway, and the superficial comfort exacted by businessmen but it held hints of local life, personal intercourse, as even Mrs. Munt was to discover. "'I want a house,' she confided to the ticket-boy. "'Its name is Howard's Lodge. Do you know where it is?' "'Mr. Wilcox,' the boy called. A young man in front of them turned round. "'She's wanting Howard's end!' There was nothing for it but to go forward though Mrs. Munt was too much agitated even to stare at the stranger. But remembering that there were two brothers, she had the sense to say to him, "'Excuse me asking, but are you the younger, Mr. Wilcox, or the elder?' "'The younger. Can I do anything for you?' "'Oh, well,' she controlled herself with dignity, "'really, are you? I—' She moved herself away from the ticket-boy and lowered her voice. "'I am Miss Schlegel's aunt. I ought to introduce myself, oughtn't I? My name is Mrs. Munt.' She was conscious that he raised his cap and said quite coolly, "'Oh, rather. Miss Schlegel is stopping with us. Did you want to see her?' "'Possibly. I'll call you a cab. No, wait a mo,' he thought. "'Our motor's here.' I'll run you up in it. Oh, that is very kind. Not at all. If you'll just wait till they bring out a parcel from the office. This way. My niece is not with you by any chance. No, I came over with my father. He has gone on north in your train. You'll see Miss Schlegel at lunch. You're coming up to lunch, I hope. I should like to come up, said Mrs. Munt, not committing herself to nourishment until she had studied Helen's lover a little more. He seemed a gentleman, but had so rattled her round that her powers of observation were numbed. She glanced at him stealthily. To a feminine eye there was nothing amiss in the sharp depressions at the corners of his mouth, nor in the rather box-like construction of his forehead. He was dark, clean-shaven, and seemed accustomed to command. "'In front or behind? Which do you prefer? It may be windy in front.' "'In front, if I may. Then we can talk.' 
"'But excuse me one moment. I can't think what they're doing with that parcel.' He strode into the booking office and called with a new voice. "'Hi! Hi, you there! Are you going to keep me waiting all day? Parcel for Wilcox, Howard's End. Just look sharp.' Emerging, he said in quieter tones, "'This station's abominably organized. If I had my way, the whole lot of them should get the sack. May I help you in?' "'This is very good of you,' said Mrs. Munt, as she settled herself into a luxurious cavern of red leather, and suffered her person to be padded with rugs and shawls. She was more civil than she had intended, but really this young man was very kind. Moreover, she was a little afraid of him. His self-possession was extraordinary. "'Very good, indeed,' she repeated, adding, "'It is just what I should have wished.' "'Very good of you to say so.' he replied, with a slight look of surprise, which, like most slight looks, escaped Mrs. Munt's attention. "'I was just tooling my father over to catch the down train.' "'You see, we heard from Helen this morning.' Young Wilcox was pouring in petrol, starting his engine, and performing other actions with which this story has no concern. The great car began to rock, and the form of Mrs. Munt, trying to explain things, sprang agreeably up and down among the red cushions. "'The Major will be very glad to see you,' he mumbled. "'Hi, I say! Parcel for Howard's End! Bring it out! Hi!' A bearded porter emerged with the parcel in one hand and an entry-book in the other. With the gathering whir of the motor these ejaculations mingled. "'Sign, must I? Why the—' Should I sign, after all this bother? Not even got a pencil on you? Remember, next time I report you to the station-master— my time's a value, though yours mayn't be. Here. Here being a tip. Extremely sorry, Mrs. Munt. Not at all, Mr. Wilcox. And do you object to going through the village? It is rather a longer spin, but I have one or two commissions. I should love going through the village. Naturally, I am very anxious to talk things over with you. As she said this, she felt ashamed, for she was disobeying Margaret's instructions. Only disobeying them in the letter, surely. Margaret had only warned her against discussing the incident with outsiders. Surely it was not uncivilized or wrong to discuss it with the young man himself, since chance had thrown them together. A reticent fellow, he made no reply. Mounting by her side, he put on gloves and spectacles, and off they drove, the bearded porter—life is a mysterious business—looking after them with admiration. The wind was in their faces down the station road, blowing the dust into Mrs. Munt's eyes. But as soon as they turned into the great north road, she opened fire. "'You can well imagine,' she said, "'that the news was a great shock to us.' "'What news?' "'Mr. Wilcox,' she said frankly, "'Margaret has told me everything, everything. I have seen Helen's letter.' He could not look her in the face— as his eyes were fixed on his work, he was travelling as quickly as he dared down the high street. But he inclined his head in her direction, and said, "'I beg your pardon. I didn't catch.' "'About Helen. Helen, of course. Helen is a very exceptional person. I am sure you will let me say this, feeling towards her as you do. Indeed, all the Schlegels are exceptional. I come in no spirit of interference, but it was a great shock.' They drew up outside a draper's. Without replying, he turned round in his seat, and contemplated the cloud of dust that they had raised in their passage through the village. It was settling again, but not all into the road from which he had taken it. Some of it had percolated through the open windows, some had whitened the roses and gooseberries of the wayside gardens, while a certain proportion had entered the lungs of the villagers. "'I wonder when they'll learn wisdom and tar the roads,' was his comment. Then a man ran out of the drapers with a roll of oilcloth, and off they went again. "'Margaret could not come herself, on account of poor Tibby, so I am here to represent her, and to have a good talk.' "'I'm sorry to be so dense,' said the young man, again drawing up outside a shop. "'But I still haven't quite understood.' "'Helen, Mr. Wilcox, my niece, and you.' He pushed up his goggles and gazed at her, absolutely bewildered. Horror smote her to the heart, 
for even she began to suspect that they were at cross-purposes, and that she had commenced her mission by some hideous blunder. "'Miss Schlegel and myself,' he asked, compressing his lips. "'I trust there has been no misunderstanding,' quavered Mrs. Munt. "'Her letter certainly read that way.' "'What way?' "'That you and she—' She paused, then drooped her eyelids. "'I think I catch your meaning,' he said stickily. "'What an extraordinary mistake!' "'Then you didn't the least,' she stammered, getting blood-red in the face and wishing she had never been born. "'Scarcely, as I am already engaged to another lady.' There was a moment's silence, and then he caught his breath and exploded with, "'Oh, good God! Don't tell me it's some silliness of Paul's!' "'But you are Paul!' "'I'm not. "'Then why did you say so at the station?' "'I said nothing of the sort.' "'I beg your pardon, you did.' "'I beg your pardon, I did not. "'My name is Charles.' "'Younger may mean son as opposed to father, "'or second brother as opposed to first. "'There is much to be said for either view, "'and later on they said it, "'but they had other questions before them now.' "'Do you mean to tell me that Paul?' But she did not like his voice. He sounded as if he was talking to a porter, and certain that he had deceived her at the station, she too grew angry. "'Do you mean to tell me that Paul and your niece—' Mrs. Munt, such is human nature, determined that she would champion the lovers. She was not going to be bullied by a severe young man. "'Yes, they care for one another very much indeed.' she said. I dare say they will tell you about it by and by. We heard this morning." And Charles clenched his fist and cried, "'The idiot! The idiot! The little fool!' Mrs. Munt tried to divest herself of her rugs. "'If that is your attitude, Mr. Wilcox, I prefer to walk.' "'I beg you will do no such thing. I'll take you up this moment to the house. Let me tell you, the thing is impossible, and must be stopped.' Mrs. Munt did not often lose her temper, and when she did it was only to protect those whom she loved. On this occasion she blazed out. "'I quite agree, sir. The thing is impossible, and I will come up and stop it. My niece is a very exceptional person, and I am not inclined to sit still while she throws herself away on those who will not appreciate her.' Charles worked his jaws. "'Considering she has only known your brother since Wednesday, and only met your father and mother at a stray hotel, could you possibly lower your voice? The shopman will overhear.' Esprit de classe, if one may coin the phrase, was strong in Mrs. Munt. She sat quivering while a member of the lower orders deposited a metal funnel, a saucepan, and a garden squirt beside the roll of oilcloth. "'Right behind?' "'Yes, sir.' and the lower orders vanished in a cloud of dust. "'I warn you, Paul hasn't a penny. It's useless.' "'No need to warn us, Mr. Wilcox, I assure you. The warning is all the other way. My niece has been very foolish, and I shall give her a good scolding and take her back to London with me.' "'He has to make his way out in Nigeria. He couldn't think of marrying for years, and when he does it must be a woman who can stand the climate, and is in other ways—why hasn't he told us?' Of course he's ashamed. He knows he's been a fool. And so he has. A damned fool." She grew furious. "'Whereas Miss Schlegel has lost no time in publishing the news. If I were a man, Mr. Wilcox, for that last remark, I'd box your ears. You're not fit to clean my niece's boots, to sit in the same room with her, and you dare—you actually dare. Oh, I decline to argue with such a person. All I know is she's spread the thing, and he hasn't and my father's away, and I—and all that I know is—might I finish my sentence, please?" No. Charles clenched his teeth and sent the motor swerving all over the lane. She screamed. So they played the game of capping families, a round of which is always played when love would unite two members of our race. But they played it with unusual vigour, stating in so many words that Schlegel's were better than Wilcox's, Wilcox's better than Schlegel's. They flung decency aside. The man was young, the woman deeply stirred. In both a vein of coarseness was latent. 
Their quarrel was no more surprising than our most quarrels, inevitable at the time, incredible afterwards. But it was more than usually futile. A few minutes, and they were enlightened. The motor drew up at Howard's end, and Helen, looking very pale, ran out to meet her aunt. "'Aunt Julie, I have just had a telegram from Margaret. I—I I meant to stop your coming. It isn't—it's over.' The climax was too much for Mrs. Munt. She burst into tears. "'Oh, Aunt Julie, dear, don't! Don't let them know I've been so silly. It wasn't anything. Do bear up for my sake.' "'Paul!' cried Charles Wilcox, pulling his gloves off. "'Don't let them know. They are never to know.' "'Oh, my darling Helen! Paul! Paul!' A very young man came out of the house. "'Paul, is there any truth in this?' "'I didn't. I don't.' "'Yes or no, man. Plain question, plain answer. Did or didn't Miss Schlegel?' "'Charles, dear,' said a voice from the garden. "'Charles, dear Charles, one doesn't ask plain questions. There aren't such things.' They were all silent. It was Mrs. Wilcox. She approached just as Helen's letter had described her, trailing noiselessly over the lawn, and there was actually a wisp of hay in her hands. She seemed to belong not to the young people and their motor, but to the house, and to the tree that overshadowed it. One knew that she worshipped the past, and that the instinctive wisdom the past can alone bestow had descended upon her, that wisdom to which we give the clumsy name of aristocracy. High-born she might not be, but assuredly she cared about her ancestors, and let them help her. When she saw Charles angry, Paul frightened, and Mrs. Munt in tears, she heard her ancestors say, "'Separate those human beings who will hurt each other most. The rest can wait.' So she did not ask questions. Still less did she pretend that nothing had happened, as a competent society hostess would have done. She said, "'Miss Schlegel, would you take your aunt up to your room, or to my room, whichever you think best? Paul, do find Evie, and tell her lunch for six, but I'm not sure whether we shall all be downstairs for it.' And when they had obeyed her, she turned to her elder son, who still stood in the throbbing, stinking car, and smiled at him with tenderness, and without a word, turned away from him towards her flowers. "'Mother!' he called. Are you aware that Paul has been playing the fool again?" "'It's all right, dear. They have broken off the engagement.' "'Engagement?' "'They do not love any longer, if you prefer it put that way,' said Mrs. Wilcox, stooping down to smell a rose. End of chapter 3 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 4 Helen and her aunt returned to Wickham Place in a state of collapse, and for a little time Margaret had three invalids on her hands. Mrs. Munt soon recovered. She possessed to a remarkable degree the power of distorting the past, and before many days were over she had forgotten the part played by her own imprudence in the catastrophe. Even at the crisis she had cried, "'Thank goodness poor Margaret has saved this!' which during the journey to London evolved into, "'It had to be gone through by some one,' which in its turn ripened into the permanent form of, "'The one time I really did help Emily's girls was over the Wilcox business.' But Helen was a more serious patient. New ideas had burst upon her like a thunderclap, and by them, and by her reverberations, she had been stunned. The truth was that she had fallen in love, not with an individual, but with a family. Before Paul arrived she had, as it were, been tuned up into his key. The energy of the Wilcoxes had fascinated her, had created new images of beauty in her responsive mind. To be all day with them in the open air, to sleep at night under their roof, had seemed the supreme joy of life, and had led to that abandonment of personality that is a possible prelude to love. 
She had liked giving in to Mr. Wilcox, or Evie, or Charles. She had liked being told that her notions of life were sheltered or academic, that equality was nonsense, votes for women nonsense, socialism nonsense, art and literature, except when conducive to strengthening the character, nonsense. One by one the Schlegel fetishes had been overthrown, and though professing to defend them, she had rejoiced. When Mr. Wilcox said that one sound man of business did more good to the world than a dozen of your social reformers, she had swallowed the curious assertion without a gasp, and had leant back luxuriously among the cushions of his motor-car. When Charles said, "'Why be so polite to servants? They don't understand it,' she had not given the Schlegel retort of, "'If they don't understand it, I do.' No, she had vowed to be less polite to servants in the future. I am swathed in cant, she thought, and it is good for me to be stripped of it. And all that she thought or did or breathed was a quiet preparation for Paul. Paul was inevitable. Charles was taken up with another girl. Mr. Wilcox was so old, Evie so young, Mrs. Wilcox so different. Round the absent brother she began to throw the halo of romance to irradiate him with all the splendour of those happy days, to feel that in him she should draw nearest to the robust ideal. He and she were about the same age, Evie said. Most people thought Paul handsomer than his brother. He was certainly a better shot, though not so good at golf. And when Paul appeared, flushed with the triumph of getting through an examination, and ready to flirt with any pretty girl, Helen met him half-way, or more than half-way, and turned towards him on the Sunday evening. He had been talking of his approaching exile in Nigeria, and he should have continued to talk of it, and allowed their guest to recover. But the heave of her bosom flattered him. Passion was possible, and he became passionate. Deep down in him something whispered, "'This girl would let you kiss her. You might not have such a chance again.' That was how it happened or rather how Helen described it to her sister, using words even more unsympathetic than my own. But the poetry of that kiss, the wonder of it, the magic that there was in life for hours after it, who can describe that? It is so easy for an Englishman to sneer at these chance collisions of human beings. To the insular cynic and the insular moralist they offer an equal opportunity. It is so easy to talk of passing emotion, and how to forget how vivid the emotion was ere it passed. Our impulse to sneer, to forget, is at root a good one. We recognize that emotion is not enough, and that men and women are personalities capable of sustained relations, not mere opportunities for an electrical discharge. Yet we rate the impulse too highly. We do not admit that by collisions of this trivial sort, the doors of heaven may be shaken open. To Helen, at all events, her life was to bring nothing more intense than the embrace of this boy who played no part in it. He had drawn her out of the house, where there was danger of surprise and light. He had led her by a path he knew, until they stood under the column of the vast witch-elm. A man in the darkness, he had whispered, "'I love you,' when she was desiring love. In time his slender personality faded. The scene that he had evoked endured. In all the variable years that followed, she never saw the like of it again. "'I understand,' said Margaret. "'At least I understand as much as ever is understood of these things. Tell me now what happened on the Monday morning.' "'It was over at once.' "'How, Helen?' "'I was still happy while I dressed. But as I came downstairs I got nervous, and when I went into the dining-room I knew it was no good. There was Evie—I can't explain—managing the tea-urn, and Mr. Wilcox reading the Times. Was Paul there? Yes, and Charles was talking to him about the stocks and shares, and he looked frightened. By slight indications the sisters could convey much to each other. Margaret saw horror latent in the scene, and Helen's next remark did not surprise her. Somehow, when that kind of man looks frightened, it is too awful. 
It is all right for us to be frightened, or for men of another sort—father, for instance. But for men like that— When I saw all the others so placid, and Paul mad with terror in case I said the wrong thing, I felt for a moment that the whole Wilcox family was a fraud, just a wool of newspapers and motor-cars and golf clubs, and that, if it fell, I should find nothing behind it but panic and emptiness. I don't think that. The Wilcoxes struck me as being genuine people, particularly the wife. No, I don't really think that. But Paul was so broad-shouldered. All kinds of extraordinary things made it worse, and I knew that it would never do. Never. I said to him after breakfast, when the others were practising strokes, we rather lost our heads. And he looked better at once, though frightfully ashamed. He began a speech about having no money to marry on, but it hurt him to make, and I stopped him. Then he said, I must beg your pardon over this, Miss Schlegel. I can't think what came over me last night. And I said, Nor what over me. Never mind. And then we parted. At least until I remembered that I had written straight off to tell you the night before, and that frightened him again. I asked him to send a telegram for me, for he knew you would be coming or something, and he tried to get hold of the motor, but Charles and Mr. Wilcox wanted it to go to the station, and Charles offered to send the telegram for me, and then I had to say that the telegram was of no consequence, for Paul said Charles might read it, and, though I wrote it out several times, he always said people would suspect something. He took it himself at last, pretending that he must walk down to get cartridges, and what with one thing and the other it was not handed in at the post-office until too late. It was the most terrible morning. Paul disliked me more and more, and Evie talked cricket averages until I nearly screamed. I cannot think how I stood her all the other days. At last Charles and his father started for the station, and then came your telegram warning me that Aunt Julie was coming by that train. And Paul, oh, rather horrible, said that I had muddled it. But Mrs. Wilcox knew. Knew what? Everything. Though we neither of us had told her a word. I'd known all along, I think. Oh, she must have overheard you. I suppose so. But it seemed wonderful. When Charles and Aunt Julie drove up calling each other names— Mrs. Wilcox stepped in from the garden and made everything less terrible. Ugh! But it has been a disgusting business. To think that— She sighed. To think that because you and a young man meet for a moment, there must be all these telegrams and anger, supplied Margaret. Helen nodded. I've often thought about it, Helen. It's one of the most interesting things in the world— the truth is that there is a great outer life that you and I have never touched, a life in which telegrams and anger count. Personal relations, that we think supreme, are not supreme there. Their love means marriage settlements, death, death duties. So far I'm clear. But here my difficulty. This outer life, though obviously horrid, often seems the real one. There's grit in it. It does breed character. Do personal relations lead to sloppiness in the end? Oh, Meg, that's what I felt, only not so clearly when the Wilcoxes were so competent, and seemed to have their hands on all the ropes. Don't you feel it now? I remember Paul at breakfast, said Helen quietly. I shall never forget him. He had nothing to fall back on. I know that personal relations are the real life, for ever and ever. Amen. So the Wilcox episode fell into the background, leaving behind it memories of sweetness and horror that mingled, and the sisters pursued the life that Helen had commended. They talked to each other and to other people. They filled the tall, thin house at Wickham Place with those whom they liked or could befriend. They even attended public meetings. In their own fashion they cared deeply about politics, though not as politicians would have us care. They desired that public life should mirror whatever is good in the life within. 
temperance, tolerance, and sexual equality were intelligible cries to them. Whereas they did not follow our forward policy in Tibet with the keen attention that it merits, and would at times dismiss the whole British Empire with a puzzled, if reverent, sigh. Not out of them are the shows of history erected. The world would be a grey, bloodless place were it entirely composed of mishlegals. But the world being what it is, perhaps they shine out in it like stars. A word on their origin. They were not English to the backbone, as their aunt had piously asserted. But on the other hand, they were not Germans of the dreadful sort. Their father had belonged to a type that was more prominent in Germany fifty years ago than now. He was not the aggressive German, so dear to the English journalist, nor the domestic German, so dear to the English wit. If one classed him at all, it would be as the countrymen of Hegel and Kant, as the idealist, inclined to be dreamy, whose imperialism was the imperialism of the air. Not that his life had been inactive. He had fought like blazes against Denmark, Austria, France. But he had fought without visualizing the results of victory. A hint of the truth broke out on him after Sedan, when he saw the dyed moustaches of Napoleon going grey, another when he entered Paris, and saw the smashed windows of the Tuileries. Peace came. It was all very immense one had turned into an empire. But he knew that some quality had vanished for which not all Alsace-Lorraine could compensate him. Germany a commercial power, Germany a naval power, Germany with colonies here and a forward policy there, and legitimate aspirations in the other place might appeal to others, and be fitly served by them. For his own part, he abstained from the fruits of victory, and naturalized himself in England." The more earnest members of his family never forgave him, and knew that his children, though scarcely English of the dreadful sort, would never be German to the backbone. He had obtained work in one of our provincial universities, and there married poor Emily, or die Englanderin, as the case may be. And as she had money, they proceeded to London, and came to know a good many people. But his gaze was always fixed beyond the sea. It was his hope that the clouds of materialism obscuring the fatherland would part in time, and the mild intellectual light re-emerge. "'Do you imply that we Germans are stupid, Uncle Ernst?' exclaimed a haughty and magnificent nephew. Uncle Ernst replied, "'To my mind. You use the intellect, but you no longer care about it. That I call stupidity.' As the haughty nephew did not follow, he continued, "'You only care about the things that you can use, and therefore arrange them in the following order. Money, supremely useful. Intellect, rather useful. Imagination, of no use at all. No,' for the other had protested, "'your pan-Germanism is no more imaginative then is our imperialism over here. It is the vice of a vulgar mind to be thrilled by bigness, to think that a thousand square miles are a thousand times more wonderful than one square mile, and that a million square miles are almost the same as heaven. That is not imagination. No, it kills it. When their poets over here try to celebrate bigness, they are dead at once, and naturally. Your poets, too, are dying, your philosophers, your musicians, to whom Europe has listened for two hundred years. Gone. Gone with the little courts that nurtured them. Gone with Esterhaz and Weimar. What? What's that? Your universities? Oh, yes, you have learned men who collect more facts than do the learned men of England. They collect facts, and facts, and empires of facts. But which of them will rekindle the light within? To all this Margaret listened, sitting on the haughty nephew's knee. It was a unique education for the little girls. The haughty nephew would be at Wickham Place one day, bringing with him an even haughtier wife, both convinced that Germany was appointed by God to govern the world. Aunt Julie would come the next day, 
convinced that Great Britain had been appointed to the same post by the same authority. Were both these loud-voiced parties right? On one occasion they had met, and Margaret with clasped hands had implored them to argue the subject out in her presence. Whereat they blushed, and began to talk about the weather. "'Papa!' she cried. She was a most offensive child. "'Why will they not discuss this most clear question?' Her father, surveying the parties grimly, replied that he did not know. Putting her head on one side, Margaret then remarked, "'To me one of two things is very clear. Either God does not know his own mind about England and Germany, or else these do not know the mind of God.' A hateful little girl, but at thirteen she had grasped a dilemma that most people travel through life without perceiving. Her brain darted up and down. It grew pliant and strong. Her conclusion was that any human being lies nearer to the unseen than any organization, and from this she never varied. Helen advanced along the same lines, though with a more irresponsible tread. In character she resembled her sister, but she was pretty, and so apt to have a more amusing time. People gathered round her more readily, especially when they were new acquaintances, and she did enjoy a little homage very much. When their father died and they ruled alone at Wickham Place, she often absorbed the whole of the company, while Margaret—both were tremendous talkers—fell flat. Neither sister bothered about this. Helen never apologized afterwards. Margaret did not feel the slightest rancor. But looks have their influence upon character. The sisters were alike as little girls, but at the time of the Wilcox episode their methods were beginning to diverge. The younger was rather apt to entice people, and in enticing them, to be herself enticed. The elder went straight ahead, and accepted an occasional failure as part of the game. Little need be premised about Tibby. He was now an intelligent man of sixteen, but dyspeptic and difficile. End of chapter 4 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 5 It will be generally admitted that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is the most sublime noise that has ever penetrated into the ear of man. All sorts and conditions are satisfied by it. Whether you are like Mrs. Munt, and tap surreptitiously when the tunes come, of course, not so as to disturb the others. Or like Helen, who can see heroes and shipwrecks in the music's flood. Or like Margaret, who can only see the music. Or like Tibby, who is profoundly versed in counterpoint, and holds the full score open on his knee. Or like their cousin, Fräulein Mosebach, who remembers all the time that Beethoven is echt Deutsch. Or like Fräulein Mosebach's young man, who can remember nothing but Fräulein Mosebach, in any case, the passion of your life becomes more vivid, and you are bound to admit that such a noise is cheap at two shillings. It is cheap even if you hear it in the Queen's Hall, dreariest music-room in London, though not as dreary as the Free Trade Hall, Manchester, and even if you sit on the extreme left of that hall, so that the brass bumps at you before the rest of the orchestra arrives, it is still cheap. "'Who is Margaret talking to?' said Mrs. Munt, at the conclusion of the first movement. She was again in London on a visit to Wickham Place. Helen looked down the long line of their party, and said that she did not know. "'Would it be some young man or other whom she takes an interest in?' "'I expect so,' Helen replied. Music enwrapped her, and she could not enter into the distinction that divides young men whom one takes an interest in from young men whom one knows." "'You girls are so wonderful, and always having—oh, dear, one mustn't talk!' For the andante had begun. Very beautiful, but bearing a family likeness to all the other beautiful andantes that Beethoven had written, and to Helen's mind rather disconnecting the heroes and shipwrecks of the first movement from the heroes and goblins of the third. She heard the tune through once, and then her attention wandered— and she gazed at the audience, or the organ, or the architecture. 
Much did she censure the attenuated cupids who encircled the ceiling of the Queen's Hall, inclining each to each with vapid gesture, and clad in sallow pantaloons on which the October sunlight struck. "'How awful to marry a man like those cupids!' thought Helen. Here Beethoven started decorating his tune, so she heard him through once more, and then she smiled at her cousin Frida. But Frida, listening to classical music, could not respond. Herr Lysik, too, looked as if wild horses could not make him inattentive. There were lines across his forehead, his lips were parted, his pince-nez at right angles to his nose, and he had laid a thick white hand on either knee. And next to her was Aunt Julie, so British and wanting to tap. How interesting that row of people was! What diverse influences had gone to the making! Here Beethoven, after humming and hawing with great sweetness, said, Hey-ho! and the andante came to an end. Applause, and a round of Wunderschöning and Prachtvolleying from the German contingent. Margaret started talking to her new young man. Helen said to her aunt, Now comes the wonderful movement. First of all the goblins, and then a trio of elephants dancing and Tibby implored the company generally to look out for the transitional passage on the drum. "'On the what, dear?' "'On the drum, Aunt Julie.' "'No, look out for the part where you think you have done with the goblins, and they come back,' breathed Helen, as the music started with the goblin walking quietly over the universe from end to end. Others followed him. They were not aggressive creatures. It was that that made them so terrible to Helen. They merely observed in passing that there was no such thing as splendor or heroism in the world. After the interlude of elephants dancing, they returned, and made the observation for the second time. Helen could not contradict them, for once at all events she had felt the same, and had seen the reliable walls of youth collapse. Panic and emptiness! Panic and emptiness! The goblins were right. Her brother raised his finger. It was the transitional passage on the drum. For, as if things were going too far, Beethoven took hold of the goblins and made them do what he wanted. He appeared in person. He gave them a little push, and they began to walk in major key instead of in minor, and then he blew with his mouth and they were scattered. Gusts of splendor! gods and demigods contending with vast swords, color and fragrance broadcast on the field of battle, magnificent victory, magnificent death. Oh, it all burst before the girl, and she even stretched out her gloved hands as if it was tangible. Any fate was titanic, any conquest desirable. Conqueror and conquered would alike be applauded by the angels of the utmost stars. And the goblins— they had not really been there at all. They were only the phantoms of cowardice and unbelief. One healthy human impulse would dispel them. Men like the Wilcoxes, or President Roosevelt, would say yes. Beethoven knew better. The goblins really had been there. They might return. And they did. It was as if the splendor of life might boil over, and waste to steam and froth. In its dissolution one heard the terrible, ominous note, and a goblin, with increased malignity, walked quietly over the universe from end to end. Panic and emptiness! Panic and emptiness! Even the flaming ramparts of the world might fall. Beethoven chose to make all right in the end. He built the ramparts up. He blew with his mouth for the second time, and again the goblins were scattered. He brought back the gusts of splendor, the heroism, the youth, the magnificence of life and of death, and amid vast roarings of a superhuman joy, he led his fifth symphony to its conclusion. But the goblins were there. They could return. He had said so bravely, and that is why one can trust Beethoven when he says other things. Helen pushed her way out during the applause. She desired to be alone. The music summed up to her all that had happened or could happen in her career. She read it as a tangible statement, which could never be superseded. The notes meant this and that to her, and they could have no other meaning, and life could have no other meaning. 
She pushed right out of the building, and walked slowly down the outside staircase, breathing the autumnal air, and then she strolled home. "'Margaret!' called Mrs. Munt. "'Is Helen all right?' "'Oh, yes.' "'She is always going away in the middle of a program," said Tibby. "'The music has evidently moved her deeply,' said Fräulein Mosebach. "'Excuse me,' said Margaret's young man, who had for some time been preparing a sentence. "'But that lady has, uh, quite inadvertently, taken my umbrella.' "'Oh, good gracious me! I am so sorry. Uh, Tibby, run after Helen. I shall miss the four serious songs if I do. Tibby, love, you must go. It isn't of any consequence, said the young man, in truth a little uneasy about his umbrella. But of course it is. Tibby! Oh, Tibby! Tibby rose to his feet, and willfully caught his person on the backs of the chairs. By the time he had tipped up the seat and found his hat, and had deposited his full score in safety, it was too late to go after Helen. The four serious songs had begun, and one could not move during their performance. "'My sister is so careless,' whispered Margaret. "'Not at all,' replied the young man, but his voice was dead and cold. "'If you would give me your address—' "'Oh, not at all. Not at all." And he wrapped his greatcoat over his knees. Then the four serious songs rang shallow in Margaret's ears. Brahms, for all his grumbling and grizzling, had never guessed what it felt like to be suspected of stealing an umbrella. For this fool of a young man thought that she and Helen and Tibby had been playing the confidence trick on him, and that if he gave his address they would break into his room some midnight or other, and steal his walking-stick, too. Most ladies would have laughed but Margaret really minded, for it gave her a glimpse into squalor. To trust people is a luxury in which only the wealthy can indulge. The poor cannot afford it. As soon as Brahms had grunted himself out, she gave him her card and said, "'That is where we live. If you preferred, you could call for the umbrella after the concert. But I didn't like to trouble you when it has all been our fault.' His face brightened a little when he saw that Wickham Place was W. It was sad to see him corroded with suspicion, and yet not daring to be impolite, in case these well-dressed people were honest, after all. She took it as a good sign that he said to her, "'It's a fine programme this afternoon, is it not?' For this was the remark with which he had originally opened, before the umbrella intervened. "'The Beethoven's fine,' said Margaret who was not a female of the encouraging type. "'I don't like the Brahms, though, nor the Mendelssohn that came first, and, ugh, I don't like this Elgar that's coming.' "'What? What?' called Herr Lysik, overhearing. "'The pomp and circumstance will not be fine.' "'Oh, Margaret, you tiresome girl!' cried her aunt. "'Here I have been persuading Herr Lysik to stop for pomp and circumstance, and you are undoing all my work.' I am so anxious for him to hear what we are doing in music. Oh, you mustn't run down our English composers, Margaret. For my part, I have heard the composition at Stettin, said Fräulein Marsbach, on two occasions. It is dramatic, a little. Friede, you despise English music. You know you do. And English art and English literature, except Shakespeare, and he's a German. <laughs> "'Very well, Frida, you may go.' The lovers laughed and glanced at each other. Moved by a common impulse, they rose to their feet and fled from pomp and circumstance. "'We have this call to pay in Finsbury Circus, it is true,' said Herr Lysik, as he edged past her and reached the gangway just as the music started. "'Margaret!' loudly whispered by Aunt Julie. "'Margaret! Margaret!' Fräulein Mausebach has left her beautiful little bag behind her on the seat. Sure enough, there was Frida's reticule, containing her address book, her pocket dictionary, her map of London, and her money. Oh, what a bother! What a family we are! F Frida! Hush! said all those who thought the music fine. 
But it's the number they want in Finsbury Circus. Might I— couldn't I— said the suspicious young man, and got very red. Oh, I would be so grateful. He took the bag, money clinking inside it, and slipped up the gangway with it. He was just in time to catch them at the swing door, and he received a pretty smile from the German girl, and a fine bow from her cavalier. He returned to his seat upsides with the world. The trust that they had reposed in him was trivial, but he felt that it cancelled his mistrust for them, and that probably he would not be had over his umbrella. This young man had been had in the past, badly, perhaps overwhelmingly, and now most of his energies went in defending himself against the unknown. But this afternoon, perhaps on account of music, he perceived that one must slack off occasionally, or what is the good of being alive? Wickham Place, W., though a risk, was as safe as most things, and he would risk it. So when the concert was over, and Margaret said, "'We live quite near. I am going there now. Could you walk around with me, and we'll find your umbrella?' He said, "'Thank you,' peaceably, and followed her out of the Queen's Hall. She wished that he was not so anxious to hand a lady downstairs, or to carry a lady's programme for her. His class was near enough her own for its manners to vex her. But she found him interesting, on the whole. Every one interested the Schlegels on the whole at that time, and while her lips talked culture, her heart was planning to invite him to tea. "'How tired one gets after music,' she began. "'Do you find the atmosphere of Queen's Hall oppressive?' "'Yes, horribly. But surely the atmosphere of Covent Garden is even more oppressive.' "'Do you go there much?' When my work permits, I attend the gallery for the Royal Opera." Helen would have exclaimed, "'So do I! I love the gallery!' and thus have endeared herself to the young man. Helen could do these things. But Margaret had an almost morbid horror of drawing people out, of making things go. She had been to the gallery at Covent Garden, but she did not attend it, preferring the more expensive seats, still less did she love it so she made no reply. This year I have been three times, to Faust, Tosca, and—was it Tannhauser or Tannhäuser? Better not risk the word. Margaret disliked Tosca and Faust, and so for one reason and another they walked on in silence, chaperoned by the voice of Mrs. Munt, who was getting into difficulties with her nephew. I do, in a way, remember the passage, Tibby, but when every instrument is so beautiful, it is difficult to pick out one thing rather than another. I am sure that you and Helen take me to the very nicest concerts. Not a dull note from beginning to end. I only wish that our German friends would have stayed till it finished. But surely you haven't forgotten the drum steadily beating on the low sea, Aunt Julie, came Tibby's voice. No one could. It's unmistakable. A specially loud part? hazarded Mrs. Munt. Of course, I do not go in for being musical, she added, the shot failing. I only care for music, a very different thing. But still, I will say this for myself, I do know when I like a thing and when I don't. Some people are the same about pictures. They can go into a picture gallery, Miss Conder can, and say straight off what they feel, all round the wall. I never could do that. But music is so different to pictures, to my mind. When it comes to music, I am as safe as houses, and I assure you, Tibby, I am by no means pleased by everything. There was a thing—something uh, about a fawn, in French, which Helen went into ecstasies over, but I thought it most tinkling and superficial, and said so, and I held to my opinion, too." "'Do you agree?' asked Margaret. Do you think music is so different to pictures? I—I I should have thought so, kind of," he said. So should I. Now my sister declares they're just the same. We have great arguments over it. She says I'm dense. I say she's sloppy. Getting under way, she cried. Now doesn't it seem absurd to you? What is the good of the arts if they are interchangeable? What is the good of the ear if it tells you the same as the eye? 
Helen's one aim is to translate tunes into the language of painting, and pictures into the language of music. It's very ingenious, and she says several pretty things in the process. But what's gained, I'd like to know? Oh, it's all rubbish, radically false. If Monet's really Debussy, and Debussy's really Monet, neither gentleman is worth his salt. That's my opinion. Evidently these sisters quarrelled. Now, this very symphony that we've just been having, she won't let it alone. She labels it with meanings from start to finish, turns it into literature. I wonder if the day will ever return when music will be treated as music. Yet I don't know. There's my brother, behind us. He treats music as music, and, oh, my goodness! He makes me angrier than any one, simply furious. With him I daren't even argue. An unhappy family, if talented. But, of course, the real villain is Wagner. He has done more than any man in the nineteenth century towards the muddling of arts. I do feel that music is in a very serious state just now, though extraordinarily interesting. Every now and then in history there do come these terrible geniuses, like Wagner, who stir up all the wells of thought at once. For a moment it's splendid. Such a splash as never was. But afterwards such a lot of mud in the wells! As it were, they communicate with each other too easily now, and not one of them will run quite clear. That's what Wagner's done." Her speeches fluttered away from the young man like birds. If only he could talk like this, he would have caught the world. Oh, to acquire culture! Oh, to pronounce foreign names correctly! Oh, to be well informed, discoursing at ease on every subject that a lady started! But it would take one years. With an hour at lunch and a few shattered hours in the evening, how was it possible to catch up with leisured women who had been reading steadily from childhood? His brain might be full of names. He might have even heard of Monet and Debussy. The trouble was that he could not string them together into a sentence. He could not make them tell. He could not quite forget about his stolen umbrella. Yes, the umbrella was the real trouble. Behind Monet and Debussy the umbrella persisted, with the steady beat of a drum. I suppose my umbrella will be all right, he was thinking. I don't really mind about it. I will think about music instead. I suppose my umbrella will be all right. Earlier in the afternoon he had worried about seats. Ought he to have paid as much as two shillings? Earlier still he had wondered, shall I try to do without a program? There had always been something to worry him ever since he could remember, always something that distracted him in the pursuit of beauty. For he did pursue beauty and therefore Margaret's speeches did flutter away from him like birds. Margaret talked ahead, occasionally saying, "'Don't you think so? Don't you feel the same?' And once she stopped and said, "'Oh, do interrupt me!' which terrified him. She did not attract him, though she filled him with awe. Her figure was meagre, her face seemed all teeth and eyes, her references to her sister and brother were uncharitable. For all her cleverness and culture, she was probably one of those soulless, atheistical women who have been so shown up by Miss Corelli. It was surprising, and alarming, that she should suddenly say, "'I do hope that you'll come in and have some tea.' "'I do hope that you'll come in and have some tea. We should be so glad. I have dragged you so far out of your way.' They had arrived at Wickham Place. The sun had set, and the backwater, in deep shadow, was filling with a gentle haze. To the right of the fantastic skyline of the flats towered black against the hues of evening. To the left the older houses raised a square-cut, irregular parapet against the grey. Margaret fumbled for her latch-key. Of course she had forgotten it. So grasping her umbrella by its ferrule, she leant over the area and tapped the dining-room window. "'Helen! Let us in!' "'All right,' said a voice. "'You've been taking this gentleman's umbrella.' "'Taken a what?' said Helen, opening the door. "'Oh, what's that? Oh, do come in. How do you do?' "'Helen, you must not be so ramshackly. You took this gentleman's umbrella away from Queen's Hall, and he has had the trouble of coming for it.' "'Oh, I am so sorry!' cried Helen, all her hair flying. She had pulled off her hat as soon as she returned, and had flung herself into the big dining-room chair. "'I do nothing but steal umbrellas. I am so very sorry. 
Do come in and choose one. Is yours a hooky or a nobly? Mine's a nobly. At least, I think it is. The light was turned on, and they began to search the hall, Helen, who had abruptly parted with the Fifth Symphony, commenting with shrill little cries. "'Don't you talk, Meg! You stole an old gentleman's silk-top hat!' "'Yes, she did, Aunt Julie. It is a positive fact. She thought it was a muff. Oh, heavens! I've knocked the in-and-out card down. Where's Frida? Tibby, why don't you ever—' No, I can't remember what I was going to say. That wasn't it, but do tell the maids to hurry tea up. What about this umbrella? She opened it. No, it's all gone along the seams. It's an appalling umbrella. It must be mine. But it was not. He took it from her, murmured a few words of thanks, and then fled with the lilting step of the clerk. But if you will stop, cried Margaret. Now, Helen, how stupid you've been! Whatever have I done? Don't you see that you frightened him away? I meant him to stop to tea. You oughtn't to talk about stealing or holes in an umbrella. I saw his nice eyes getting so miserable. No, it's not a bit of good now. For Helen had darted into the street, shouting, Oh, do stop! I dare say it is all for the best, opined Mrs. Munt. We know nothing about the young man, Margaret, and your drawing-room is full of very tempting little things. But Helen cried, Aunt Julie, how can you? You make me more and more ashamed. I'd rather he had been a thief and taken all the apostle spoons than that I— Well, I must shut the front door, I suppose. One more failure for Helen. Yes, I think the apostle spoons could have gone as rent, said Margaret. Seeing that her aunt did not understand, she added, "'You remember rent. It was one of father's words, rent to the ideal, to his own faith in human nature. You remember how he would trust strangers, and if they fooled him he would say, "'It's better to be fooled than to be suspicious. That the confidence trick is the work of the man, but the want of confidence trick is the work of the devil.' "'I remember something of the sort now,' said Mrs. Munt, rather tartly for she longed to add, "'It was lucky that her father married a wife with money.' But this was unkind, and she contented herself with, "'Why, he might have stolen the little Ricketts picture as well.' "'Better that he had,' said Helen, stoutly. "'No, I agree with Aunt Julie,' said Margaret. "'I'd rather mistrust people than lose my little Ricketts. There are limits.' Their brother, finding the incident commonplace, had stolen upstairs to see whether there were scones for tea. He warmed the teapot almost too deftly, rejected the orange pico that the parlour-maid had provided, poured in five spoonfuls of a superior blend, filled up with a really boiling water, and now called to the ladies to be quick or they would lose the aroma. "'All right, Auntie Tibby,' called Helen, while Margaret, thoughtful again, said, "'In a way, I wish we had a real boy in the house.' the kind of boy who cares for men. It would make entertaining so much easier." "'So do I,' said her sister. "'Tibby only cares for cultured females singing Brahms.' And when they joined him, she said rather sharply, "'Why didn't you make that young man welcome, Tibby? You must do the host a little, you know. You ought to have taken his hat and coaxed him into stopping, instead of letting him be swamped by screaming women.' Tibby sighed and drew a long strand of hair over his forehead. "'Oh, it's no good-looking superior. I mean what I say.' Oh, "'Leave Tibby alone,' said Margaret, who could not bear her brother to be scolded. "'Here's the house a regular hen-coop,' grumbled Helen. "'Oh, my dear,' protested Mrs. Munt, "'how can you say such dreadful things? The number of men you get here has always astonished me. If there is any danger, it's the other way round. Yes, but it's the wrong sort of men, Helen means. No, I don't, corrected Helen. We get the right sort of man, but the wrong side of him. And I say that's Tibby's fault. There ought to be a something about the house, and I don't know what. A touch of the W's, perhaps? Helen put out her tongue. Who are the W's? asked Tibby. 
The W's are things I and Meg and Aunt Julie know about, and you don't, so there. I suppose that ours is a female house, said Margaret, and one must just accept it. No, Aunt Julie, I don't mean that this house is full of women. I am trying to say something much more clever. I mean that it was irrevocably feminine, even in father's time. Now I'm sure you understand. Well, I'll give you another example. It'll shock you, but I don't care. Suppose Queen Victoria gave a dinner party, and that the guests had been Leighton, Millet, Swinburne, Rossetti, Meredith, Fitzgerald, etc. Do you suppose that the atmosphere of that dinner would have been artistic? Heavens, no! The very chairs on which they sat would have seen to that. So with our house. It must be feminine, and all we can do is to see that it isn't effeminate. Just as another house that I can mention, but I won't, sounded irrevocably masculine, and all its inmates can do is to see that it isn't brutal. That house being the W's house, I presume, said Tibby. You're not going to be told about the W's, my child, Helen cried, so don't you think it. And on the other hand, I don't the least mind if you find out. So don't think you've done anything clever in either case. Give me a cigarette. You do what you can for the house, said Margaret. The drawing room reeks of smoke. If you smoked too, the house might suddenly turn masculine. Atmosphere is probably a question of touch and go. Even at Queen Victoria's dinner party, if something had been just a little different, perhaps if she'd worn a clinging Liberty tea gown instead of a magenta satin, with an Indian shawl over her shoulders, fastened at the bosom with a cairngorm pin. Bursts of disloyal laughter. You must remember that they are half German. Greeted these suggestions, and Margaret said pensively, "How inconceivable it would be if the royal family cared about art." And the conversation drifted away and away, and Helen's cigarette turned to a spot in the darkness, and the great flats opposite were sown with lighted windows, which vanished and were relit again, and vanished incessantly. Beyond them, the thoroughfare roared gently. A tide that can never be quiet, while in the east, invisible behind the smokes of Wapping, the moon was rising. That reminds me, Margaret. We might have taken that young man into the dining room at all events. Only the majolica plate, and that is so firmly set in the wall. I am really distressed that he had no tea. For that little incident had impressed the three women more than might be supposed. It remained as a goblin football. As a hint that all is not for the best in the best of all possible worlds, and that beneath these superstructures of wealth and art, there wanders an ill-fed boy, who has recovered his umbrella indeed, but who has left no address behind him, and no name. End of Chapter Five. Howard's End, by E. M. Forster, Chapter Six. We are not concerned with the very poor; they are unthinkable, and only to be approached by the statistician or the poet. This story deals with gentlefolk, or with those who are obliged to pretend that they are gentlefolk. The boy, Leonard Bast, stood at the extreme verge of gentility. He was not in the abyss, but he could see it, and at times people whom he knew had dropped in and counted no more. He knew that he was poor, and would admit it. He would have sooner died than confess any inferiority to the rich. This may be splendid of him, but he was inferior to most rich people. There is not the least doubt of it. He was not as courteous as the average rich man, nor as intelligent, nor as healthy, nor as lovable. His mind and his body had been alike underfed, because he was poor. And because he was modern, they were always craving better food. Had he lived some centuries ago in the brightly coloured civilizations of the past, he would have had a definite status. His rank and his income would have corresponded. But in his day, the angel of democracy had arisen, in shadowing the classes with leathern wings, and proclaiming, "All men are equal. All men, that is to say, who possess umbrellas." And so he was obliged to assert gentility, lest he slipped into the abyss where nothing counts, and the statements of democracy are inaudible. 
As he walked away from Wickham Place, his first care was to prove that he was as good as the Miss Schlegels. Obscurely wounded in his pride, he tried to wound them in return. They were probably not ladies. Would real ladies have asked him to tea? They were certainly ill-natured and cold. At each step his feeling of superiority increased. Would a real lady have talked about stealing an umbrella? Perhaps they were thieves, after all. And if he had gone into the house, they could have clapped a chloroformed handkerchief over his face. He walked on complacently as far as the Houses of Parliament. There an empty stomach asserted itself, and told him he was a fool. "'Evening, Mr. Bast?' "'Evening, Mr. Deltry. "'Nice evening.' "'Evening.' Mr. Deltry, a fellow clerk, passed on, and Leonard stood wondering whether he would take the tram as far as a penny would take him, or whether he would walk. He decided to walk. It is no good giving in, and he had spent money enough at Queen's Hall, and he walked over Westminster Bridge, in front of St. Thomas's Hospital, and through the immense tunnel that passes under the southwestern main line at Vauxhall. In the tunnel he paused and listened to the roar of the trains. A sharp pain darted through his head, and he was conscious of the exact form of his eye-sockets. He pushed on for another mile, and did not slacken speed until he stood at the entrance of a road called Camellia Road, which was, at present, his home. Here he stopped again, and glanced suspiciously to right and left, like a rabbit that is going to bolt into its hole. A block of flats, constructed with extreme cheapness, towered on either hand. Farther down the road two more blocks were being built, and beyond these an old house was being demolished to accommodate another pair. It was the kind of scene that may be observed all over London, whatever the locality, bricks and mortar rising and falling with the restlessness of the water in a fountain, as the city receives more and more men upon her soil. Camellia Road would soon stand out like a fortress, and command for a little an extensive view only for a little. Plans were out for the erection of flats in Magnolia Road also, and again a few years, and all the flats in either road might be pulled down, and new buildings, of a vastness at present unimaginable, might arise where they had fallen. "'Evening, Mr. Bast.' "'Evening, Mr. Cunningham.' "'Very serious thing, this decline of the birth-rate in Manchester.' "'I beg your pardon?' "'Very serious thing, this decline of the birth-rate in Manchester,' repeated Mr. Cunningham, tapping the Sunday paper, in which the calamity in question had just been announced to him. "'Ah, yes,' said Leonard, who was not going to let on that he had not bought a Sunday paper. "'This kind of thing goes on. The population of England will be stationary in 1960. "'You don't say so?' "'I call it a very serious thing, eh?' "'Good evening, Mr. Cunningham.' "'Good evening, Mr. Bast.' Then Leonard entered Block B of the flats, and turned, not upstairs, but down, into what is known to house agents as a semi-basement, and to other men as a cellar. He opened the door, and cried, "Hullo!" with the pseudo-geniality of the cockney. There was no reply. "Hullo!" he repeated. The sitting-room was empty, though the electric light had been left burning. A look of relief came over his face, and he flung himself into the armchair. The sitting-room contained, besides the armchair, two other chairs, a piano, a three-legged table, and a cosy corner. Of the walls, one was occupied by the window, the other by a draped mantel-shelf bristling with cupids. Opposite the window was the door, and beside the door a bookcase, while over the piano there extended one of the masterpieces of Maud Goodman. It was an amorous and not unpleasant little hole when the curtains were drawn and the lights turned on and the gas stove unlit. But it struck that shallow makeshift note that is so often heard in the modern dwelling-place. It had been too easily gained, and could be relinquished too easily. As Leonard was kicking off his boots he jarred the three-legged table, and a photograph frame, honourably poised upon it, slid sideways, fell off into the fireplace, and smashed. He swore in a colourless sort of way, and picked the photograph up. It represented a young lady called Jackie, 
and had been taken at the time when young ladies called Jackie were often photographed with their mouths open. Teeth of dazzling whiteness extended along either of Jackie's jaws, and positively weighted her head sideways, so large were they, and so numerous. Take my word for it, that smile was simply stunning, and it is only you and I who will be fastidious, and complain that true joy begins in the eyes, and that the eyes of Jackie did not accord with her smile, but were anxious and hungry. Leonard tried to pull out the fragments of glass, and cut his fingers, and swore again. A drop of blood fell on the frame, another followed, spilling over on to the exposed photograph. He swore more vigorously, and dashed to the kitchen where he bathed his hands. The kitchen was the same size as the sitting-room, through it was a bedroom. This completed his home. He was renting the flat furnished. Of all the objects that encumbered it, none were his own except the photograph frame, the cupids, and the books. "'Damn! Damn! Damnation!' he murmured, together with such other words as he had learnt from older men. Then he raised his hand to his forehead, and said, "'Oh, damn it all!' which meant something different. He pulled himself together. He drank a little tea, black and silent, that still survived upon an upper shelf. He swallowed some dusty crumbs of cake. Then he went back to the sitting-room, settled himself anew, and began to read a volume of Ruskin. Seven miles to the north of Venice. How perfectly the famous chapter opens! How supreme its command of admonition and of poetry! The rich man is speaking to us from his gondola. Seven miles to the north of Venice, the banks of sand which near the city rise little above low water-mark, attain by degrees a higher level, and knit themselves at last into fields of salt morass, raised here and there into shapeless mounds, and intercepted by narrow creeks of sea. Leonard was trying to form his style on Ruskin. He understood him to be the greatest master of English prose. He read forward steadily, occasionally making a few notes. Let us consider a little each of these characters in succession, and first, for of the shafts enough has been said already, what is very peculiar to the church, its luminousness. Was there anything to be learnt from this fine sentence? Could he adapt it to the needs of daily life? Could he introduce it, with modifications, when he next wrote a letter to his brother, the lay reader? For example, let us consider a little each of these characters in succession, and first, for of the absence of ventilation enough has been said already, what is very peculiar to this flat, its obscurity. Something told him that the modifications would not do, and that something, had he known it, was the spirit of English prose. My flat is dark as well as stuffy. Those were the words for him. And the voice in the gondola rolled on, piping melodiously of effort and self-sacrifice, full of high purpose, full of beauty, full even of sympathy and the love of men, yet somehow eluding all that was actual and insistent in Leonard's life. For it was the voice of one who had never been dirty or hungry, and had not guessed successfully what dirt and hunger are. Leonard listened to it with reverence. He felt that he was being done good to, and that if he kept on with Ruskin and the Queen's Hall concerts, and some pictures by Watts, he would one day push his head out of the grey waters and see the universe. He believed in sudden conversion, a belief which may be right, but which is peculiarly attractive to a half-baked mind. It is the bias of much popular religion. In the domain of business it dominates the stock exchange and becomes that bit of luck by which all successes and failures are explained. If only I had a bit of luck, the whole thing would come straight. He's got a most magnificent place down at Streatham, and a twenty HP fiat. But then, mind you, he's had luck. I'm sorry the wife's so late, but she never has any luck over catching trains. Leonard was superior to these people. He did believe in effort and in a steady preparation for the change that he desired. But of a heritage that may expand gradually, he had no conception. He hoped to come to culture suddenly, much as the revivalist hopes to come to Jesus. 
Those Miss Schlegels had come to it. They had done the trick. Their hands were upon the ropes once and for all. And meanwhile his flat was dark, as well as stuffy. Presently there was a noise on the staircase. He shut up Margaret's card in the pages of Ruskin and opened the door. A woman entered, of whom it is simplest to say that she was not respectable. Her appearance was awesome. She seemed all strings and bell-pulls, ribbons, chains, bead necklaces that clinked and caught, and a boa of azure feathers hung around her neck, with the ends uneven. Her throat was bare, wound with a double row of pearls, her arms were bare to the elbows, and might again be detected at the shoulder through cheap lace. Her hat, which was flowery, resembled those punnets covered with flannel which we sewed with mustard and cress in our childhood, and which germinated here yes and there no. She wore it on the back of her head. As for her hair, or rather hairs, they are too complicated to describe, but one system went down her back, lying in a thick pad there, while another, created for a lighter destiny, rippled around her forehead. The face. The face does not signify. It was the face of the photograph, but older, and the teeth were not so numerous as the photographer has suggested, and certainly not so white. Yes, Jackie was past her prime, whatever that prime may have been. She was descending quicker than most women into the colourless years, and the look in her eyes confessed it. "'What ho!' said Leonard, greeting that apparition with much spirit, and helping it off with its boa. Jackie, in husky tones, replied, "'What ho!' "'Been out?' he asked. The question sounds superfluous, but it cannot have been really, for the lady answered, "'No,' adding, "'Oh, I'm so tired!' "'You tired?' "'Eh? I'm tired.' said he, hanging the boa up. "'Oh, Len, I am so tired!' "'I've been to that classical concert I told you about,' said Leonard. "'What's that?' "'I came back as soon as it was over.' "'Anyone been round to our place?' asked Jackie. "'Not that I've seen. I met Mr. Cunningham outside, and we passed a few remarks.' "'What, not Mr. Cunningham?' Yes. Oh, you mean Mr. Cunningham. Yes, Mr. Cunningham. I've been out to tea at a lady friend's. Her secret being at last given to the world, and the name of the lady friend being even adumbrated, Jackie made no further experiments in the difficult and tiring art of conversation. She never had been a great talker. Even in her photographic days she had relied upon her smile and her figure to attract, and now that she was, "'On the shelf, on the shelf, boys, boys, I'm on the shelf,' she was not likely to find her tongue. Occasional bursts of song, of which the above is an example, still issued from her lips, but the spoken word was rare. She sat down on Leonard's knee, and began to fondle him. She was now a massive woman of thirty-three, and her weight hurt him, but he could not very well say anything. Then she said, "'Is that a book you're reading?' And he said, "'That's a book,' and drew it from her unreluctant grasp. Margaret's card fell out of it. It fell face downwards, and he murmured, "'Bookmarker.' "'Len!' "'What is it?' he asked, a little wearily for she had only one topic of conversation when she sat upon his knee. "'You do love me?' "'Jackie, you know that I do. How can you ask such questions?' "'But you do love me, Len, don't you?' "'Of course I do.' A pause. The other remark was still due. "'Len!' "'Well, what is it?' "'Len—' "'You will make it all right.' "'I can't have you ask me that again,' said the boy, flaring up into a sudden passion. "'I've promised to marry you when I'm of age, and that's enough. My word's my word. I've promised to marry you as soon as ever I'm twenty-one, and I can't keep on being worried. I've worries enough. It isn't likely I'd throw you over, let alone my word, when I've spent all this money. Besides, 
I'm an Englishman, and I never go back on my word. Jacky, do be reasonable. Of course I'll marry you. Only do stop badgering me. When's your birthday, Len? I've told you again and again, the eleventh of November next. Now get off my knee a bit. Someone must get supper, I suppose. Jacky went through to the bedroom and began to see to her hat. This meant blowing at it with short, sharp puffs. Leonard tidied up the sitting room and began to prepare their evening meal. He put a penny into the slot of the gas meter, and soon the flat was reeking with metallic fumes. Somehow he could not recover his temper, and all the time he was cooking he continued to complain bitterly. Really is too bad when a fellow isn't trusted. Makes one feel so wild. When I've pretended to the people here that you're my wife. All right, you shall be my wife. And I've bought you the ring to wear, and I've taken this flat furnished, and it's far more than I can afford. And yet you aren't content. And I've also not told the truth when I've written home. He lowered his voice. He'd stop it. In a tone of horror that was a little luxurious, he repeated, My brother would stop it. I'm going against the whole world, Jackie. That's what I am, Jackie. I don't take any heed of what anyone says. I just go straight forward, I do. It's always been my way. I'm not one of your weak, knock-kneed chaps. If a woman's in trouble, I don't leave her in the lurch. It's not my street. No thank you. I'll tell you another thing, too. I care a good deal about improving myself by means of literature and art, and so getting a wider outlook. For instance, when you came in, I was reading Ruskin's Stones of Venice. I don't say this to boast. But just to show you the kind of man I am. I can tell you I enjoyed that classical concert this afternoon. To all his moods, Jackie remained equally indifferent. When supper was ready, and not before, she emerged from the bedroom, saying, But you do love me, don't you? They began with a soup square, which Leonard had just dissolved in some hot water. It was followed by the tongue, a freckled cylinder of meat with a little jelly at the top. And a great deal of yellow fat at the bottom, ending with another square dissolved in water, jelly, pineapple, which Leonard had prepared earlier in the day. Jackie ate contentedly enough, occasionally looking at her man with those anxious eyes, to which nothing else in her appearance corresponded, and which yet seemed to mirror her soul. And Leonard managed to convince his stomach that it was having a nourishing meal. After supper, they smoked cigarettes and exchanged a few statements. She observed that her likeness had been broken. He found occasion to remark for the second time that he had come straight back home after the concert at Queen's Hall. Presently, she sat upon his knee. The inhabitants of Camellia Road tramped to and fro outside the window, just on a level with their heads, and the family in the flat on the ground floor began to sing, Hark, my soul, it is the Lord. That tune fairly gives me the hump, said Leonard. Jackie followed this and said that, for her part, she thought it a lovely tune. No, I'll play you something lovely. Get up, dear, for a minute. He went to the piano and jingled out a little Greek. He played badly and vulgarly, but the performance was not without its effect, for Jackie said she thought she'd be going to bed. As she receded, a new set of interests possessed the boy. And he began to think of what had been said about music by that odd Miss Schlegel, the one that twisted her face about so when she spoke. Then the thoughts grew sad and envious. There was the girl named Helen who had pinched his umbrella, and the German girl who had smiled at him pleasantly, and Herr someone, and Aunt someone, and the brother, all, all with their hands on the ropes. They had all passed up that narrow, rich staircase at Wickham Place to some ample room. Whether he could never follow them, not if he read for ten hours a day. Oh, it was not good, this continual aspiration. Some are born cultured, the rest had better go in for whatever comes easy. To see life steadily and to see it whole was not for the likes of him. From the darkness beyond the kitchen, a voice called, Len! You in bed? he asked, his forehead twitching. Hmm. All right. Presently she called him again. I must clean my boots ready for the morning, 
he answered. Presently she called him again. "'I rather want to get this chapter done.' "'What?' He closed his ears against her. "'What's that?' "'All right, Jackie, nothing. I'm reading a book.' "'What?' "'What?' he answered, catching her degraded deafness. Presently she called him again. Ruskin had visited Torcello by this time, and was ordering his gondoliers to take him to Murano. It occurred to him, as he glided over the whispering lagoons, that the power of nature could not be shortened by the folly, nor her beauty altogether saddened by the misery of such as Leonard. End of chapter 6 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 7 "'Oh, Margaret!' cried her aunt next morning. "'Such a most unfortunate thing has happened. I could not get you alone.' The most unfortunate thing was not very serious. One of the flats in the ornate block opposite had been taken furnished by the Wilcox family— coming up, no doubt, in the hope of getting into London society. That Mrs. Munn should be the first to discover the misfortune was not remarkable, for she was so interested in the flats that she watched their every mutation with unwearying care. In theory, she despised them. They took away that old-world look. They cut off the sun. Flats house a flashy type of person. But if the truth had been known, she found her visits to Wickham Place twice as amusing since Wickham Mansions had arisen, and would, in a couple of days, learn more about them than her nieces in a couple of months, or her nephew in a couple of years. She would stroll across and make friends with the porters, and inquire what the rents were, exclaiming, for example, "'What! A hundred and twenty for a basement! You'll never get it!' And they would answer, one can but try, madam. The passenger lifts, the provision lifts, the arrangement for coals, a great temptation for a dishonest porter, were all familiar matters to her, and perhaps a relief from the politico-economical aesthetic atmosphere that reigned at the Schlegels. Margaret received the information calmly, and did not agree that it would throw a cloud over poor Helen's life. "'Oh, but Helen isn't a girl with no interests,' she explained. She has plenty of other things and other people to think about. She made a full start with the Wilcoxes, and she'll be as willing as we are to have nothing more to do with them. "'For a clever girl, dear, how very oddly you do talk! Helen'll have to have something more to do with them, now that they're all opposite. She may meet that Paul in the street. She cannot very well not bow. Of course she must bow. "'But look here, let's do the flowers. "'I was going to say, the will to be interested in him has died, and what else matters? "'I look on that disastrous episode, over which you were so kind, "'as the killing of a nerve in Helen. "'It's dead, and she'll never be troubled with it again. "'The only things that matter are the things that interest one. "'Bowing, even calling and leaving cards, even a dinner-party— we can do all those things to the Wilcoxes, if they find it agreeable. But the other thing, the one important thing, never again. Don't you see?" Mrs. Munt did not see, and indeed Margaret was making a most questionable statement, that any emotion, any interest, once vividly aroused, can wholly die. "'I also have the honour to inform you that the Wilcoxes are bored with us. I didn't tell you at the time. It might have made you angry, and you had enough to worry you. But I wrote a letter to Mrs. W., and apologized for the trouble that Helen had given them. She didn't answer it. How very rude! I wonder. Or was it sensible? No, Margaret, most rude! In either case, one can class it as reassuring. Mrs. Munt sighed. She was going back to Swanage on the morrow, just as her nieces were wanting her most. Other regrets crowded upon her. For instance, how magnificently she would have cut Charles if she had met him face to face. She had already seen him giving an order to the porter, and very common he looked in a tall hat. But unfortunately his back was turned to her, 
and though she had cut his back she could not regard this as a telling snub. "'But you will be careful, won't you?' she exhorted. "'Oh, certainly! Fiendishly careful! And Helen must be careful, too!' "'Careful over what?' cried Helen, at that moment coming into the room with her cousin. "'Nothing,' said Margaret, seized with a momentary awkwardness. "'Careful over what, Aunt Julie?' Mrs. Munt assumed a cryptic air. "'It is only that a certain family, whom we know by name, but do not mention, as you said yourself last night after the concert, have taken the flat opposite from the Mathesons, where the plants are in the balcony.' Helen began some laughing reply, and then disconcerted them all by blushing. Mrs. Munt was so disconcerted that she exclaimed, "'What, Helen, you don't mind them coming, do you?' and deepened the blush to crimson. "'Of course I don't mind,' said Helen, a little crossly. "'It is that you and Meg are both so absurdly grave about it, where there's nothing to be grave about at all.' "'I'm not grave,' protested Margaret, a little cross in her turn. "'Well, you look grave. Doesn't she, Frida?' "'I don't feel grave, that's all I can say. You're going quite on the wrong tack.' "'No, she does not feel grave,' echoed Mrs. Munt. "'I can bear witness to that. She disagrees.' "'Hark!' interrupted Fräulein Mosebach. "'I hear Bruno entering the hall.' For Herr Lisek was due at Wickham Place to call for the two younger girls. He was not entering the hall. In fact, he did not enter it for quite five minutes. But Frida detected a delicate situation, and said that she and Helen had much better wait for Bruno down below, and leave Margaret and Mrs. Munt to finish arranging the flowers. Helen acquiesced. But, as if to prove that the situation was not delicate really, she stopped in the doorway and said, "'Did you say the Matheson's flat, Aunt Judy? How wonderful you are! I never knew that the woman who laced too tightly's name was Matheson.' "'Come, Helen,' said her cousin. "'Go, Helen,' said her aunt, and continued to Margaret almost in the same breath. "'Helen cannot deceive me. She does mind.' "'Oh, hush!' breathed Margaret. "'Frida'll hear you, and she can be so tiresome.' "'She minds,' persisted Mrs. Munt, moving thoughtfully about the room and pulling the dead chrysanthemums out of the vases. "'I knew she'd mind, and I'm sure a girl ought to. Such an experience! Such awful, coarse-grained people! I know more about them than you do, which you forget, and if Charles had taken you that motor drive, well, you'd have reached the house a perfect wreck.' "'Oh, Margaret, you don't know what you were in for. They're all bottled up against the drawing-room window. There's Mrs. Wilcox. I've seen her. There's Paul. There's Evie, who was a minx. There's Charles. I saw him to start with. And who would an elderly man with a moustache and a copper-coloured face be?' "'Mr. Wilcox, possibly.' "'I knew it. And there's Mr. Wilcox.' "'It's a shame to call his face copper-colour,' complained Margaret. "'He has a remarkably good complexion for a man of his age.' Mrs. Munt, triumphant elsewhere, could afford to concede Mr. Wilcox his complexion. She passed on from it to the plan of campaign that her nieces should pursue in the future. Margaret tried to stop her. "'Helen did not take the news quite as I expected, but the Wilcox nerve is dead in her, really, so there's no need for plans.' It's as well to be prepared. No, it's as well not to be prepared. Because— Her thoughts drew being from the obscure borderland. She could not explain in so many words, but she felt that those who prepare for all the emergencies of life beforehand may equip themselves at the expense of joy. It is necessary to prepare for an examination, or a dinner-party, or a possible fall in the price of stock, those who attempt human relations must adopt another method, or fail. "'Because I'd sooner risk it,' was her lame conclusion. "'But imagine the evenings!' exclaimed her aunt, pointing to the mansions with the spout of the watering-can. 
turn the electric light on here or there, and it's almost the same room. One evening they may forget to draw their blinds down, and you'll see them, and the next you yours, and they'll see you. Impossible to sit out on the balconies, impossible to water the plants or even speak. Imagine going out of the front door and they come out opposite at the same moment. And yet you tell me that plans are unnecessary, and you'd rather risk it. I hope to risk things all my life. Oh, Margaret, most dangerous. But after all, she continued with a smile, there's never any great risk as long as you have money. Oh, shame! What a shocking speech! Money pads the edges of things, said Miss Schlegel. God help those who have none. But this is something quite new, said Mrs. Munt, who collected new ideas as a squirrel collects nuts, and was especially attracted by those that are portable. New for me. Sensible people have acknowledged it for years. You and I and the Wilcoxes stand upon money as upon islands. It is so firm beneath our feet that we forget its very existence. It's only when we see someone near us, tottering, that we realize all that an independent income means. Last night, when we were talking up here round the fire, I began to think that the very soul of the world is economic, and that the lowest abyss is not the absence of love, but the absence of coin. I call that rather cynical. So do I. But Helen and I, we ought to remember, when we are tempted to criticise others, that we are standing on those islands, and that most of the others are down below the surface of the sea. The poor cannot always reach those whom they want to love, and they can hardly ever escape from those whom they love no longer. We rich can. Imagine the tragedy last June if Helen and Paul Wilcox had been poor people, and couldn't invoke railways and motor-cars to part them. "'That's more like socialism,' said Mrs. Munt suspiciously. "'Call it what you like. I call it going through life with one's hand spread open on the table. I'm tired of these rich people who pretend to be poor, and think it shows a nice mind to ignore the piles of money that keep their feet above the waves. I stand each year upon six hundred pounds, and Helen upon the same, and Tibby will stand upon eight. And as fast as our pounds crumble away into the sea, they are renewed. From the sea, yes, from the sea. And all our thoughts are the thoughts of six hundred pounders and all our speeches. And because we don't want to steal umbrellas ourselves, we forget that below the sea people do want to steal them, and do steal them sometimes, and that what's a joke up here is down there reality. There they go! There goes Fräulein Mosebach! Really, for a German, she does dress charmingly. Oh! What is it? Helen was looking up at the Wilcox's flat. Why shouldn't she? I beg your pardon, I interrupted you. What was it you were saying about reality? I had worked it round to myself, as usual, answered Margaret, in tones that were suddenly preoccupied. Do tell me this, at all events. Are you for the rich, or for the poor? Too difficult. Ask me another. Am I for poverty or for riches? For riches. Hurrah for riches! <laughs> for riches! echoed Mrs. Munt, having, as it were, at last secured her nut. Yes, for riches! Money for ever! So am I, and so I am afraid are most of my acquaintances at Swanage. But I am surprised that you agree with us. Thank you so much, Aunt Julie. While I have talked theories, you have done the flowers. Not at all, dear. I wish you would let me help you in more important things. Well, would you be very kind? Would you come round with me to the registry office? There's a housemaid who won't say yes, but doesn't say no. On their way thither, they too looked up at the Wilcox's flat. Evie was in the balcony, 
staring most rudely, according to Mrs. Munt. Oh, yes, it was a nuisance, there was no doubt of it. Helen was proof against a passing encounter, but Margaret began to lose confidence. Might it reawake the dying nerve if the family were living close against her eyes? And Frieda Mosbach was stopping with them for another fortnight, and Frieda was sharp, abominably sharp, and quite capable of remarking, "'You love one of the young gentlemen opposite, yes?' The remark would be untrue, but of the kind which, if stated often enough, may become true, just as the remark, "'England and Germany are bound to fight,' renders war a little more likely each time that it is made, and is therefore made the more readily by the gutter-press of either nation. Have the private emotions also their gutter-press? Margaret thought so, and feared that good Aunt Julie and Frieda were typical specimens of it. They might, by continual chatter, lead Helen into a repetition of the desires of June. Into a repetition, they could not do more, they could not lead her into lasting love. They were, she saw it clearly, journalism. Her father, with all his defects and wrong-headedness, had been literature, and had he lived, he would have persuaded his daughter rightly. The registry office was holding its morning reception. A string of carriages filled the street. Miss Schlegel waited her turn, and finally had to be content with an insidious temporary, being rejected by genuine housemaids on the ground of her numerous stairs. Her failure depressed her, and though she forgot the failure, the depression remained. On her way home she again glanced up at the Wilcox's flat, and took the rather matronly step of speaking about the matter to Helen. "'Helen, you must tell me whether this thing worries you.' "'If what?' said Helen, who was washing her hands for lunch. "'The W's coming.' "'No, of course not.' "'Really?' Really. Then she admitted that she was a little worried on Mrs. Wilcox's account. She implied that Mrs. Wilcox might reach backward into deep feelings, and be pained by things that never touched the other members of that clan. "'I shan't mind if Paul points at our house and says, "'There lives the girl who tried to catch me.' "'But she might.' "'If even that worries you, we could arrange something.' There's no reason we should be near people who displease us, or whom we displease, thanks to our money. We might even go away for a little. Well, I am going away. Frieda's just asked me to Stettin, and I shan't be back till after the new year. Will that do? Or must I fly the country altogether? Really, Meg, what has come over you to make such a fuss? Oh, I'm getting an old maid, I suppose. I thought I minded nothing, but really I—I I should be bored if you fell in love with the same man twice, and—she cleared her throat. You did go red, you know, when Aunt Julie attacked you this morning. I shouldn't have referred to it otherwise. But Helen's laugh rang true, as she raised a soapy hand to heaven, and swore that never, nowhere, and no how would she again fall in love with any of the Wilcox family— down to its remotest collaterals. End of chapter 7 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 8 The friendship between Margaret and Mrs. Wilcox, which was to develop so quickly and with such strange results, may perhaps have had its beginnings at Speer in the spring. Perhaps the elder lady, as she gazed at the vulgar, ruddy cathedral, and listened to the talk of Helen and her husband, may have detected in the other and less charming of the sisters a deeper sympathy, a sounder judgment. She was capable of detecting such things. Perhaps it was she who had desired the Miss Schlegels to be invited to Howard's End, and Margaret whose presence she had particularly desired. All this is speculation. Mrs. Wilcox has left few clear indications behind her. It is certain that she came to call at Wickham Place a fortnight later, the very day that Helen was going with her cousin to Stettin. "'Helen!' cried Fräulein Mosebach, in awestruck tones. She was now in her cousin's confidence. "'His mother has forgiven you!' And then, remembering that in England the newcomer ought not to call before she is called upon— 
she changed her tone from awe to disapproval, and opined that Mrs. Wilcox was kind of dumb. "'Oh, bother the whole family!' snapped Margaret. "'Helen, stop giggling and pirouetting, and go and finish your packing. Why can't the woman leave us alone?' "'I don't know what I shall do with Meg,' Helen retorted, collapsing upon the stairs. "'She's got Wilcox and Box upon the brain. "'Meg, Meg, I don't love the young gentleman. "'I don't love the young gentleman, Meg, Meg. "'Can a body speak plainer?' "'Most certainly her love has died,' asserted Fräulein Mosebach. "'Most certainly it has, Frieda, "'but that will not prevent me from being bored with the Wilcoxes "'if I return the call.' Then Helen simulated tears, and Fräulein Mosebach, who thought her extremely amusing, did the same. "'Oh, boo-hoo! Boo-hoo-hoo! Meg's going to return the call, and I can't. Cause why? Cause I'm going to German, I. "'If you are going to Germany, go and pack. If you aren't, go and call on the Wilcoxes instead of me.' "'But, Meg, Meg, I don't love the young gentleman. I don't love the young—' "'Oh, Lud, who's that coming down the stairs? I vow tis my brother. Oh, criminy!' A male, even such a male as Tibby, was enough to stop the foolery. The barrier of sex, though decreasing among the civilized, is still high, and higher on the side of women. Helen could tell her sister all, and her cousin much about Paul— she told her brother nothing. It was not prudishness, for she now spoke of the Wilcox ideal, with laughter, and even with a growing brutality. Nor was it precaution, for Tibby seldom repeated any news that did not concern himself. It was rather the feeling that she betrayed a secret into the camp of men, and that, however trivial it was on this side of the barrier, it would become important on that. So she stopped— or rather began to fool on other subjects, until her long-suffering relatives drove her upstairs. Fräulein Mosebach followed her, but lingered to say heavily over the banisters to Margaret, "'It is all right. She does not love the young man. He has not been worthy of her.' "'Yes, I know. Thanks very much. I thought I did right to tell you. Ever so many thanks.' "'What's that?' asked Tibby. No one told him, and he proceeded into the dining-room to eat Elvis plums. That evening Margaret took decisive action. The house was very quiet, and the fog—we are in November now—pressed against the windows like an excluded ghost. Frida and Helen and all their luggage had gone. Tibby, who was not feeling well, lay stretched on a sofa by the fire. Margaret sat by him, thinking— her mind darted from impulse to impulse, and finally marshalled them all in review. The practical person, who knows what he wants at once, and generally knows nothing else, will excuse her of indecision. But this was the way her mind worked. And when she did act, no one could accuse her of indecision then. She hit out as lustily as if she had not considered the matter at all. The letter that she wrote Mrs. Wilcox glowed with the native hue of resolution— the pale cast of thought was with her a breath rather than a tarnish, a breath that leaves the colours all the more vivid when it has been wiped away. Dear Mrs. Wilcox, I have to write something discourteous. It would be better if we did not meet. Both my sister and my aunt have given displeasure to your family, and in my sister's case the grounds for displeasure might recur. As far as I know, she no longer occupies her thoughts with your son. But it would not be fair, either to her or to you, if they met. And it is therefore right that our acquaintance, which began so pleasantly, should end. I fear that you will not agree with this. Indeed, I know that you will not, since you have been good enough to call on us. It is only an instinct on my part, and no doubt the instinct is wrong. My sister would undoubtedly say that it is wrong. I write without her knowledge, and I hope that you will not associate her with my discourtesy. Believe me, yours truly, M. J. Schlegel. Margaret sent this letter round by post. 
Next morning she received the following reply by hand. Dear Miss Schlegel, you should not have written me such a letter. I call to tell you that Paul has gone abroad. Ruth Wilcox. Margaret's cheeks burnt. She could not finish her breakfast. She was on fire with shame. Helen had told her that the youth was leaving England, but other things had seemed more important and she had forgotten. All her absurd anxieties fell to the ground, and in their place arose the certainty that she had been rude to Mrs. Wilcox. Rudeness affected Margaret like a bitter taste in the mouth. It poisoned life. At times it is necessary, but woe to those who employ it without due need. She flung on a hat and shawl, just like a poor woman, and plunged into the fog which still continued. Her lips were compressed, the letter remained in her hand, and in this state she crossed the street, entered the marble vestibule of the flats, eluded the concierges, and ran up the stairs till she reached the second floor. She sent in her name, and to her surprise was shown straight into Mrs. Wilcox's bedroom. "'Oh, Mrs. Wilcox, I have made the baddest blunder. I am more, more ashamed and sorry than I can say.' Mrs. Wilcox bowed gravely. She was offended, and did not pretend to the contrary. She was sitting up in bed, writing letters on an invalid table that spanned her knees. A breakfast tray was on another table beside her. The light of the fire, the light from the window, and the light of a candle-lamp which threw a quivering halo round her hands, combined to create a strange atmosphere of dissolution. "'I knew he was going to India in November, but I forgot.' He sailed on the seventeenth for Nigeria, in Africa. I knew, I know. I have been too absurd all through. I am very much ashamed. Mrs. Wilcox did not answer. I am more sorry than I can say, and I hope that you will forgive me. It doesn't matter, Miss Schlegel. It is good of you to have come round so promptly. "'It does matter,' cried Margaret. "'I have been rude to you, and my sister is not even at home, so there was not even that excuse. "'Indeed?' "'She has just gone to Germany. Is she gone as well?' murmured the other. "'Yes, certainly it is quite safe. Safe absolutely now.' "'You've been worrying, too!' exclaimed Margaret, getting more and more excited, and taking a chair without invitation. "'How perfectly extraordinary! I can see that you have. You felt as I do. Helen mustn't meet him again.' "'I did think it best.' "'Now why?' "'That's a most difficult question,' said Mrs. Wilcox, smiling, and a little losing her expression of annoyance. I think you put it best in your letter. It was an instinct, which may be wrong. It wasn't that your son still—oh, no! He often—my <laughs> Paul is very young, you see. Then what was it? She repeated, An instinct, which may be wrong. In other words, they belong to types that can fall in love, but couldn't live together. That's dreadfully probable. I'm afraid that in nine cases out of ten, nature pulls one way, and human nature another. These are indeed other words, said Mrs. Wilcox. I had nothing so coherent in my head. I was merely alarmed when I knew that my boy cared for your sister. Ah, I have always been wanting to ask you. How did you know? Helen was so surprised when her aunt drove up, and you stepped forward and arranged things. Did Paul tell you? There is nothing to be gained by discussing that, said Mrs. Wilcox, after a moment's pause. Mrs. Wilcox, were you very angry with us last June? I wrote you a letter, and you didn't answer it. I was certainly against taking Mrs. Matheson's flat. I knew it was opposite your house. But it's all right now? I think so. You only think? You aren't sure? 
I do love these little muddles tidied up. Oh, yes, I'm sure," said Mrs. Wilcox, moving with uneasiness beneath the clothes. I always sound uncertain over things. It is my way of speaking. That's all right. And I'm sure, too. Here the maid came in to remove the breakfast tray. They were interrupted, and when they resumed conversation it was on more normal lines. I must say good-bye now. You will be getting up. No, please, stop a little longer. I am taking a day in bed. Now and then I do. I thought of you as one of the early risers. At Howard's end, yes. There is nothing to get up for in London. Nothing to get up for? cried the scandalized Margaret. When there are all the autumn exhibitions, and you say playing in the afternoon. Not to mention people. The truth is, I am a little tired. First came the wedding, and then Paul went off, and, instead of resting yesterday, I paid round of calls. A wedding? Yes, Charles, my eldest son, is married. Indeed! We took the flat chiefly on that account, and also that Paul could get his African outfit. The flat belongs to a cousin of my husband's, and she most kindly offered it to us. So before the day came we were able to make the acquaintance of Dolly's people, which we had not yet done. Margaret asked who Dolly's people were. Fussel. The father is in the Indian army, retired. The brother is in the army. The mother is dead. So perhaps these were the chinless, sunburnt men whom Helen had espied one afternoon through the window. Margaret felt mildly interested in the fortunes of the Wilcox family. She had acquired the habit on Helen's account, and it still clung to her. She asked for more information about Miss Dolly Fussell that was, and was given it in even, unemotional tones. Mrs. Milcox's voice, though sweet and compelling, had little range of expression. It suggested that pictures, concerts, and people are all of small and equal value. Only once had it quickened, when speaking of Howard's end. Charles and Albert Fussell have known one another some time. They belong to the same club, and are both devoted to golf. Dolly plays golf, too, though I believe not so well, and they first met in a mixed foursome. We all like her, and are very much pleased. They were married on the eleventh, a few days before Paul sailed. Charles was very anxious to have his brother as best man, so he made a great point of having it on the eleventh. The Fussells would have preferred it after Christmas, but they were very nice about it. There is Dolly's photograph, in that double frame. Are you quite certain that I am not interrupting Mrs. Wilcox? Yes, quite. Then I will stay. I am enjoying this. Dolly's photograph was now examined. It was signed, For Dear Mims, which Mrs. Wilcox interpreted as the name she and Charles had settled that she should call me. Dolly looked silly, and had one of those triangular faces that so often prove attractive to a robust man. She was very pretty. From her Margaret passed to Charles, whose features prevailed opposite. She speculated on the forces that had drawn the two together till God parted them. She found time to hope that they would be happy. They have gone to Naples for their honeymoon. Lucky people! I can hardly imagine Charles in Italy. Doesn't he care for travelling? He likes travel, but he does see through foreigners so. What he most enjoys is a motor tour in England, and I think that would have carried the day if the weather had not been so abominable. His father gave him a car of his own for a wedding present, which for the present is being stored at Howard's End. I suppose you have a garage there? Yes. My husband built a little one only last month to the west of the house, not far from the witch-elm, in what used to be the paddock for the pony. The last words had an indescribable ring about them. Where's the pony gone? asked Margaret, after a pause. The pony? No. Dead. 
ever so long ago. The witch-elm I remember. Helen spoke of it as a very splendid tree. It is the finest witch-elm in Hertfordshire. Did your sister tell you about the teeth? No! Oh, it might interest you. There are pig's teeth stuck into the trunk, about four feet from the ground. The country people put them in long ago, and they think that if they chew a piece of the bark, it will cure the toothache. The teeth are almost grown ever now, and no one comes to the tree. I should. I love folklore and all festering superstitions. Do you think that the tree really did cure toothache, if one believed in it? Of course it did. It would cure anything once. Certainly, I remember cases. You see, I lived at Howard's End long, long before Mr. Wilcox knew it. I was born there. The conversation again shifted. At the time it seemed little more than aimless chatter. She was interested when her hostess explained that Howard's End was her own property. She was bored when too minute an account was given of the Fussell family, of the anxieties of Charles concerning Naples, of the movements of Mr. Wilcox and Evie, who were motoring in Yorkshire. Margaret could not bear being bored. She grew inattentive, played with the photograph frame, dropped it, smashed Dolly's glass, apologized, was pardoned, cut her finger thereon, was pitied, and finally said she must be going. There was all the housekeeping to do, and she had to interview Tibby's riding-master. Then the curious note was struck again. "'Good-bye, Miss Schlegel. Good-bye. Thank you for coming. You have cheered me up.' "'I'm so glad. I—I I wonder whether you ever think about yourself.' "'I think of nothing else.' said Margaret, blushing, but letting her hand remain in that of the invalid. "'I wonder—I wondered at Heidelberg. "'I'm sure. "'I almost think—' "'Yes?' asked Margaret, for there was a long pause, a pause that was somehow akin to the flicker of the fire, the quiver of the reading-lamp upon their hands, the white blur from the window, a pause of shifting and eternal shadows. I almost think you forget you're a girl." Margaret was startled, and a little annoyed. "'I'm twenty-nine, she remarked. That's not so wildly girlish." Mrs. Wilcox smiled. "'What makes you say that? Do you mean that I have been gauche and rude?' A shake of the head. "'I only meant that I am fifty-one, and that to me, both of you, Read it all in some book or other. I cannot put things clearly. No, oh, I've got it. Inexperience. I'm no better than Helen, you mean, and yet I presume to advise her. Yes, you have got it. Inexperience is the word. Inexperience, repeated Margaret, in serious yet buoyant tones. Of course I have everything to learn, absolutely everything, just as much as Helen. Life's very difficult and full of surprises. At all events I've got as far as that. To be humble and kind, to go straight ahead, to love people rather than pity them, to remember the submerged—well, one can't do all these things at once, worse luck, because they're so contradictory. It's then that proportion comes in to live by proportion. Don't begin with proportion. Only prigs do that. Let proportion come in as a last resource, when the better things have failed, and a deadlock— oh, Gracious me, I've started preaching! Indeed, you put the difficulties of life splendidly," said Mrs. Wilcox, withdrawing her hand into the deeper shadows. It is just what I should have liked to say about them myself. End of chapter 8 Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 9 Mrs. Wilcox cannot be accused of giving Margaret much information about life. 
and Margaret, on the other hand, has made a fair show of modesty, and has pretended to an inexperience that she certainly did not feel. She had kept house for over ten years, she had entertained almost with distinction, she had brought up a charming sister, and was bringing up a brother. Surely, if experience is attainable, she had attained it. Yet the little luncheon party that she gave in Mrs. Wilcox's honour was not a success. The new friend did not blend with the one or two delightful people who had been asked to meet her, and the atmosphere was one of polite bewilderment. Her tastes were simple, her knowledge of culture slight, and she was not interested in the new English art club, nor in the dividing line between journalism and literature, which was started as a conversational hare. The delightful people darted after it with cries of joy, Margaret leading them, and not till the meal was half over did they realize that the principal guest had taken no part in the chase. There was no common topic. Mrs. Wilcox, whose life had been spent in the service of husband and sons, had little to say to strangers who had never shared it, and whose age was half her own. Clever talk alarmed her, and withered her delicate imaginings. It was the social counterpart of a motor-car, all jerks, and she was a wisp of hay, a flower. Twice she deplored the weather, twice criticized the train service on the great northern railway. They vigorously assented, and rushed on. And when she inquired whether there was any news of Helen, her hostess was too much occupied in placing Rothenstein to answer. The question was repeated. I hope that your sister is safe in Germany by now." Margaret checked herself, and said, "'Yes, thank you. I heard on Tuesday.' But the demon of vociferation was in her, and the next moment she was off again. "'Only on Tuesday, for they live right away at Stetten. Did you ever know any one living at Stetten? "'Never,' said Mrs. Wilcox gravely while her neighbour, a young man low down in the education office, began to discuss what people who lived at Stetten ought to look like. Was there such a thing as Stettininity? Margaret swept on. People at Stetten drop things into boats out of overhanging warehouses. At least, our cousins do, but aren't particularly rich. The town isn't interesting, except for a clock that rolls its eyes, and the view of the odour, which truly is something special. Oh, Mrs. Wilcox, you would love the odour! The river, or rather rivers, there seem to be dozens of them, are intense blue, and the plain they run through an intensest green. Indeed! That sounds a most beautiful view, Miss Schlegel. So I say, but Helen, who will muddle things, says no, it's like music. The course of the odour is to be like music. It's obliged to remind her of a symphonic poem. The part by the landing stage is in B minor, if I remember rightly, but lower down things get extremely mixed. There is a slodgy theme in several keys at once, meaning mud-banks, and another for the navigable canal, and the exit into the Baltic is in C-sharp major, pianissimo. "'What do the overhanging warehouses make of that?' asked the man, laughing. "'They make a great deal of it,' replied Margaret, unexpectedly rushing off on a new tack. "'I think it's affectation to compare the odour to music, and so do you. But the overhanging warehouses of Stetten take beauty seriously, which we don't, and the average Englishman doesn't, and despises all who do.' Now don't say Germans have no taste, or I shall scream. They haven't. But, but, such a tremendous but, they take poetry seriously. They do take poetry seriously. Is anything gained by that? Yes, yes, the German is always on the lookout for beauty. He may miss it through stupidity, or misinterpret it but he is always asking beauty to enter his life, and I believe that in the end it will come. At Heidelberg I met a fat veterinary surgeon, whose voice broke with sobs as he repeated some mawkish poetry. So easy for me to laugh, I who never repeat poetry good or bad, and cannot remember one fragment of verse to thrill myself with. 
My blood boils. Well, I'm half German, so put it down to patriotism, when I listen to the tasteful contempt of the average islander for things Teutonic, whether they're Bocklin or my veterinary surgeon. Oh, Bocklin, they say, he strains after beauty, he peoples nature with gods too consciously. Of course Bocklin strains, because he wants something, beauty and all the other intangible gifts that are floating about the world. So his landscapes don't come off, and ladies do. I'm not sure that I agree. Do you? said he, turning to Mrs. Wilcox. She replied, I think Miss Schlegel puts everything splendidly. And a chill fell on the conversation. Oh, Mrs. Wilcox, say something nicer than that. It's such a snub to be told you put things splendidly. I do not mean it as a snub. Your last speech interested me so much. Generally, people do not seem quite to like Germany. I have long wanted to hear what is said on the other side. The other side? Then you do disagree. Oh, good, give us your side. I have no side. But my husband—' Her voice softened, the chill increased. "'Has very little faith in the continent, and our children have all taken after him.' "'On what grounds? Do they feel that the continent is in bad form?' Mrs. Wilcox had no idea. She paid little attention to grounds. She was not intellectual nor even alert, and it was odd that, all the same, she should give the idea of greatness. Margaret, zigzagging with her friends over thought and art, was conscious of a personality that transcended their own, and dwarfed their activities. There was no bitterness in Mrs. Wilcox. There was not even criticism. She was lovable, and no ungracious or uncharitable word had passed her lips. Yet she and daily life were out of focus one or the other must show blurred. And at lunch she seemed more out of focus than usual, and nearer the line that divides life from a life that may be of greater importance. You will admit, though, that the continent—it seems silly to speak of the continent, but really it is all more like itself than any part of it is like England. England is unique. Do have another jelly first. I was going to say that the continent, for good or for evil, is interested in ideas. Its literature and art have what one might call the kink of the unseen about them, and this persists even through decadence and affectation. There is more liberty of action in England, but for liberty of thought go to bureaucratic Prussia. People will there discuss with humility vital questions that we here think ourselves too good to touch with tongs. I do not want to go to Prussian said Mrs. Wilcox, not even to see that interesting view that you were describing. And for discussing with humility, I am too old. We never discuss anything at Howard's End. Then you ought to, said Margaret. Discussion keeps the house alive. It cannot stand by bricks and mortar alone. It cannot stand without them, said Mrs. Wilcox unexpectedly catching on to the thought, and rousing for the first and last time a faint hope in the breasts of the delightful people. It cannot stand without them, and I sometimes think—but I cannot expect your generation to agree, for even my daughter disagrees with me here. Never mind us or her. Do say. I sometimes think— that it is wiser to leave action and discussion to men. There was a little silence. One admits that the arguments against the suffrage are extraordinarily strong, said a girl opposite, leaning forward and crumbling her bread. Are they? I never follow any arguments. I am only too thankful not to have a vote myself. We didn't mean the vote, though, did we? supplied Margaret. Aren't we differing on something much wider, Mrs. Wilcox? Whether women are to remain what they have been since the dawn of history, or whether since men have moved forward so far, they too may move forward a little now. I say they may. 
I would even admit a biological change. I don't know. I don't know. I must be getting back to my overhanging warehouse," said the man. They've turned disgracefully strict. Mrs. Wilcox also rose. Oh, but come upstairs for a little. Miss Quested plays. Do you like McDowell? Do you mind him only having two noises? If you really must go, I'll see you out. Won't you even have coffee? They left the dining room, closing the door behind them, and as Mrs. Wilcox buttoned up her jacket, she said, What an interesting life you all lead in London. No, we don't, said Margaret, with a sudden revulsion. We lead the lives of gibbering monkeys. Mrs. Wilcox, really, we have something quiet and stable at the bottom. We really have. All my friends have. Don't pretend you enjoyed lunch, for you loathed it. But forgive me by coming again, alone, or by asking me to you. I am used to young people. And with each word she spoke, the outlines of known things grew dim. I hear a great deal of chatter at home, for we, like you, entertain a great deal. With us it is more sport and politics, but— I enjoyed my lunch very much, Miss Schlegel, dear, and am not pretending, and only wish I could have joined in more. For one thing, I'm not particularly well just to-day. For another, you younger people move so quickly that it dazes me. Charles is the same, Dolly the same. But we are all in the same boat, old and young. I never forget that. They were silent for a moment. Then, with a newborn emotion, they shook hands. The conversation ceased suddenly when Margaret re-entered the dining-room. Her friends had been talking over her new friend, and had dismissed her as uninteresting. End of chapter 9、Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter Ten. Several days passed. Was Mrs. Wilcox one of the unsatisfactory people, there are many of them, who dangle intimacy and then withdraw it? They evoke our interests and affections, and keep the life of the spirit dawdling round them. Then they withdraw. When physical passion is involved, there is a definite name for such behavior flirting. And if carried far enough, it is punishable by law. But no law, not public opinion even, punishes those who coquette with friendship, though the dull ache that they inflict, the sense of misdirected effort and exhaustion, may be as intolerable. Was she one of these? Margaret feared so at first, for, with a Londoner's impatience, she wanted everything to be settled up immediately. She mistrusted the periods of quiet that are essential to true growth. Desiring to book Mrs. Wilcox as a friend, she pressed on the ceremony, pencil as it were in hand, pressing the more because the rest of the family were away, and the opportunity seemed favorable. But the elder woman would not be hurried. She refused to fit in with the Wickham Place set, or to reopen discussion of Helen and Paul, whom Margaret would have utilized as a shortcut. She took her time. Or perhaps let time take her, and when the crisis did come, all was ready. The crisis opened with a message. Would Miss Schlegel come shopping? Christmas was nearing, and Mrs. Wilcox felt behind hand with the presents. She had taken some more days in bed, and must make up for lost time. Margaret accepted, and at eleven o'clock one cheerless morning, they started out in a brougham. First of all, began Margaret. We must make a list and tick off the people's names. My aunt always does, and this fog may thicken up at any moment. Have you any ideas? I thought we would go to Harrods or the Haymarket stores, said Mrs. Wilcox rather hopelessly. Everything is sure to be there. I am not a good shopper. The din is so confusing, and your aunt is quite right. One ought to make a list. Take my notebook then, and write your own name at the top of the page. 
"'Oh, hooray!' said Margaret, writing it. "'How very kind of you to start with me!' But she did not want to receive anything expensive. Their acquaintance was singular rather than intimate, and she divined that the Wilcox clan would resent any expenditure on outsiders. The more compact families do. She did not want to be thought a second Helen, who would snatch presents since she could not snatch young men, nor to be exposed like a second Aunt Julie to the insults of Charles. A certain austerity of demeanour was best, and she added, "'I don't really want a yuletide gift, though. In fact, I'd rather not.' "'Why?' "'Because I've odd ideas about Christmas. Because I have all that money can buy. I want more people, but no more things. I should like to give you something worth your acquaintance, Miss Schlegel, in memory of your kindness to me during my lonely fortnight. It has so happened that I have been left alone, and you have stopped me from brooding. I am too apt to brood." "'If that is so,' said Margaret, "'if I have happened to be of use to you, which I didn't know, you cannot pay me back with anything tangible." "'I suppose not, but one would like to. Perhaps I shall think of something as we go about." Her name remained at the head of the list, but nothing was written opposite it. They drove from shop to shop. The air was white, and when they alighted it tasted like cold pennies. At times they passed through a clot of grey. Mrs. Wilcox's vitality was low that morning, and it was Margaret who decided on a horse for this little girl, a gollywog for that, for the rector's wife a copper warming tray. "'We always give the servants money.' "'Yes, do you, yes, much easier,' replied Margaret but felt the grotesque impact of the unseen upon the seen, and saw issuing from a forgotten manger at Bethlehem this torrent of coins and toys. Vulgarity reigned. Public houses, besides their usual exhortation against temperance reform, invited men to join our Christmas goose club, one bottle of gin, etc., or two according to subscription. A poster of a woman in tights heralded the Christmas pantomime, and little red devils, who had come in again that year, were prevalent upon the Christmas cards. Margaret was no morbid idealist. She did not wish this spate of business and self-advertisement checked. It was only the occasion of it that struck her with amazement annually. How many of these vacillating shoppers and tired shop assistants realized that it was a divine event that drew them together? She realized it, though standing outside in the matter. She was not a Christian in the accepted sense. She did not believe that God had ever worked among us as a young artisan. These people, or most of them, believed it, and if pressed would affirm it in words. But the visible signs of their belief were Regent Street, or Drury Lane, a little mud displaced, a little money spent, a little food cooked, eaten, and forgotten. Inadequate. But in public, who shall express the unseen adequately? It is private life that holds out the mirror to infinity, personal intercourse, and that alone, that ever hints at a personality beyond our daily vision. No, I do like Christmas on the whole, she announced. In its clumsy way, it does approach peace and goodwill. But, oh, it is clumsier every year. Is it? I am only used to country Christmases. We are usually in London, and play the game with vigour, carols at the Abbey, clumsy midday meal, clumsy dinner for the maids, followed by Christmas tree and dancing of poor children, with songs from Helen. The drawing-room does very well for that. We put the tree in the powder-closet, and draw a curtain when the candles are lighted, and with a looking-glass behind it looks quite pretty. I wish we might have a powder-closet in our next house. Of course the tree has to be very small, and the presents don't hang on it. No, the presents reside in a sort of rocky landscape made of crumpled brown paper. You spoke of your next house, Miss Schlegel. Then are you leaving Wickham Place? Yes, in two or three years, when the lease expires. We must. Have you been there long? All our lives. 
you will be very sorry to leave it. I suppose so. We scarcely realize it yet. My father— She broke off, for they had reached the stationary department of the Haymarket stores, and Mrs. Wilcox wanted to order some private greeting cards. If possible, something distinctive, she sighed. At the counter she found a friend, bent on the same errand, and conversed with her insipidly, wasting much time. "'My husband and our daughter are motoring. Bertha, too! Oh, fancy, what a coincidence!' Margaret, though not practical, could shine in such company as this. While they talked, she went through a volume of specimen cards, and submitted one for Mrs. Wilcox's inspection. Mrs. Wilcox was delighted. So original, words so sweet, she would order a hundred like that, and could never be sufficiently grateful. Then, just as the assistant was booking the order, she said, "'Do you know, I'll wait. On second thoughts, I'll wait. There's plenty of time still, isn't there? And I shall be able to get Evie's opinion.' They returned to the carriage by devious paths. When they were in, she said, "'But couldn't you get it renewed?' "'I beg your pardon?' asked Margaret. "'The lease, I mean.' "'Oh, the lease! Have you been thinking of that all the time? How very kind of you! Surely something could be done.' "'No, values have risen too enormously. They mean to pull down Wickham Place and build flats like yours.' "'But how horrible!' "'Landlords are horrible.' Then she said vehemently, it is monstrous, Miss Schlegel. It isn't right. I had no idea that this was hanging over you. I do pity you from the bottom of my heart. To be parted from your house, your father's house, it oughtn't to be allowed. It is worse than dying. I would rather die than—oh, poor girls! Can what they call civilization be right if people mayn't die in the room where they were born? My dear, I am so sorry." Margaret did not know what to say. Mrs. Wilcox had been overtired by shopping, and was inclined to hysteria. Howard's End was nearly pulled down once. It would have killed me. Howard's End must be a very different house to ours. We are fond of ours, but there is nothing distinctive about it. As you saw, it is an ordinary London house. We shall easily find another. So you think. "'Again my lack of experience, I suppose,' said Margaret, easing away from the subject. "'I can't say anything when you take up that line, Mrs. Wilcox. I wish I could see myself as you see me, foreshortened into a backfish. Quite the ingenue. Very charming, wonderfully well read for my age, but incapable.' Mrs. Wilcox would not be deterred. "'Come down with me to Howard's End now.' she said, more vehemently than ever. I want you to see it. You have never seen it. I want to hear what you say about it, for you do put things so wonderfully." Margaret glanced at the pitiless air, and then at the tired face of her companion. "'Later on I should love it,' she continued. "'But it's hardly the weather for such an expedition, and we ought to start when we're fresh. Isn't the house shut up, too?' She received no answer. Mrs. Wilcox appeared to be annoyed. "'Might I come some other day?' Mrs. Wilcox bent forward and tapped the glass. "'Back to Wickham Place, please,' was her order to the coachman. Margaret had been snubbed. "'A thousand thanks, Miss Schlegel, for all your help.' "'Not at all.' "'It is such a comfort to get the presents off my mind, the Christmas cards especially, I do admire your choice." It was her turn to receive no answer. In her turn, Margaret became annoyed. "'My husband and Evie will be back the day after to-morrow. That is why I dragged you out shopping to-day. I stayed in town chiefly to shop, but got through nothing, and now he writes that they must cut their tour short. The weather is so bad, and the police traps have been so bad, nearly as bad as in Surrey. Ours are such a careful chauffeur, and my husband feels it particularly hard that they should be treated like road-hogs." "'Why?' "'Well, naturally, he—' 
He isn't a road-hog. He was exceeding the speed limit, I conclude. He must expect to suffer with the lower animals. Mrs. Wilcox was silenced. In growing discomfort they drove homewards. The city seemed satanic, the narrower streets oppressing like the galleries of a mine. No harm was done by the fog to trade, for it lay high, and the lighted windows of the shops were thronged with customers. It was rather a darkening of the spirit which fell back upon itself to find a more grievous darkness within. Margaret nearly spoke a dozen times, but something throttled her. She felt petty and awkward, and her meditations on Christmas grew more cynical. Peace? It may bring other gifts, but is there a single Londoner to whom Christmas is peaceful? The craving for excitement and for elaboration has ruined that blessing. Good will? Had she seen any example of it in the hordes of purchasers? Or in herself? She had failed to respond to this invitation merely because it was a little queer, and imaginative, she whose birthright it was to nourish imagination. Better to have accepted, to have tired themselves a little by the journey, than coldly to reply, Might I come some other day? Her cynicism left her. There would be no other day. This shadowy woman would never ask her again. They parted at the mansions. Mrs. Wilcox went in after due civilities, and Margaret watched the tall, lonely figure sweep up the hall to the lift. As the glass doors closed on it, she had the sense of an imprisonment. The beautiful head disappeared first, still buried in the muff. The long, trailing skirt followed. A woman of undefinable rarity was going up heavenward, like a specimen in a bottle. And into what a heaven! A vault as of hell, sooty black, from which soots descended. At lunch her brother, seeing her inclined for silence, insisted on talking. Tibby was not ill-natured, but from babyhood something drove him to do the unwelcome and the unexpected. Now he gave her a long account of the day-school that he sometimes patronized. The account was interesting, and she had often pressed him for it before, but she could not attend now, for her mind was focused on the invisible. She discerned that Mrs. Wilcox, though a loving wife and mother, had only one passion in life—her house, and that the moment was solemn when she invited a friend to share this passion with her. To answer, another day, was to answer as a fool. Another day will do for brick and mortar, but not for the holy of holies into which Howard's end had been transfigured. Her own curiosity was slight. She had heard more than enough about it in the summer. The nine windows, the vine, and the witch-elm had no pleasant connections for her, and she would have preferred to spend the afternoon at a concert. But imagination triumphed. While her brother held forth, she determined to go, at whatever cost, and to compel Mrs. Wilcox to go, too. When lunch was over, she stepped over to the flats. Mrs. Wilcox had just gone away for the night. Margaret said that it was of no consequence, hurried downstairs, and took a hansom to King's Cross. She was convinced that the escapade was important, though it would have puzzled her to say why. There was a question of imprisonment and escape, and though she did not know the time of the train, she strained her eyes for the St. Pancras's clock. Then the clock of King's Cross swung into sight, a second moon in that infernal sky, and her cab drew up at the station. There was a train for Hilton in five minutes. She took a ticket, asking in her agitation for a single. As she did so, a grave and happy voice saluted her and thanked her. "'I will come, if I still may,' said Margaret, laughing nervously. "'You are coming to sleep, dear, too. It is in the morning that my house is most beautiful.' You are coming to stop. I cannot show you my meadow properly except at sunrise. These fogs," she pointed at the station roof, "'never spread far. I dare say they are sitting in the sun in Hertfordshire, and you will never repent joining them." "'I shall never repent joining you.' "'It is the same.' They began the walk up the long platform. Far at its end stood the train, breasting the darkness without. They never reached it. 
before imagination could triumph. There were cries of, "'Mother! Mother!' and a heavy-browed girl darted out of the cloak-room and seized Mrs. Wilcox by the arm. "'Evie!' she gasped. "'Evie, my pet!' The girl called, "'Father! I say, look who's here!' "'Evie, dearest girl, why aren't you in Yorkshire?' "'No, motor smash, change plans. Father's coming!' "'Why, Ruth!' cried Mr. Wilcox, joining them. "'What in the name of all that's wonderful are you doing here, Ruth?' Mrs. Wilcox had recovered herself. "'Oh, Henry, dear, here's a lovely surprise. Uh, but let me introduce—but I think you know Miss Schlegel.' "'Oh, yes,' he replied, not greatly interested. "'But how's yourself, Ruth?' "'Fit as a fiddle.' she answered gaily. "'So were we, and so was our car, which ran A1 as far as Ripon. But there a wretched horse and cart which a fool of a driver. Miss Schlegel, our little outing must be for another day. I was saying that this fool of a driver, as the policeman himself admits. Another day, Mrs. Wilcox, of course. But as we've insured against third-party risks, it won't so much matter. Cart and car being practically at right angles.' The voices of the happy family rose high. Margaret was left alone. No one wanted her. Mrs. Wilcox walked out of King's Cross between her husband and her daughter, listening to both of them. End of chapter 10 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 11 the funeral was over. The carriages rolled away through the soft mud, and only the poor remained. They approached to the newly dug shaft, and looked their last at the coffin, now almost hidden beneath the spadefuls of clay. It was their moment. Most of them were women from the dead woman's district, to whom black garments had been served out by Mr. Wilcox's orders. Pure curiosity had brought others. They thrilled with the excitement of a death and of a rapid death, and stood in groups or moved between the graves like drops of ink. The son of one of them, a woodcutter, was perched high above their heads, pollarding one of the churchyard elms. From where he sat he could see the village of Hilton, strung upon the north road, with its accreting suburbs, the sunset beyond, scarlet and orange, winking at him beneath brows of grey, the church, the plantations, and behind him an unspoilt country of fields and farms. But he, too, was rolling the event luxuriously in his mouth. He tried to tell his mother down below all that he had felt when he saw the coffin approaching, how he could not leave his work, and yet did not like to go on with it, how he had almost slipped out of the tree he was so upset. The rooks had cawed, and no wonder, it was as if rooks knew too. His mother claimed the prophetic power herself. She had seen a strange look about Mrs. Wilcox for some time. London had done the mischief, said others. She had been a kind lady. Her grandmother had been kind, too. A plainer person, but very kind. Ah, the old sort was dying out. Mr. Wilcox, he was a kind gentleman. They advanced to the topic again and again, dully, but with exultation. The funeral of a rich person was to them what the funeral of Alcestis or Ophelia is to the educated. It was art. Though remote from life, it enhanced life's values, and they witnessed it avidly. The gravediggers, who had kept up an undercurrent of disapproval—they disliked Charles. It was not a moment to speak of such things, but they did not like Charles Wilcox. The gravediggers finished their work and piled up the wreaths and crosses above it. The sun set over Hilton. The grey brows of the evening flushed a little, and were cleft with one scarlet frown. Chattering sadly to each other, the mourners passed through the lich-gate and traversed the chestnut avenues that led down to the village. The young woodcutter stayed a little longer, poised above the silence and swaying rhythmically. At last the bough fell beneath his saw. With a grunt he descended, his thoughts dwelling no longer on death, but on love, for he was mating. He stopped as he passed the new grave. A sheaf of tawny chrysanthemums had caught his eye. They didn't ought to have coloured flowers at burying's, he reflected. 
Trudging on a few steps, he stopped again, looked furtively at the dusk, turned back, wrenched a chrysanthemum from the sheaf, and hid it in his pocket. After him came silence absolute. The cottage that abutted on the churchyard was empty, and no other house stood near. Hour after hour the scene of the interment remained without an eye to witness it. Clouds drifted over it from the west, or the church may have been a ship, high proud, steering with all its company towards infinity. Towards morning the air grew colder, the sky clearer, the surface of the earth hard and sparkling above the prostrate dead. The woodcutter, returning after a night of joy, reflected, "'They lilies, they croissants. It's a pity I didn't take them all.' Up at Howard's end, they were attempting breakfast. Charles and Evie sat in the dining-room with Mrs. Charles. Their father, who could not bear to see a face, breakfasted upstairs. He suffered acutely. Pain came over him in spasms, as if it was physical, and even while he was about to eat, his eyes would fill with tears, and he would lay down the morsel untasted. He remembered his wife's even goodness during thirty years. Not anything in detail— not courtship or early raptures, but just the unvarying virtue that seemed to him a woman's noblest quality. So many women are capricious, breaking into odd flaws of passion or frivolity. Not so his wife. Year after year, summer and winter, as bride and mother, she had been the same. He had always trusted her. Her tenderness, her innocence, the wonderful innocence that was hers by the gift of God. Ruth knew no more of worldly wickedness and wisdom than did the flowers in her garden, or the grass in her field. Her idea of business— Henry, why do people who have enough money try to get more money? Her idea of politics— I am sure that if the mothers of various nations could meet, there would be no more wars. Her idea of religion— Ah, this had been a cloud, but a cloud that passed. She came of Quaker stock— and he and his family, formerly dissenters, were now members of the Church of England. The rector's sermons had at first repelled her, and she had expressed a desire for a more inward light, adding, "'Not so much for myself as for baby.' Charles. Inward light must have been granted, for he heard no complaints in later years. They brought up their three children without dispute. They had never disputed." She lay under the earth now. She had gone, and as if to make her going the more bitter, had gone with a touch of mystery that was all unlike her. "'Why didn't you tell me you knew of it?' he had moaned, and her faint voice had answered, "'I didn't want to, Henry. I might have been wrong, and every one hates illnesses.' He had been told of the horror by a strange doctor, whom she had consulted during his absence from town. Was this altogether just? Without fully explaining, she had died. It was a fault on her part, and, tears rushed into his eyes, what a little fault! It was the only time she had deceived him in those thirty years. He rose to his feet and looked out of the window, for Evie had come in with the letters, and he could meet no one's eye. Ah, yes, she had been a good woman. She had been steady. He chose the word deliberately. To him steadiness included all praise. He himself, gazing at the wintry garden, is in appearance a steady man. His face was not as square as his son's, and indeed the chin, though firm enough in outline, retreated a little, and the lips, ambiguous, were curtained by a moustache. But there was no external hint of weakness. The eyes, if capable of kindness and good fellowship, if ruddy for the moment with tears, were the eyes of one who could not be driven. The forehead, too, was like Charles's, high and straight, brown and polished, merging abruptly into temples and skull. It has the effect of a bastion that protected his head from the world. At times it had the effect of a blank wall. He had dwelt behind it, intact and happy, for fifty years. "'The post's come, father,' said Evie awkwardly. "'Thanks.' Put it down. Has the breakfast been all right? Yes, thanks. The girl glanced at him, and at it with constraint. She did not know what to do. 
Charles says, do you want the Times? No, I'll read it later. Ring if you want anything, father, won't you? I've all I want. Having sorted the letters from the circulars, she went back to the dining room. Father's eaten nothing, she announced, sitting down with wrinkled brows behind the tea urn. Charles did not answer, but after a moment he ran quickly upstairs, opened the door, and said, Look here, father, you must eat, you know. And having paused for a reply that did not come, stole down again. He's going to read his letters first, I think, he said evasively. I dare say he will go on with his breakfast afterwards. Then he took up the times, and for some time there was no sound except the clink of cup against saucer and of knife on plate. Poor Mrs. Charles sat between her silent companions, terrified at the course of events, and a little bored. She was a rubbishy little creature, and she knew it. A telegram had dragged her from Naples to the deathbed of a woman whom she had scarcely known. A word from her husband had plunged her into mourning. She desired to mourn inwardly as well, but she wished that Mrs. Wilcox, since fated to die, could have died before the marriage, for then less would have been expected of her. Crumbling her toast, and too nervous to ask for the butter, she remained almost motionless, thankful only for this, that her father-in-law was having his breakfast upstairs. At last Charles spoke. "'They had no business to be polding those elms yesterday,' he said to his sister. "'No, indeed. I must make a note of that,' he continued. "'I am surprised that the rector allowed it. Perhaps it may not be the rector's affair. Whose else could it be?' "'The lord of the manor.' "'Impossible.' "'Butter, Dolly?' "'Thank you, Evie, dear. Charles?' "'Yes, dear?' "'I didn't know one could pollard elms. I thought one only pollarded willows.' "'Oh, no, one can pollard elms.' "'Then why oughtn't the elms in the churchyard to be pollarded?' Charles frowned a little, and turned again to his sister. "'Another point. I must speak to Chalkley.' "'Yes, rather, you must complain to Chalkley.' It's no good him saying he is not responsible for those men. He is responsible. Yes, rather. Brother and sister were not callous. They spoke thus partly because they desired to keep Chalkley up to the mark, a healthy desire in its way, partly because they avoided the personal note in life. All Wilcoxes did. It did not seem to them of supreme importance. Or it may be as Helen supposed, they realized its importance, but were afraid of it. Panic and emptiness, could one glance behind. They were not callous, and they left the breakfast-table with aching hearts. Their mother never had come in to breakfast. It was in the other rooms, and especially in the garden, that they felt her loss most. As Charles went out to the garage, he was reminded at every step of the woman who had loved him and whom he could never replace. What battles he had fought against her gentle conservatism! How she had disliked improvements! yet how loyally she had accepted them when made. He and his father, what trouble they had had to get this very garage! With what difficulty had they persuaded her to yield them to the paddock for it, the paddock that she loved more dearly than the garden itself? The vine, she had got her way about the vine. It still encumbered the south wall with its unproductive branches. And so with Evie, as she stood talking to the cook. Though she could take up her mother's work inside the house, just as the man could take it up without, she felt that something unique had fallen out of her life. Their grief, though less poignant than their father's, grew from deeper roots, for a wife may be replaced, a mother never. Charles would go back to the office. There was little to do at Howard's end. The contents of his mother's will had long been known to them. There were no legacies, no annuities, none of the posthumous bustle with which some of the dead prolong their activities. Trusting her husband, she had left him everything without reserve. She was quite a poor woman. The house had been all her dowry, and the house would come to Charles in time. Her water-colors Mr. Wilcox intended to reserve for Paul, while Evie would take the jewelry and lace. How easily she slipped out of life! Charles thought the habit laudable, though he did not intend to adopt it himself, whereas Margaret would have seen in it an almost culpable indifference to earthly fame. Cynicism, 
not the superficial cynicism that snarls and sneers, but the cynicism that can go with courtesy and tenderness. That was the note of Mrs. Wilcox's will. She wanted not to vex people. That accomplished, the earth might freeze over her forever. No, there was nothing for Charles to wait for. He could not go on with his honeymoon, so he would go up to London and work. He felt too miserable hanging about. He and Dolly would have the furnished flat while his father rested quietly in the country with Evie. He could also keep an eye on his own little house, which was being painted and decorated for him in one of the Surrey suburbs, and in which he hoped to install himself soon after Christmas. Yes, he would go up after lunch in his new motor, and the town servants, who had come down for the funeral, would go up by train. He found his father's chauffeur in the garage, and said, "'Morning,' without looking at the man's face, and bending over the car, continued, "'Hullo! My new car's been driven!' "'Has it, sir?' "'Yes,' said Charles, getting rather red, "'and whoever's driven it hasn't cleaned it properly, for there's mud on the axle. Take it off!' The man went for the cloths without a word. He was a chauffeur as ugly as sin, not that this did him disservice with Charles, who thought charm in a man rather rot, and had soon got rid of the little Italian beast with whom they had started. "'Charles!' His bride was tripping after him over the hoar-frost, a dainty black column, her little face and elaborate morning hat forming the capital thereof. "'One minute, I'm busy. Well, Crane, who's been driving it, do you suppose?' "'Don't know, I'm sure, sir. No one's driven it since I've been back, but of course there's the fortnight I've been away with the other car in Yorkshire.' The mud came off rather easily. "'Charles, your father's down. Something's happened. He wants you in the house at once. Oh, Charles!' "'Wait, dear, wait a minute. Who had the key to the garage while you were away, Crane?' "'The gardener, sir.' "'Do you mean to tell me that old Penny can drive a motor?' "'No, sir. No one's had the motor out, sir.' "'Then how do you account for the mud on the axle?' "'I can't, of course, say for the time I've been in Yorkshire. No more mud now, sir.' Charles was vexed. The man was treating him as a fool, and if his heart had not been so heavy he would have reported him to his father. But it was not a morning for complaints. Ordering the motor to be round after lunch, he joined his wife, who had all the while been pouring out some incoherent story about a letter and a Miss Schlegel. "'Now, Dolly, I can attend to you. Miss Schlegel, what does she want?' When people wrote a letter, Charles always asked what they wanted. Want was to him the only cause of action, and the question in this case was correct, for his wife replied, "'She wants Howard's end.' "'Howard's end? Now, Crane, just don't forget to put on the Stepney wheel.' "'No, sir.' "'Now, mind you don't forget, for I—' "'Come, little woman.' When they were out of the chauffeur's sight, he put his arm round her waist and pressed her against him. All his affection and half his attention, it was what he granted her throughout their happy married life. "'But you haven't listened, Charles. What's wrong?' "'I keep on telling you Howard's end. Miss Schlegel's got it.' "'Got what?' asked Charles, unclasping her. "'What the dickens are you talking about?' "'Now, Charles, you promised not to say those naughty—' "'Look here, I'm in no mood for foolery. It's no morning for it, either.' "'I tell you, I keep on telling you. Miss Schlegel, she's got it. Your mother's left it to her, and you've all got to move out. Howard's end? Howard's end! She screamed, mimicking him, and as she did so, Evie came dashing out of the shrubbery. Dolly, go back at once. My father's much annoyed with you. Charles! She hit herself wildly. Come in at once to father. He's had a letter that's too awful. Charles began to run, but checked himself, and stepped heavily across the gravel path. There the house was, the nine windows, the unprolific vine. He exclaimed, "'Schlegel's again!' And as if to complete chaos, Dolly said, "'Oh, no, the matron of the nursing home has written instead of her!' "'Come in, all three of you!' cried his father, no longer inert. "'Dolly, why have you disobeyed me?' "'Oh, Mr. Wilcox!' "'I told you not to go out to the garage. I have heard you all shouting in the garden. I won't have it. Come in.' He stood in the porch, transformed, letters in his hand. "'Into the dining-room, every one of you. We can't discuss private matters in the middle of all the servants. Here, Charles, here, read these. See what you make.' 
Charles took two letters and read them as he followed the procession. The first was a covering note from the matron. Mrs. Wilcox had desired her, when the funeral should be over, to forward the enclosed. The enclosed, it was from his mother herself. She had written, To my husband, I should like Miss Schlegel, Margaret, to have Howard's end. I suppose we're going to have a talk about this, he remarked, ominously calm. Certainly. I was coming out to you when Dolly— Well, let's sit down. Come, Evie, don't waste time. Sit down. In silence they drew up to the breakfast-table. The events of yesterday, indeed of this morning, suddenly receded into a past so remote that they seemed scarcely to have lived in it. Heavy breathings were heard. They were calming themselves. Charles, to steady them further, read the enclosure out loud. A note, in my mother's handwriting, in an envelope addressed to my father, sealed. Inside. I should like Miss Schlegel, Margaret, to have Howard's end. No date, no signature. Forwarded through the matron of that nursing home. Now the question is— Dolly interrupted him. But I say that note isn't legal. Houses ought to be done by a lawyer, Charles, surely. Her husband worked his jaw severely. Little lumps appeared in front of either ear, a symptom that she had not yet learnt to respect, and she asked whether she might see the note. Charles looked at his father for permission, who said abstractedly, "'Give it her.' She seized it, and at once exclaimed, "'Why, it's only in pencil! I said so. Pencil never counts!' "'We know that it is not legally binding, Dolly,' said Mr. Wilcox, speaking from out of his fortress. "'We are aware of that. Legally, I should be justified in tearing it up and throwing it into the fire. Of course, my dear, we consider you as one of the family. But it will be better if you do not interfere with what you do not understand." Charles, vexed both with his father and his wife, then repeated, "'The question is—' He had cleared a space of the breakfast-table from plates and knives, so that he could draw patterns on the tablecloth. The question is whether Miss Schlegel, during the fortnight we were all away, whether she unduly—' He stopped. "'I don't think that,' said his father, whose nature was nobler than his son's. "'Don't think what?' "'That she would have—that it is a case of undue influence. No, to my mind the question is the—the the invalid's condition at the time she wrote.' My dear father, consult an expert if you like, but I don't admit that it is my mother's writing." "'Why, you just said it was!' cried Dolly. "'Never mind if I did!' he blazed out. "'And hold your tongue!' The poor little wife coloured at this, and drawing her handkerchief from her pocket, shed a few tears. No one noticed her. Evie was scowling like an angry boy. The two men were gradually assuming the manner of the committee-room. They were both at their best when serving on committees. They did not make the mistake of handling human affairs in the bulk, but disposed of them item by item, sharply. Calligraphy was the item before them now, and on it they turned their well-trained brains. Charles, after a little demur, accepted the writing as genuine, and they passed on to the next point. It is the best, perhaps the only, way of dodging emotion. They were the average human article and had they considered the note as a whole, it would have driven them miserable or mad. Considered item by item, the emotional content was minimized, and all went forward smoothly. The clock ticked, the coals blazed higher, and contended with the white radiance that poured in through the windows. Unnoticed, the sun occupied his sky, and the shadows of the tree-stems, extraordinarily solid, fell like trenches of purple across the frosted lawn. It was a glorious winter morning. Evie's fox-terrier, who had passed for white, was only a dirty grey dog now, so intense was the purity that surrounded him. He was discredited, but the blackbirds that he was chasing glowed with Arabian darkness, for all the conventional colouring of life had been altered. Inside, the clock struck ten with a rich and confident note. Other clocks confirmed it, and the discussion moved toward its close. To follow it is unnecessary. It is rather a moment when the commentator should step forward. Ought the Wilcoxes to have offered their home to Margaret? I think not. The appeal was too flimsy. 
It was not legal. It had been written in illness, and under the spell of a sudden friendship. It was contrary to the dead woman's intentions in the past, contrary to her very nature, so far as that nature was understood by them. To them Howard's end was a house. They could not know that to her it had been a spirit, for which she sought a spiritual heir. And, pushing one step farther in these mists, may they not have decided even better than they supposed? Is it credible that the possessions of the spirit can be bequeathed at all? Has the soul offspring? A witch-elm tree, a vine, a wisp of hay with dew on it. Can passion for such things be transmitted where there is no bond of blood? No. The Wilcoxes are not to be blamed. The problem is too terrific, and they could not even perceive a problem. No, it is natural and fitting that after due debate they should tear the note up and throw it on to their dining-room fire. The practical moralist may acquit them absolutely. He who strives to look deeper may acquit them, almost. For one hard fact remains. They did neglect a personal appeal. The woman who had died did say to them, Do this. And they answered, We will not. The incident made a most painful impression on them. Grief mounted into the brain and worked there disquietingly. Yesterday they had lamented. She was a dear mother, a true wife. In our absence she neglected her health and died. Today, they thought, she was not as true, as dear, as we supposed. The desire for a more inward light had found expression at last. The unseen had impacted on the seen, and all that they could say was treachery. Mrs. Wilcox had been treacherous to the family— to the laws of property, to her own written word. How did she expect Howard's end to be conveyed to Miss Schlegel? Was her husband, to whom it legally belonged, to make it over to her as a free gift? Was the said Miss Schlegel to have a life interest in it, or to own it absolutely? Was there to be no compensation for the garage and other improvements that they had made, under the assumption that all would be theirs some day? Treacherous! Treacherous and absurd! When we think the dead both treacherous and absurd, we have gone far towards reconciling ourselves to their departure. That note, scribbled in pencil, sent through the matron, was unbusinesslike as well as cruel, and decreased at once the value of the woman who had written it. "'Ah, well,' said Mr. Wilcox, rising from the table, "'I shouldn't have thought it possible.' "'Mother couldn't have meant it,' said Evie, still frowning. "'No, my girl, of course not. "'Mother believed so in ancestors, too. "'It isn't like her to leave anything to an outsider who'd never appreciate. "'The whole thing is unlike her,' he announced. "'If Miss Schlegel had been poor, if she had wanted a house, "'I could understand it a little. "'But she has a house of her own. "'Why should she want another? "'She wouldn't have any use of Howard's End.' "'That time may prove,' murmured Charles. "'How?' asked his sister. "'Presumably she knows. Mother will have told her. She got twice or three times into the nursing home. Presumably she is awaiting developments.' "'What a horrid woman!' And Dolly, who had recovered, cried, "'Why, she may be coming down to turn us out now!' Charles put her right. "'I wish she would,' he said ominously. I could then deal with her." "'So could I,' echoed his father, who was feeling rather in the cold. Charles had been kind in undertaking the funeral arrangements, and in telling him to eat his breakfast. But the boy, as he grew up, was a little dictatorial, and assumed the post of chairman too readily. "'I could deal with her, if she comes. But she won't come. You're all a bit hard on Miss Schlegel.' "'That pool business was pretty scandalous, though.' I want no more of the pool business, Charles, as I said at the time. And besides, it is quite apart from this business. Margaret Schlegel has been officious and tiresome during this terrible week, and we have all suffered under her. But upon my soul she's honest. She's not in collusion with the matron. I'm absolutely certain of it. Nor was she with the doctor, I'm equally certain of that. She did not hide anything from us, for up to that very afternoon she was as ignorant as we are. She, like ourselves, was a dupe. He stopped for a moment. You see, Charles, in her terrible pain your poor mother put us all in false positions. 
Paul would not have left England. You would not have gone to Italy. Nor Evie and I into Yorkshire, if only we had known. Well, Miss Schlegel's position has been equally false. Take all in all, she has not come out of it badly. Evie said, But those chrysanthemums! Or coming down to the funeral at all! echoed Dolly. Why shouldn't she come down? She had the right to, and she stood far back among the Hilton women. The flowers! Certainly we should not have sent such flowers. But they may have seemed the right thing to her, Evie, and for all you know they may be the custom in Germany. Oh, I forget, she isn't really English, cried Evie. That would explain a lot. She's a cosmopolitan, said Charles, looking at his watch. I admit, I'm rather down on cosmopolitans. My fault, doubtless. I cannot stand them, and a German cosmopolitan is the limit. I think that's about all, isn't it? I want to run down and see Chalkley. A bicycle will do. And by the way, I wish you'd speak to Crane some time. I'm certain he's had my new car out. Has he done it any harm? No. In that case, I shall let it pass. It's not worth while having a row. Charles and his father sometimes disagreed. But they always parted with an increased regard for one another and each desired no doughtier comrade when it was necessary to voyage for a little past the emotions. So the sailors of Ulysses voyaged past the sirens, having first stopped one another's ears with wool. End of chapter 11 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 12 Charles need not have been anxious. Miss Schlegel had never heard of his mother's strange request. She was to hear of it in after years, when she had built up her life differently, and it was to fit into position as the headstone of the corner. Her mind was bent on other questions now, and by her also it would have been rejected as the fantasy of an invalid. She was parting from these Wilcoxes for the second time. Paul and his mother— Ripple and great wave, had flowed into her life and ebbed out of it forever. The ripple had left no traces behind. The wave had strewn at her feet fragments torn from the unknown. A curious seeker, she stood for a while at the verge of the sea that tells so little, but tells a little, and watched the outgoing of this last tremendous tide. Her friend had vanished in agony but not, she believed, in degradation. Her withdrawal had hinted at other things besides disease and pain. Some leave our life with tears, others with an insane frigidity. Mrs. Wilcox had taken the middle course, which only rarer natures can pursue. She had kept proportion. She had told a little of her grim secret to her friends, but not too much. She had shut up her heart, almost, but not entirely. It is thus, if there is any rule, that we ought to die, neither as victim nor as fanatic, but as the seafarer who can greet with an equal eye the deep that he is entering, and the shore that he must leave. The last word, whatever it would be, had certainly not been said in Hilton Churchyard. She had not died there. A funeral is not death, any more than baptism is birth or marriage union. All three are the clumsy devices, coming now too late, now too early, by which society would register the quick motions of man. In Margaret's eyes Mrs. Wilcox had escaped registration. She had gone out of life vividly, her own way, and no dust was so truly dust as the contents of that heavy coffin— lowered with ceremonial until it rested on the dust of the earth, no flowers so utterly wasted as the chrysanthemums that the frost must have withered before morning. Margaret had once said she loved superstition. It was not true. Few women had tried more earnestly to pierce the accretions in which body and soul are enwrapped. The death of Mrs. Wilcox had helped her in her work, she saw a little more clearly than hitherto what a human being is, 
and to what he may aspire. Truer relationships gleamed. Perhaps the last word would be hope. Hope even on this side of the grave. Meanwhile she could take an interest in the survivors. In spite of her Christmas duties, in spite of her brother, the Wilcoxes continued to play a considerable part in her thoughts. She had seen so much of them in the final week. They were not her sort. They were often suspicious and stupid, and efficient where she excelled. But collision with them stimulated her, and she felt an interest that verged into liking, even for Charles. She desired to protect them, and often felt that they could protect her, excelling where she was deficient. Once past the rocks of emotion, they knew so well what to do, whom to send for. Their hands were on all the ropes, they had grit as well as grittiness, and she valued grit enormously. They led a life that she could not attain to, the outer life of telegrams and anger, which had detonated when Helen and Paul had touched in June, and had detonated again the other week. To Margaret this life was to remain a real force. She could not despise it as Helen and Tibby affected to do. It fostered such virtues as neatness, decision, and obedience. Virtues of the second rank, no doubt, but they have formed our civilization. They form character, too. Margaret could not doubt it. They keep the soul from becoming sloppy. How dare Schlegels despise Wilcoxes, when it takes all sorts to make a world? Don't brood too much, she wrote to Helen, on the superiority of the unseen to the seen. It's true, but to brood on it is medieval. Our business is not to contrast the two, but to reconcile them. Helen replied that she had no intention of brooding on such a dull subject. What did her sister take her for? The weather was magnificent. She and the Mossebachs had gone tobogganing on the only hill that Pomerania boasted. It was fun, but overcrowded, for the rest of Pomerania had gone there too. Helen loved the country, and her letter glowed with physical exercise and poetry. She spoke of the scenery, quiet yet august, of the snow-clad fields with their scampering herds of deer, of the river and its quaint entrance into the Baltic Sea of the Oderberge, only three hundred feet high, from which one slid all too quickly back into the Pomeranian plains. And yet these Oderberge were real mountains, with pine forests, streams, and views complete. It isn't size that counts so much, as the way things are arranged. In another paragraph she referred to Mrs. Wilcox sympathetically, but the news had not bitten into her. She had not realized the accessories of death, which are, in a sense, more memorable than death itself. The atmosphere of precautions and recriminations, and in the midst a human body growing more vivid because it was in pain, the end of that body in Hilton Churchyard, the survival of something that suggested hope, vivid in its turn against life's workaday cheerfulness, all these were lost to Helen who only felt that a pleasant lady could now be pleasant no longer. She returned to Wickham Place full of her own affairs. She had had another proposal, and Margaret, after a moment's hesitation, was content that this should be so. The proposal had not been a serious matter. It was the work of Fräulein Mosebach, who had conceived the large and patriotic notion of winning back her cousins to the fatherland by matrimony. England had played Paul Wilcox, and lost. Germany played Herr Forstmeister someone. Helen could not remember his name. Herr Forstmeister lived in a wood, and standing on the summit of the Oderberge, he had pointed out his house to Helen, or rather had pointed out the wedge of pines in which it lay. She had exclaimed, "'Oh, how lovely! That's the place for me!' and in the evening Frida appeared in her bedroom. "'I have a message, dear Helen,' etc. And so she had, but had been very nice when Helen laughed, quite understood, a forest too solitary and damp, 
quite agreed, but Herr Forstmeister believed he had assurance to the contrary. Germany had lost, but with good humour. Holding the manhood of the world, she felt bound to win. "'And there will even be some one for Tibby,' concluded Helen. "'There now, Tibby, think of that. Frida is saving up a little girl for you in pigtails and white worsted stockings. But the feet of the stockings are pink, as if the little girl had trodden in strawberries. I've talked too much. My head aches. Now you talk." Tibby consented to talk. He, too, was full of his own affairs, for he had just been up to try for a scholarship at Oxford. The men were down, and the candidates had been housed in various colleges, and had dined in hall. Tibby was sensitive to beauty. The experience was new, and he gave a description of his visit that was almost glowing. The august and mellow university, soaked with the richness of the western counties that it has served for a thousand years, appealed at once to the boy's taste. It was the kind of thing he could understand, and he understood it all the better because it was empty. Oxford is Oxford, not a mere receptacle for youth like Cambridge. Perhaps it wants its inmates to love it, rather than to love one another. Such, at all events, was to be its effect on Tibby. His sisters sent him there that he might make friends, for they knew that his education had been cranky, and had severed him from other boys and men. He made no friends. His Oxford remained Oxford empty, and he took into life with him not the memory of a radiance, but the memory of a colour scheme. It pleased Margaret to hear her brother and sister talking. They did not get on over well as a rule. For a few moments she listened to them, feeling elderly and benign. Then something occurred to her, and she interrupted. "'Helen, I told you about poor Mrs. Wilcox, that sad business.' "'Yes.' "'I have had a correspondence with her son. He was winding up the estate, and wrote to ask me whether his mother had wanted me to have anything. I thought it good of him, considering I knew her so little. I said that she had once spoken of giving me a Christmas present, but we both forgot about it afterwards. I hope Charles took the hint. Yes, that is to say, her husband wrote later on, and thanked me for being a little kind to her and actually gave me her silver vinaigrette. Don't you think that is extraordinarily generous? It has made me like him very much. He hopes that this will not be the end of our acquaintance, but that you and I will go and stop with Evie some time in the future. I like Mr. Wilcox. He is taking up his work—rubber. It is a big business. I gather he is launching out, rather. Charles is in it, too. Charles is married, a pretty little creature, but she doesn't seem wise. They took on the flat, but now they have gone off to a house of their own." Helen, after a decent pause, continued her account of Stetten. How quickly a situation changes! In June she had been in a crisis. Even in November she could blush and be unnatural. Now it was January, and the whole affair lay forgotten. Looking back on the past six months, Margaret realized the chaotic nature of our daily life, and its difference from the orderly sequence that has been fabricated by historians. Actual life is full of false clues and signposts that lead nowhere. With infinite effort we nerve ourselves for a crisis that never comes. The most successful career must show a waste of strength that might have removed mountains, and the most unsuccessful is not that of the man who is taken unprepared but of him who has prepared, and is never taken. On a tragedy of that kind, our national morality is duly silent. It assumes that preparation against danger is in itself a good, and that men, like nations, are the better for staggering through life fully armed. The tragedy of preparedness has scarcely been handled, save by the Greeks. Life is indeed dangerous but not in the way morality would have us believe. It is indeed unmanageable, but the essence of it is not a battle. It is unmanageable because it is a romance, and its essence is romantic beauty. 
Margaret hoped that for the future she would be less cautious, not more cautious, than she had been in the past. End of chapter 12 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 13 Over two years passed, and the Schlegel household continued to lead its life of cultured but not ignoble ease, still swimming gracefully on the grey tides of London. Concerts and plays swept past them, money had been spent and renewed, reputations won and lost, and the city herself, emblematic of their lives, rose and fell in a continual flux, while her shallows washed more widely against the hills of Surrey and over the fields of Hertfordshire. This famous building had arisen. That was doomed. Today Whitehall had been transformed. It would be the turn of Regent Street to-morrow. And month by month the roads smelt more strongly of petrol, and were more difficult to cross, and human beings heard each other speak with greater difficulty, breathed less of the air, and saw less of the sky. Nature withdrew. The leaves were falling by midsummer. The sun shone through dirt with an admired obscurity. To speak against London is no longer fashionable. The earth as an artistic cult has had its day, and the literature of the near future will probably ignore the country and seek inspiration from the town. One can understand the reaction. Of Pan and the elemental forces, the public has heard a little too much. They seem Victorian, while London is Georgian, and those who care for the earth with sincerity may wait long ere the pendulum swings back to her again. Certainly London fascinates. One visualizes it as a tract of quivering grey, intelligent without purpose, and excitable without love, as a spirit that has altered before it can be chronicled, as a heart that certainly beats, but with no pulsation of humanity. It lies beyond everything. Nature, with all her cruelty, comes nearer to us than do these crowds of men. A friend explains himself. The earth is explicable. From her we came, and we must return to her. But who can explain Westminster Bridge Road, or Liverpool Street in the morning, the city inhaling, or the same thoroughfares in the evening, the city exhaling her exhausted air? We reach in desperation beyond the fog, beyond the very stars. The voids of the universe are ransacked to justify the monster, and stamped with a human face. London is religion's opportunity, not the decorous religion of theologians, but anthropomorphic, crude. Yes, the continuous flow would be tolerable if a man of our own sort, not any one pompous or tearful, were caring for us up in the sky. The Londoner seldom understands his city until it sweeps him away, too, from his moorings. And Margaret's eyes were not opened until the lease of Wickham Place expired. She had always known that it must expire, but the knowledge only became vivid about nine months before the event. Then the house was suddenly ringed with pathos. It had seen so much happiness. Why had it to be swept away? In the streets of the city she noted for the first time the architecture of hurry, and heard the language of hurry on the mouths of its inhabitants, clipped words, formless sentences potted expressions of approval or disgust. Month by month things were stepping livelier. But to what goal? The population still rose. But what was the quality of the men born? The particular millionaire who owned the freehold of Wickham Place, and desired to erect Babylonian flats upon it, what right had he to stir so large a portion of the quivering jelly? He was not a fool. She had heard him expose socialism. But true insight began just where his intelligence ended, and one gathered that this was the case with most millionaires. What right had such men— But Margaret checked herself. That way lies madness. Thank goodness she, too, had some money, and could purchase a new home. Tibby, now in his second year at Oxford, was down for the Easter vacation, and Margaret took the opportunity of having a serious talk with him. 
Did he at all know where he wanted to live? Tibby didn't know that he did know. Did he at all know what he wanted to do? He was equally uncertain, but when pressed remarked that he should prefer to be quite free of any profession. Margaret was not shocked, but went on sewing for a few minutes before she replied, "'I was thinking of Mr. Vice. He never strikes me as particularly happy.' "'Yes,' said Tibby, and then held his mouth open in a curious quiver, as if he, too, had thoughts of Mr. Vice, had seen round, through, over, and beyond Mr. Vice, had weighed Mr. Vice, grouped him, and finally dismissed him as having no possible bearing on the subject under discussion. That bleat of Tibby's infuriated Helen. But Helen was now down in the dining-room preparing a speech about political economy. At times her voice could be heard declaiming through the floor. "'But Mr. Vice is rather a wretched, weedy man, don't you think? Then there's Guy. That was a pitiful business. Besides,' shifting to the general, "'every one is the better for some regular work.' Groans. "'I shall stick to it,' she continued, smiling. "'I am not saying it to educate you. It is what I really think.' I believe that in the last century men have developed the desire for work, and they must not starve it. It's a new desire. It goes with a great deal that's bad, but in itself it's good. And I hope that for women, too, not to work will soon become as shocking as not to be married was a hundred years ago. I have no experience of this profound desire to which you allude, enunciated Tibby. Then we'll leave the subject till you do. I'm not going to rattle you round. Take your time. Only do think over the lives of the men you like most, and see how they've arranged them." "'I like Guy and Mr. Vice most,' said Tibby faintly, and leant so far back in his chair that he extended in a horizontal line from knees to throat. "'And don't think I'm not serious, because I don't use the traditional arguments. Making money, a spear awaiting you, and so on, all of which are, for various reasons, can't," she sewed on. "'I'm only your sister. I haven't any authority over you, and I don't want to have any. Just to put before you what I think the truth. You see,' she shook off the pince-nez to which she had recently taken, "'in a few years we shall be the same age, practically, and I shall want you to help me. Men are so much nicer than women. Labouring under such a delusion, why do you not marry? I sometimes jolly well think I would, if I got the chance. Has nobody asked you? Only ninnies. Do people ask Helen? <laughs> Plentifully. Tell me about them. No. Tell me about your ninnies, then. They were men who had nothing better to do," said his sister, feeling that she was entitled to score this point. So take warning. You must work, or else you must pretend to work, which is what I do. Work, 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 if you'd save your soul and your body. It is honestly a necessity, dear boy. Look at the Wilcoxes. Look at Mr. Pembroke. With all their defects of temper and understanding, such men give me more pleasure than many who are better equipped, and I think it is because they have worked regularly and honestly." Oh, "'Spare me the Wilcoxes,' he moaned. "'I shall not. They are the right sort.' "'Oh, goodness me, Meg!' he protested, suddenly sitting up, alert and angry. Tibby, for all his defects, had a genuine personality. Well, they're as near the right sort as you can imagine. No, no, oh no! I was thinking of the younger son, whom I once classed as a ninny, but who came back so ill from Nigeria. He's gone out there again, Evie Wilcox tells me, out to his duty. Duty always elicited a groan. He doesn't want the money. It is work he wants, though it is beastly work. Dull country, dishonest natives, an eternal fidget over fresh water and food. 
A nation who can produce men of that sort may well be proud. No wonder England has become an empire. Empire? I can't bother over results, said Margaret, a little sadly. They are too difficult for me. I can only look at the men. An empire bores me so far, but I can appreciate the heroism that builds it up. London bores me. But what thousands of splendid people are labouring to make London— What it is, he sneered. What it is, worse luck. I want activity without civilization. How paradoxical! Yet I expect that is what we shall find in heaven. And I, said Tibby, want civilization without activity, which I expect is what we shall find in the other place. You needn't go as far as the other place, Tibbykins, if you want that. You can find it at Oxford. Stupid! If I'm stupid, get me back to the house-hunting. I'll even live in Oxford, if you like. North Oxford. I'll live anywhere except Bournemouth, Torquay, and Cheltenham. Oh, yes, or Ilfracham, or Swanage, and Tunbridge Wells, and Surbiton, and Bedford. There on no account. London, then. I agree, but Helen rather wants to get away from London. However, there's no reason we shouldn't have a house in the country, and also a flat in town, provided we all stick together and contribute. Though, of course— Oh, how does one maunder on, and to think, to think of the people who are really poor! How do they live? Not to move about the world would kill me. As she spoke, the door was flung open, and Helen burst in, in a state of extreme excitement. Oh, my dears, what do you think? You'll never guess. A woman's been here asking me for her husband. Her what? Helen was fond of supplying her own surprise. Yes, for her husband, and it really is so. Not anything to do with Bracknell, cried Margaret, who had lately taken on an unemployed of that name to clean the knives and boots. I offered Bracknell, and he was rejected. So was Tibby. Oh, cheer up, Tibby! It's no one we know. I said, Hunt, my good woman, have a good look round. Hunt under the tables, poke up the chimney, shake out the antimacassars. Husband? Husband? Oh, and she's so magnificently dressed and tinkling like a chandelier. Now, Helen, what did happen, really? What I say! I was, as it were, orating my speech. Annie opens the door like a fool, and shows a female straight in on me with my mouth open. Then we began, very civilly. I want my husband, what I have reason to believe is here. No, how unjust one is. She said, whom, not what. She got it perfectly. So I said, name, please. And she said, land, miss. And there we were. Lan? Lan or Len. We were not nice about our vowels. Lan o Len. But what an extraordinary! I said, My good Mrs. Lanolin, we have some grave misunderstanding here. Beautiful as I am, my modesty is even more remarkable than my beauty, and never, never has Mr. Lanolin rested his eyes on mine. I hope you were pleased, said Tibby. Of course, Helen squeaked, a perfectly delightful experience. Oh, Mrs. Lanolin's a dear, she asked for a husband as if he was an umbrella. She mislaid him Saturday afternoon, and for a long time suffered no inconvenience. But all night and all this morning her apprehensions grew. Breakfast didn't seem the same. No, no more did lunch, and so she strolled up to two Wickham Place as being the most likely place for the missing article. But how on earth? Don't begin how on earthing. I know what I know, she kept repeating, not uncivilly, but with extreme gloom. In vain I asked her what did she know. 
some knew what others knew, and others didn't, and if they didn't, then others again had better be careful. Oh, dear, she was incompetent. She had a face like a silkworm, and the dining-room reeks of orris root. We chatted pleasantly a little about husbands, and I wondered where hers was, too, and advised her to go to the police. She thanked me. We agreed that Mr. Lanolin's a naughty, naughty man, and hasn't no business to go on the la-di-da. But I think she suspected me up to the last. Bags I writing to Aunt Julie about this. Now, Meg, remember, bags I. <laughs> Bag it by all means murmured Margaret, putting down her work. "'I'm not sure that this is so funny, Helen. It means some horrible volcano smoking somewhere, doesn't it?' "'I don't think so. She doesn't really mind. The admirable creature isn't capable of tragedy.' "'Her husband may be, though,' said Margaret, moving to the window. "'Oh, no, not likely. No one capable of tragedy could have married Mrs. Lanolin. Was she pretty? Mm, her figure may have been good once. The flats, their only outlook, hung like an ornate curtain between Margaret and the welter of London. Her thoughts turned sadly to house-hunting. Wickham Place had been so safe. She feared fantastically that her own little flock might be moving into turmoil and squalor, into nearer contract with such episodes as these. "'Tibby and I have again been wondering where we'll live next September,' she said at last. "'Tibby had better first wonder what he'll do,' retorted Helen. And that topic was resumed, but with acrimony. Then tea came, and after tea Helen went on preparing her speech, and Margaret prepared one, too, for they were going out to a discussion society on the morrow. But her thoughts were poisoned. Mrs. Lanolin had risen out of the abyss, like a faint smell, a goblin football, telling of a life where love and hatred had both decayed. End of chapter 13 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 14 The mystery, like so many mysteries, was explained. Next day, just as they were dressed to go out to dinner, a Mr. Bast called. He was a clerk in the employment of the Porphyrian Fire Insurance Company, thus much from his card. He had come about the lady yesterday, thus much from Annie, who had shown him into the dining-room. "'Cheers, children!' cried Helen. "'It's Mrs. Lanolin!' Tibby was interested. The three hurried downstairs to find not the gay dog they expected, but a young man, colourless, toneless, who had already the mournful eyes above a drooping moustache that are so common in London, and that haunt some streets of the city like accusing presences. One guessed him as the third generation, grandson to the shepherd or ploughboy whom civilization had sucked into the town as one of the thousands who have lost the life of the body, and failed to reach the life of the spirit. Hints of robustness survived in him, more than a hint of primitive good looks, and Margaret, noting the spine that might have been straight, and the chest that might have broadened, wondered whether it paid to give up the glory of the animal for a tail-coat and a couple of ideas. Culture had worked in her own case— but during the last few weeks she had doubted whether it humanized the majority, so wide and so widening is the gulf that stretches between the natural and the philosophic man, so many the good chaps who are wrecked in trying to cross it. She knew this type very well. The vague aspirations, the mental dishonesty, the familiarity with the outsides of books. She knew the very tones in which he would address her. She was only unprepared for an example of her own visiting card. "'You wouldn't remember giving me this, Miss Schlegel?' said he, uneasily familiar. "'No, I can't say I do.' "'Well, uh, that was how it happened, you see.' "'Where did we meet, Mr. Bast? For the minute I don't remember.' "'It was a concert at the Queen's Hall.' 
I think you will recollect, he added pretentiously, when I tell you that it included a performance of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven. We hear the Fifth practically every time it's done, so I'm not sure. Do you remember, Helen? Was it the time the sandy cat walked round the balustrade? He thought not. Then I don't remember. That's the only Beethoven I ever remember specially. And you, if I may say so, took away my umbrella, inadvertently, of course. <laughs> Likely enough, Helen laughed, for I steal umbrellas even oftener than I hear Beethoven. Did you get it back? Yes, uh, thank you, Miss Schlegel. The mistake arose out of my card, did it? interposed Margaret. Yes, the mistake arose. It was a mistake. The lady who called here yesterday thought that you were calling too, and that she could find you, she continued, pushing him forward, for though he had promised an explanation, he seemed unable to give one. That's so, calling too. A mistake. Then why? began Helen, but Margaret laid a hand on her arm. I said to my wife, he continued more rapidly. I said to Mrs. Bast, I have to pay a call on some friends, and Mrs. Bast said to me, Do go. While I was gone, however, she wanted me on important business, and thought I had come here, owing to the card, and so came after me, and I beg to tender my apologies, and hers as well, for any inconvenience we may have inadvertently caused you. No inconvenience, said Helen, but I still don't understand. An air of evasion characterized Mr. Bast. He explained again, but was obviously lying, and Helen didn't see why he should get off. She had the cruelty of youth. Neglecting her sister's pressure, she said, I still don't understand. When did you say you paid this call? Call? What call? said he, staring as if her question had been a foolish one, a favorite device of those in midstream. This afternoon call? In the afternoon, of course, he replied, and looked at Tibby to see how the repartee went. But Tibby, himself a repartee, was unsympathetic, and said, Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon? S Saturday. Really? said Helen. And you were still calling on Sunday when your wife came here? A long visit. I don't call that fair, said Mr. Bast, going scarlet and handsome. There was fight in his eyes. I know what you mean, and it isn't so. Oh, don't let us mind, said Margaret, distressed again by odours from the abyss. It was something else, he asserted, his elaborate manner breaking down. I was somewhere else to what you think. So there. It was good of you to come and explain, she said. The rest is naturally no concern of ours. Yes, but I want— I wanted— Have you ever read The Ordeal of Richard Feverell? Margaret nodded. It's a beautiful book. I wanted to get back to the earth— don't you see, like Richard does in the end? Or have you ever read Stevenson's Prince Otto? Helen and Tibby groaned gently. That's another beautiful book. You get back to the earth in that. I wanted— He mouthed affectedly. Then through the mists of his culture came a hard fact, hard as a pebble. I walked all the Saturday night, said Leonard. I walked— a thrill of approval ran through the sisters. But culture closed in again. He asked whether they had ever read E. V. Lucas's Open Road. Said Helen, No doubt it's another beautiful book, but I'd rather hear about your road. Oh, I walked. How far? I don't know. Nor for how long. Got too dark to see my watch. Were you walking alone, may I ask? Yes, he said, straightening himself. But we'd been talking it over at the office. There's been a lot of talk at the office lately about these things. The fellows there said one steers by the pole star, and I looked it up in the celestial atlas. But once out of doors, everything gets so mixed. Don't talk to me about the pole star, interrupted Helen, who was becoming interested. 
I know its little ways. It goes round and round, and you go round after it. Well, I lost it entirely. First of all the street lamps, then the trees, and towards morning it got cloudy. Tibby, who preferred his comedy undiluted, slipped from the room. He knew that this fellow would never attain to poetry, and did not want to hear him trying. Margaret and Helen remained. Their brother influenced them more than they knew. In his absence they were stirred to enthusiasm more easily. "'Where did you start from?' cried Margaret. "'Do tell us more.' "'I took the underground to Wimbledon. As I came out of the office I said to myself, "'I must have a walk once in a way. If I don't take this walk now, I shall never take it.' I had a bit of dinner at Wimbledon, and then— But no good country there, is it? It was gas-lamps for hours. Still, I had all the night, and being out was the great thing. I did get into woods, too, presently. Yes, go on, said Helen. You've no idea how difficult uneven ground is when it's dark. Did you actually go off the roads? Oh, yes. I always meant to go off the roads— but the worst of it is that it's more difficult to find one's way. "'Mr. Bast, you're a born adventurer,' laughed Margaret. "'No professional athlete would have attempted what you've done. It's a wonder your walk didn't end in a broken neck. Whatever did your wife say?' "'Professional athletes never move without lanterns and compasses,' said Helen. "'Besides, they can't walk. It tires them. Go on. I felt like R.L.S.' You probably remember how in Virginibus. Yes, but the wood. This here wood. How did you get out of it? I managed one wood, and found a road the other side which went a good bit uphill. I rather fancy it was those north downs, for the road went off into grass, and I got into another wood. That was awful, with gorse bushes. I did wish I'd never come. But suddenly it got light, just while I seemed going under one tree. Then I found a road down to a station, and I took the first train I could back to London. "'But was the dawn wonderful?' asked Helen. With unforgettable sincerity he replied, "'No.' The word flew again like a pebble from the sling. Down toppled all that had seemed ignoble or literary in his talk. Down toppled tiresome R.L.S. and the love of the earth and his silk top-hat. In the presence of these women Leonard had arrived, and he spoke with a flow and exultation that he had seldom known. The dawn was only grey. It was nothing to mention. "'Just a grey evening turned upside down. I know. But I was too tired to lift up my head to look at it, and so cold, too. I'm glad I did it, and yet at the same time it bored me more than I can say. And besides—' You can believe me or not, as you choose. I was very hungry. That dinner at Wimbledon, I meant it to last me all night, like other dinners. I never thought that walking would make such a difference. Why, when you're walking, you want, as it were, a breakfast and luncheon and tea during the night as well, and I nothing but a packet of woodbines. Lord, did I feel bad. Looking back, it wasn't what you may call enjoyment. It was more a case of sticking to it. I did stick. I—I I was determined. Oh, hang it all! What's the good? I mean, the good of living in a room for ever. There one goes on, day after day, same old game, same up and down to town, until you forget there is any other game. You ought to see once in a way what's going on outside, if it's only nothing particular after all. I should just think you ought, said Helen, sitting on the edge of the table. The sound of a lady's voice recalled him from sincerity, and he said, "'Curious it should all come about from reading something of Richard Jeffreys.' "'Excuse me, Mr. Bast, but you're wrong there. It didn't. It came from something far greater.' But she could not stop him. Borrow was imminent after Jeffreys. Borrow, Thoreau, and Sorrow. R.L.S. brought up the rear, and the outburst ended in a swamp of books— no disrespect to these great names. The fault is ours, not theirs. They mean us to use them for signposts, and are not to blame if, in our weakness, we mistake the signpost for the destination. And Leonard had reached the destination. He had visited the county of Surrey when darkness covered its amenities. 
and its cosy villas had re-entered ancient night. Every twelve hours this miracle happens, but he had trouble to go and see for himself. Within his cramped little mind dwelt something that was greater than Jeffrey's books, the spirit that led Jeffreys to write them, and his dawn, though revealing nothing but monotones, was part of the eternal sunrise that shows George Borrow Stonehenge. "'Then you don't think I was foolish?' he asked, becoming again the naive and sweet-tempered boy for whom nature had intended him. "'Heavens, no!' replied Margaret. "'Heaven help us if we do!' replied Helen. "'I'm very glad you say that. Now my wife would never understand, not if I explained for days.' "'No, it wasn't foolish!' cried Helen, her eyes aflame. "'You've pushed back the boundaries. I think it's splendid of you. You've not been content to dream as we have. Though we have walked, too, I must show you a picture upstairs." Here the door-bell rang. The handsome had come to take them to their evening party. "'Oh, bother! Not to say dash! I had forgotten we were dining out. But do, do come round again and have a talk." "'Yes, you must, do,' echoed Margaret. Leonard, with extreme sentiment, replied, "'No, I shall not. It's better like this.' "'Why better?' asked Margaret. "'No, it is better not to risk a second interview. I shall always look back on this talk with you as one of the finest things in my life. Really. I mean this. We can never repeat. It has done me real good.' and there we had better leave it." "'That's rather a sad view of life, surely. Things so often get spoiled." "'I know,' flashed Helen. "'But people don't.' He could not understand this. He continued in a vein which mingled true imagination and faults. What he said wasn't wrong, but it wasn't right, and a false note jarred. One little twist, they felt, and the instrument might be in tune. One little strain, and it might be silent for ever. He thanked the ladies very much, but he would not call again. There was a moment's awkwardness, and then Helen said, "'Go, then. Perhaps you know best. But never forget you're better than Jeffreys.' And then he went. Their hansom caught him up at the corner, passed with a waving of hands and vanished with its accomplished load into the evening. London was beginning to illuminate herself against the night. Electric lights sizzled and jagged in the main thoroughfare. Gas lamps in the side streets glimmered a canary gold or green. The sky was a crimson battlefield of spring, but London was not afraid. Her smoke mitigated the splendor, and the clouds down Oxford Street were a delicately painted ceiling, which adorned while it did not distract. She has never known the clear-cut armies of the purer air. Leonard hurried through her tinted wonders, very much a part of the picture. His was a grey life, and to brighten it he had ruled off a few corners for romance. The Miss Schlegels, or, to speak more accurately, his interview with them, were to fill such a corner, nor was it by any means the first time that he had talked intimately to strangers. The habit was analogous to a debauch an outlet, though the worst of outlets, for instincts that would not be denied. Terrifying him, it would beat down his suspicions and prudence until he was confiding secrets to people whom he had scarcely seen. It brought him many fears, and some pleasant memories. Perhaps the keenest happiness he had ever known was during a railway journey to Cambridge, where a decent-mannered undergraduate had spoken to him. They had gone into conversation— and gradually Leonard flung reticence aside, told some of his domestic troubles, and hinted at the rest. The undergraduate, supposing they could start a friendship, asked him to coffee after hall, which he accepted, but afterwards grew shy, and took care not to stir from the commercial hotel where he lodged. He did not want romance to collide with the Porphyrian, still less with Jackie, and people with fuller, happier lives are slow to understand this. To the Schlegels, as to the undergraduate, he was an interesting creature, of whom they wanted to see more. But they, to him, were denizens of romance, who must keep to the corner he had assigned them, pictures that must not walk out of their frames. 
His behavior over Margaret's visiting card had been typical. His had scarcely been a tragic marriage. Where there is no money and no inclination to violence, tragedy cannot be generated. He could not leave his wife, and he did not want to hit her. Petulance and squalor were enough. Here that card had come in. Leonard, though furtive, was untidy, and left it lying about. Jackie found it, and then began, "'What's that card, eh?' "'Yes, don't you wish you knew what that card was?' "'Len, who's been Schlegel?' etc. Months passed, and the card, now as a joke, now as a grievance, was handed about, getting dirtier and dirtier. It followed them when they moved from Cornelia Road to Tulse Hill. It was submitted to third parties. A few inches of pasteboard, it became the battlefield on which the souls of Leonard and his wife contended. Why did he not say, "'A lady took my umbrella, another gave me this that I might call for my umbrella,' because Jackie would have disbelieved him? Partly, but chiefly because he was sentimental. No affection gathered round the card, but it symbolized the life of culture that Jackie should never spoil. At night he would say to himself, "'Well, at all events, she doesn't know about that card. Yah! Done her there!' Poor Jackie! She was not a bad sort, and had a great deal to bear. She drew her own conclusion— she was only capable of drawing one conclusion, and in the fullness of time she acted upon it. All the Friday Leonard had refused to speak to her, and had spent the evening observing the stars. On the Saturday he went up as usual to town, but he came not back Saturday night nor Sunday morning, nor Sunday afternoon. The inconvenience grew intolerable, and though she was now of a retiring habit and shy of women, she went up to Wickham Place. Leonard returned in her absence. The card, the fatal card, was gone from the pages of Ruskin, and he guessed what had happened. "'Well,' he had exclaimed, greeting her with peals of laughter, "'I know where you've been, but you don't know where I've been.' Jackie sighed, said, "'Len, I do think you might explain,' and resumed domesticity. Explanations were difficult at this stage— and Leonard was too silly, or, it is tempting to write, too sound a chap to attempt them. His reticence was not entirely the shoddy article that a business life promotes, the reticence that pretends that nothing is something, and hides behind the daily telegraph. The adventurer, also, is reticent, and it is an adventure for a clerk to walk for a few hours in darkness. You may laugh at him, you who have slept nights on the veldt, with your rifle beside you and all the atmosphere of adventure past. And you also may laugh who think adventure silly. But do not be surprised if Leonard is shy whenever he meets you, and if the Schlegels, rather than Jackie, hear about the dawn. That the Schlegels had not thought him foolish became a permanent joy. He was at his best when he thought of them. It buoyed him as he journeyed home beneath fading heavens. Somehow the barriers of wealth had fallen— and there had been—he could not phrase it—a general assertion of the wonder of the world. "'My conviction,' says the mystic, "'gains infinitely the moment another soul will believe in it.' And they had agreed that there was something beyond life's daily grey. He took off his top hat and smoothed it thoughtfully. He had hitherto supposed the unknown to be books, literature, clever conversation, culture. One raised oneself by study— and got upsides with the world. But in that quick interchange a new light dawned. Was that something walking in the dark among the suburban hills? He discovered that he was going bareheaded down Regent Street. London came back with a rush. Few were about at this hour, but all whom he passed looked at him with a hostility that was the more impressive because it was unconscious. He put his hat on. It was too big. His head disappeared like a pudding into a basin, the ears bending outwards at the touch of the curly brim. He wore it a little backwards, and its effect was greatly to elongate the face, and to bring out the distance between the eyes and the moustache. Thus equipped, he escaped criticism. No one felt uneasy, as he tittupped along the pavements, the heart of a man ticking fast in his chest. 
End of chapter 14 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 15 The sisters went out to dinner full of their adventure, and when they were both full of the same subject, there were few dinner-parties that could stand up against them. This particular one, which was all ladies, had more kick in it than most, but succumbed after a struggle. Helen at one part of the table, Margaret at the other, would talk of Mr. Bast and of no one else, and somewhere about the entree their monologues collided, fell ruining, and became common property. Nor was this all. The dinner-party was really an informal discussion club. There was a paper after it, read amid coffee-cups and laughter in the drawing-room, but dealing more or less thoughtfully with some topic of general interest. After the paper came a debate, and in this debate Mr. Bast also figured, appearing now as a bright spot in civilization, now as a dark spot, according to the temperament of the speaker. The subject of the paper had been, How ought I to dispose of my money? The reader, professing to be a millionaire on the point of death, inclined to bequeath her fortune for the foundation of local art galleries, but open to conviction from other sources. The various parts had been assigned beforehand, and some of the speeches were amusing. The hostess assumed the ungrateful role of the millionaire's eldest son, and implored her expiring parent not to dislocate society by allowing such vast sums to pass out of the family. Money was the fruit of self-denial, and the second generation had a right to profit by the self-denial of the first. What right had Mr. Bast to profit? The National Gallery was good enough for the likes of him. After property had had its say, a saying that is necessarily ungracious, the various philanthropists stepped forward. Something must be done for Mr. Bast. His conditions must be improved without impairing his independence. He must have a free library, or free tennis courts. His rent must be paid in such a way that he did not know it was being paid. It must be made worth his while to join the territorials. He must be forcibly parted from his uninspiring wife, the money going to her as compensation. He must be assigned a twin star, some member of the leisured classes who would watch over him ceaselessly, groans from Helen. He must be given food, but no clothes, clothes, but no food, a third return ticket to Venice, without either food or clothes when he arrived there. In short, he might be given anything and everything, so long as it was not the money itself. And here Margaret interrupted. "'Order! Order, Miss Schlegel!' said the reader of the paper. "'You are here, I understand, to advise me in the interests of the Society for the Preservation of Places of Historic Interest or Natural Beauty. I cannot have you speaking out of your role. It makes my poor head go round, and I think you forget that I am very ill.' "'Your head won't go round if only you listen to my argument,' said Margaret. Why not give him the money itself? You're supposed to have about thirty thousand a year. Have I? I thought I had a million. Wasn't a million your capital? Dear me, we ought to have settled that. Still, it doesn't matter. Whatever you've got, I order you to give as many poor men as you can three hundred a year each. But that would be pauperizing them, said an earnest girl, who liked the Schlegels, but thought them a little unspiritual at times. "'Not if you gave them so much. A big windfall would not pauperize a man. It is these little driblets, distributed among too many, that do the harm. Money's educational. It's far more educational than the things it buys.' There was a protest. "'In a sense,' added Margaret. But the protest continued. "'Well, isn't the most civilized thing going the man who has learnt to wear his income properly?' "'Exactly what your Mr. Bast's won't do.' Oh, "'Give them a chance. Give them money. Don't dole them out poetry books and railway tickets like babies. Give them the wherewithal to buy these things. When your socialism comes, it may be different, and we may think in terms of commodities instead of cash. Till it comes, give people cash, for it is the warp of civilization, whatever the woof may be.' The imagination ought to play upon money and realize it vividly, for it's the, the second most important thing in the world. It is so sloughed over and hushed up, there is so little clear thinking. 
Oh, political economy, of course, but so few of us think clearly about our own private incomes, and admit that independent thoughts are in nine cases out of ten the results of independent means. Money. Give Mr. Bast money, and don't bother about his ideals. He'll pick up those for himself." She leant back while the more earnest members of the club began to misconstrue her. The female mind, though cruelly practical in daily life, cannot bear to hear ideals belittled in conversation. And Miss Schlegel was asked how ever she could say such dreadful things, and what it would profit Mr. Bast if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul. She answered, "'Nothing, but he would not gain his soul until he had gained a little of the world.' Then they said, "'No, they did not believe it,' and she admitted that an overworked clerk may save his soul in the superterrestrial sense, where the effort will be taken for the deed, but she denied that he will ever explore the spiritual resources of this world will ever know the rarer joys of the body, or attain to clear and passionate intercourse with his fellows. Others had attacked the fabric of society, property, interest, etc. She only fixed her eyes on a few human beings, to see how, under present conditions, they could be made happier. Doing good to humanity was useless, the many-coloured efforts thereto spreading over the vast area like films, and resulting in an universal grey. To do good to one— or, as in this case, to a few, was the utmost she dared hope for. Between the idealists and the political economists, Margaret had a bad time. Disagreeing elsewhere, they agreed in disowning her, and in keeping the administration of the millionaire's money in their own hands. The earnest girl brought forward a scheme of personal supervision and mutual help, the effect of which was to alter poor people until they became exactly like people who were not so poor. The hostess pertinently remarked that she, as eldest son, might surely rank among the millionaire's legatees. Margaret weakly admitted the claim, and another claim was at once set up by Helen, who declared that she had been the millionaire's housemaid for over forty years, overfed and underpaid. Was nothing to be done for her, so corpulent and poor? The millionaire then read out her last will and testament, in which she left the whole of her fortune to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Then she died. The serious parts of the discussion had been of higher merit than the playful. In a men's debate is the reverse more general? But the meeting broke up hilariously enough, and a dozen happy ladies dispersed to their homes. Helen and Margaret walked the earnest girl as far as Battersea Bridge Station, arguing copiously all the way. When she had gone they were conscious of an alleviation, and of the great beauty of the evening. They turned back towards Oakley Street. The lamps and the plane trees— following the line of the embankment, struck a note of dignity that is rare in English cities. The seats, almost deserted, were here and there occupied by gentlefolk in evening dress, who had strolled out from the houses behind to enjoy fresh air and the whisper of the rising tide. There is something continental about Chelsea embankment. It is an open space used rightly, a blessing more frequent in Germany than here. As Margaret and Helen sat down, the city behind them seemed to be a vast theatre, an opera-house in which some endless trilogy was performing, and they themselves a pair of satisfied subscribers, who did not mind losing a little of the second act. Cold? No. Tired? Doesn't matter. The earnest girl's train rumbled away over the bridge. I say, Helen. Well— are we really going to follow up Mr. Bast? I don't know. I think we won't. As you like. It's no good, I think, unless you really mean to know people. The discussion brought that home to me. We got on well enough with him in a spirit of excitement, but think of rational intercourse. We mustn't play at friendship. No, it's no good. There's Mrs. Lanolin, too. Helen yawned. So dull. Just so, and possibly worse than dull. I should like to know how he got hold of your card. But he said something about a concert and an umbrella. Then did the card see the wife? Helen, come to bed. No, just a little longer. It is so beautiful. Tell me—oh, yes, did you say money is the warp of the world? Yes. Then what's the wolf? 
"'Very much what one chooses,' said Margaret. "'It's something that isn't money. One can't say more.' "'Walking at night?' "'Probably.' "'For Tibby, Oxford?' "'It seems so.' "'For you?' Now that we have to leave Wickham Place, I begin to think it's that. For Mrs. Wilcox, it was certainly Howard's end. One's own name will carry immense distances. Mr. Wilcox, who was sitting with friends many seats away, heard his, rose to his feet, and strolled along towards the speakers. It is sad to suppose that places may ever be more important than people, continued Margaret. Why, Meg? There's so much nicer, generally. I'd rather think of that forester's house in Pomerania than of the fat Herr Forstmeister who lived in it. I believe we shall come to care about people less and less, Helen. The more people one knows, the easier it becomes to replace them. It's one of the curses of London. I quite expect to end my life caring most for a place. Here Mr. Wilcox reached them. It was several weeks since they had met. "'How do you do?' he cried. "'I thought I recognised your voices. Whatever are you both doing down here?' His tones were protective. He implied that one ought not to sit out on Chelsea Embankment without a male escort. Helen resented this, but Margaret accepted it as part of the good man's equipment. "'What an age it is since I've seen you, Mr. Wilcox. I met Evie in the tube, though, lately. I hope you have good news of your son.' "'Paul?' said Mr. Wilcox, extinguishing his cigarette and sitting down between them. "'Oh, Paul's all right. We had a line for Madeira. He'll be at work again by now.' "'Ugh!' said Helen, shuddering from complex causes. "'I beg your pardon? Isn't the climate of Nigeria too horrible?' "'Someone's got to go,' he said simply. "'England will never keep her trade overseas unless she is prepared to make sacrifices. Unless we get firm in West Africa, j untold complications may follow. Now tell me all your news. Oh, we've had a splendid evening, cried Helen, who always woke up at the advent of a visitor. We belong to a kind of club that reads papers, Margaret and I, all women, but there is a discussion after. This evening it was on how one ought to leave one's money, whether to one's family or to the poor, and if so, how— Oh, most interesting!" The man of business smiled. Since his wife's death he had almost doubled his income. He was an important figure at last, a reassuring name on company prospectuses, and life had treated him very well. The world seemed in his grasp as he listened to the River Thames, which still flowed inland from the sea. So wonderful to the girls, it held no mysteries for him. He had helped to shorten its long tidal trough by taking shares in the lock at Teddington, and if he and other capitalists thought good, some day it could be shortened again. With a good dinner inside him, and an amiable but academic woman on either flank, he felt that his hands were on all the ropes of life, and that what he did not know could not be worth knowing. "'Sounds a most original entertainment!' he exclaimed, and laughed in his pleasant way. "'I wish Evie would go to that sort of thing.' But she hasn't the time. She's taken to breed Aberdeen Terriers. Jolly little dogs." "'I expect we'd better be doing the same, really.' "'We pretend we're improving ourselves, you see,' said Helen, a little sharply, for the Wilcox glamour is not of the kind that returns, and she had bitter memories of the days when a speech such as he had just made would have impressed her favourably. "'We suppose it is a good thing to waste an evening once a fortnight over a debate. But, as my sister says, it may be better to breed dogs." "'Not at all. I don't agree with your sister. There's nothing like a debate to teach one quickness. I often wish I had gone in for them when I was a youngster. It would have helped me no end." "'Quickness?' "'Yes, quickness in argument. Time after time I've missed scoring a point because the other man has the gift of gab and I haven't. Oh, I believe in these discussions." The patronizing tone, thought Margaret, came well enough from a man who was old enough to be their father. She had always maintained that Mr. Wilcox had a charm. In times of sorrow or emotion, his inadequacy had pained her, but it was pleasant to listen to him now, 
and to watch his thick brown moustache and high forehead confronting the stars. But Helen was nettled. The aim of their debates, she implied, was truth. "'Oh, yes, it doesn't much matter what subject you take,' said he. Margaret laughed, and said, "'But this is going to be far better than the debate itself.' Helen recovered herself, and laughed, too. "'No, I won't go on,' she declared. "'I'll just put our special case to Mr. Wilcox.' "'About Mr. Bast? Yes, do. He'll be more lenient to a special case. But, Mr. Wilcox, do first light another cigarette. It's this. We've just come across a young fellow, who's evidently very poor, and who seems interest— What's his profession? Clerk. What in? Do you remember, Margaret? Porphyrian Fire Insurance Company. Oh, yes, the nice people who gave Aunt Julia a new hearthrug. He seems interesting, in some ways very, and one wishes one could help him. He is married to a wife whom he doesn't seem to care for much. He likes books, and what one may roughly call adventure, and if he had a chance— But he is so poor. He lives a life where all the money is apt to go on nonsense and clothes. One is so afraid that circumstances will be too strong for him, and that he will sink. Well, he got mixed up in our debate. He wasn't the subject of it, but it seemed to bear on his point. Suppose a millionaire died, and desired to leave money to help such a man. How should he be helped? Should he be given three hundred pounds a year direct, which was Margaret's plan? Most of them thought that this would pauperize him. Should he, and those like him, be given free libraries? I said no. He doesn't want more books to read, but to read books rightly. My suggestion was that he should be given something every year, towards a summer holiday. But then there is his wife, and they said she would have to go too. Nothing seemed quite right. Now what do you think? Imagine that you were a millionaire, and wanted to help the poor. What would you do? Mr. Wilcox, whose fortune was not so very far below the standard indicated, laughed exuberantly. "'My dear Miss Schlegel, I will not rush in where your sex has been unable to tread. I will not add another plan to the numerous excellent ones that have already been suggested. My only contribution is this. Let your young friend clear out of the Porphyrian Fire Insurance Company with all possible speed.' "'Why?' said Margaret. He lowered his voice. This is between friends. It'll be in the receiver's hands before Christmas. It'll smash," he added, thinking that he had not been understood. "'Dear me, Helen, listen to that! And he'll have to get another place!' "'We'll have. Let him leave the ship before it sinks. Let him get one now.' "'Rather than wait, to make sure?' "'Decidedly.' "'Why's that?' Again the Olympian laugh and the lowered voice. Naturally, the man who's in a situation when he applies, stands a better chance, is in a stronger position than the man who isn't. It looks as if he's worth something. I know, by myself—this is letting you into the state secrets—it affects an employer greatly. Human nature, I'm afraid." "'I hadn't thought of that,' murmured Margaret, while Helen said, "'Our human nature appears to be the other way round. We employ people because they're unemployed. The boot-man, for instance." "'And how does he clean the boots?' <laughs> "'Not well,' confessed Margaret. "'There you are.' "'Then do you really advise us to tell this youth?' "'I advise nothing,' he interrupted, glancing up and down the embankment, in case his indiscretion had been overheard. "'I oughtn't to have spoken, but I happen to know, being more or less behind the scenes. The Porphyrian's a bad, bad concern. Now, don't say I said so. It's outside the tariff ring." "'Certainly I won't say. In fact, I don't know what that means." "'I thought an insurance company never smashed,' was Helen's contribution. Don't the others always run in and save them?" "'You're thinking of re-insurance,' said Mr. Wilcox, mildly. It is exactly there that the Porphyrian is weak. It has tried to undercut, and has been badly hit by a long series of small fires and it hasn't been able to reinsure. I'm afraid that public companies don't save one another for love." "'Human nature, I suppose,' quoted Helen, and he laughed and agreed that it was. When Margaret said that she supposed that clerks, like everyone else, found it extremely difficult to get situations in these days, 
He replied, "'Yes, extremely,' and rose to rejoin his friends. He knew by his own office, seldom a vacant post, and hundreds of applicants for it, at present no vacant post. "'And how's Howard's end looking?' said Margaret, wishing to change the subject before they parted. Mr. Wilcox was a little apt to think one wanted to get something out of him. "'It's let.' "'Really? And you wandering homeless in long-haired Chelsea! How strange are the ways of fate!' "'No, it's let unfurnished. We've moved.' "'Why, I thought of you both as anchored there for ever. Evie never told me.' "'I dare say when you met Evie the thing wasn't settled. We only moved a week ago. Paul has rather a feeling for the old place, and we held on for him to have his holiday there. But really it is impossibly small. Endless drawbacks. I forget whether you've been up to it. As far as the house, never. Well, Howard's End is one of those converted farms. They don't really do. Spend what you will on them. We messed away with a garage, all among the witch-elm roots. And last year we enclosed a bit of the meadow and attempted a mockery. Evie got rather keen on alpine plants. But it didn't do. No, it didn't do. You remember, or your sister will remember, the farm with those abominable guinea-fowls, and the hedge that the old woman would never cut properly, so that it all went thin at the bottom. And inside the house the beams, and the staircase through a door. Picturesque enough, but not a place to live in." He glanced over the parapet cheerfully. "'Full tide. And the position wasn't right, either. The neighbourhood's getting suburban. Either be in London or out of it, I say. So we've taken a house in Ducie Street, close to Sloane Street, and a place right down in Shropshire, Onerton Grange. Ever heard of Onerton? Do come and see us, right away from everywhere, up towards Wales." "'What a change!' said Margaret. But the change was in her own voice, which had become most sad. "'I can't imagine Howard's End or Hilton without you.' "'Hilton isn't without us,' he replied. "'Charles is there still.' Still, said Margaret, who had not kept up with the Charleses. But I thought he was still at Epsom. They were furnishing that Christmas—one Christmas. How everything alters! I used to admire Mrs. Charles from our windows very often. Wasn't it Epsom? Yes, but they moved eighteen months ago. Charles, the good chap—his voice dropped—thought I should be lonely. I didn't want him to move, but he would, and took a house at the other end of Hilton, down by the Six Hills. He had a motor, too. There they all are, a very jolly party, he and she and the two grandchildren. "'I manage other people's affairs so much better than they manage them themselves,' said Margaret, as they shook hands. "'When you moved out of Howard's End, I should have moved Mr. Charles Wilcox into it. I should have kept so remarkable a place in the family.' "'So it is.' he replied. I haven't sold it, and don't mean to. No, but none of you are there. Oh, we've got a splendid tenant, Ham R. Bryce, an invalid. If Charles ever wanted it. But he won't. Dolly is so dependent on modern conveniences. No, we have all decided against Howard's End. We like it in a way, but now we feel that it is neither one thing nor the other. One must have one thing or the other." and some people are lucky enough to have both. You're doing yourself proud, Mr. Wilcox. My congratulations." "'And mine,' said Helen. "'Do remind Evie to come and see us. To Wickham Place. We shan't be there very long, either." "'You too on the move?' "'Next September,' Margaret sighed. "'Every one moving. <laughs> Good-bye.' The tide had begun to ebb. Margaret leant over the parapet and watched it sadly. Mr. Wilcox had forgotten his wife, Helen, her lover. She herself was probably forgetting. Everyone moving. Is it worth while attempting the past when there is this continual flux even in the hearts of men? Helen roused her by saying, "'What a prosperous vulgarian Mr. Wilcox has grown! I have very little use for him in these days. However, he did tell us about the Porphyrian. Let us write to Mr. Bast as soon as ever we get home, and tell him to clear out of it at once. Do, yes, that's worth doing. Let us. Let's ask him to tea. End of chapter 15
Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 16. Leonard accepted the invitation to tea next Saturday. But he was right. The visit proved a conspicuous failure. Sugar, said Margaret. Cake, said Helen. The big cake, or the little deadlies. I'm afraid you thought my letter rather odd. But we'll explain. We aren't odd, really. Not affected, really. We're over-expressive, that's all. As a lady's lapdog, Leonard did not excel. He was not an Italian, still less a Frenchman, in whose blood there runs the very spirit of persiflage and of gracious repartee. His wit was the Cockney's. It opened no doors into imagination, and Helen was drawn up short by— "'The more a lady has to say, the better,' administered waggishly. "'Oh, yes,' she said. "'Ladies Brighton, yes, I know, the darlings are regular sunbeams. Let me give you a plate.' "'How do you like your work?' interposed Margaret. He, too, was drawn up short. He would not have these women prying into his work. They were romance, and so was the room to which he had at last penetrated, with the queer sketches of people bathing upon its walls, and so were the very teacups, with their delicate borders of wild strawberries. But he would not let romance interfere with his life. There is the devil to pay, then. "'Oh, well enough!' he answered. "'Your company is the Porphyrian, isn't it?' "'Yes, that's so,' becoming rather offended. "'It's funny how things get round.' "'Why funny?' asked Helen, who did not follow the workings of his mind. "'It was written as large as life on your card, and considering we wrote to you there, and that you replied on the stamped paper. "'Would you call the Porphyrian one of the big insurance companies?' pursued Margaret. It depends what you call big. I mean by big a solid, well-established concern that offers a reasonably good career to its employees. I couldn't say. Some would tell you one thing and others another, said the employee uneasily. For my own part, he shook his head, I only believe half I hear. Not that, even. It's safer. Those clever ones come to the worst grief I've often noticed. Ah, oh, you can't be too careful." He drank and wiped his moustache, which was going to be one of those moustaches that always droop into teacups, more bother than they're worth, surely, and not fashionable, either. "'I quite agree. And that's why I was curious to know. Is it a solid, well-established concern?' Leonard had no idea. He understood his own corner of the machine, but nothing beyond it. He desired to confess neither knowledge nor ignorance and under these circumstances another motion of the head seemed safest. To him, as to the British public, the Porphyrian was the Porphyrian of the advertisement, a giant in the classical style, but draped sufficiently, who held in one hand a burning torch, and pointed with the other to St. Paul's and Windsor Castle. A large sum of money was inscribed below, and you drew your own conclusions. This giant caused Leonard to do arithmetic, and write letters, and to explain the regulations to new clients, and re-explain them to old ones. A giant was of an impulsive morality. One knew that much. He would pay for Mrs. Munt's hearth-rug with ostentatious haste. A large claim he would repudiate quietly, and fight court by court. But his true fighting weight, his antecedents, his armors with other members of the commercial pantheon, all these were as uncertain to ordinary mortals as were the escapades of Zeus. While the gods are powerful, we learn little about them. It is only in the days of their decadence that a strong light beats into heaven. "'We were told the Porphyrian's no go,' blurted Helen. "'We wanted to tell you. That's why we wrote.' "'A friend of ours did think that it is unsufficiently reinsured,' said Margaret. Now Leonard had his cue. He must praise the Porphyrian. "'You can tell your friend,' he said, "'that he's quite wrong.' "'Oh, good!' The young man coloured a little. In his circle to be wrong was fatal. The Miss Schlegels did not mind being wrong. They were genuinely glad that they had been misinformed. To them nothing was fatal but evil. "'Wrong, so to speak,' he added. "'How, so to speak?' "'I mean—' I wouldn't say he's right altogether. 
but this was a blunder. "'Then he is right partly,' said the elder woman, quick as lightning. Leonard replied that every one was right partly, if it came to that. "'Mr. Bast, I don't understand business, and I dare say my questions are stupid. But can you tell me what makes a concern right or wrong?' Leonard sat back with a sigh. "'Our friend, who was also a business man, was so positive. He said before Christmas—' "'And advised you to clear out of it,' concluded Helen. "'But I don't see why he should know better than you do.' Leonard rubbed his hands. He was tempted to say that he knew nothing about the thing at all. But a commercial training was too strong for him. Nor could he say it was a bad thing, for this would be giving it away, nor yet that it was good, for this would be giving it away equally. He attempted to suggest that it was something between the two, with vast possibilities in either direction, but broke down under the gaze of four sincere eyes. And yet he scarcely distinguished between the two sisters. One was more beautiful and more lively, but the Miss Schlegels still remained a composite Indian god whose waving arms and contradictory speeches were the product of a single mind. "'One can but see,' he remarked, adding, "'As Ibsen says, things happen.' He was itching to talk about books, and make the most of his romantic hour. Minute after minute slipped away, while the ladies, with imperfect skill, discussed the subject of reinsurance, or praised their anonymous friend. Leonard grew annoyed, perhaps rightly. He made vague remarks about not being one of those who minded their affairs being talked over by others, but they did not take the hint. Men might have shown more tact. Women, however tactful elsewhere, are heavy-handed here. They cannot see why we should shroud our incomes and our prospects in a veil. How much exactly have you, and how much do you expect to have next June? And these were women with a theory who held that reticence about money matters is absurd, and that life would be truer if each would state the exact size of the golden island upon which he stands, the exact stretch of warp over which he throws the woof that is not money. How can we do justice to the pattern otherwise? And the precious minutes slipped away, and Jackie and Squalor came nearer. At last he could bear it no longer, and broke in, reciting the names of books feverishly, there was a moment of piercing joy when Margaret said, "'So you like Carlyle?' And then the door opened, and Mr. Wilcox, Miss Wilcox, entered, preceded by two prancing puppies. "'Oh, the dears! Oh, Evie, how too impossibly sweet!' screamed Helen, falling on her hands and knees. "'We brought the little fellows round,' said Mr. Wilcox. "'I bred him myself.' "'Oh, really, Mr. Bast, come and play with puppies!' "'I've got to be going now,' said Leonard sourly. "'But play with puppies a little first. "'This is Ahab, that's Jezebel,' said Evie, who was one of those who name animals after the less successful characters of Old Testament history. "'I've got to be going.' Helen was too much occupied with puppies to notice him. "'Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Ba—' Uh, "'Must you be, really? Good-bye.' "'Come again,' said Helen from the floor. Then Leonard's gorge arose. "'Why should he come again? What was the good of it?' he said roundly. "'No, I shan't. I knew it would be a failure.' Most people would have let him go. A little mistake. We tried knowing another class. Impossible. But the Schlegels had never played with life. They had attempted friendship, and they would take the consequences. Helen retorted, "'I call that a very rude remark. What do you want to turn on me like that for?' And suddenly the drawing-room re-echoed to a vulgar row. "'You ask me why I turn on you?' "'Yes.' "'What do you want to have me here for?' "'To help you, you silly boy!' cried Helen. "'And don't shout! I don't want your patronage. I don't want your tea.' I was quite happy. What do you want to unsettle me for?" He turned to Mr. Wilcox. "'I put it to this gentleman. I ask you, sir, am I to have my brains picked?' Mr. Wilcox turned to Margaret with the air of humorous strength that he could so well command. "'Are we intruding, Miss Schlegel? Can we be of any use, or shall we go?' But Margaret ignored him. "'I'm connected with a leading insurance company, sir. I receive what I take to be an invitation from these ladies," he drawled the word. 
I come, and it's to have my brain picked. I ask you, is it fair?" "'Highly unfair,' said Mr. Wilcox, drawing a gasp from Evie, who knew that her father was becoming dangerous. "'There, you hear that? Most unfair, the gentleman says. There! Not content with—' pointing at Margaret. "'You can't deny it.' His voice rose. He was falling into the rhythm of a scene with Jackie. But as soon as I'm useful, it's a very different thing. Oh, yes, send for him, cross-question him, pick his brains. Oh, yes. Now take me on the whole, I'm a quiet fellow. I'm law-abiding, I don't wish any unpleasantness, but I—I— You, said Margaret, you, you— Laughter from Evie, as at a repartee. You are the man who tried to walk by the Pole Star. More laughter. You saw the sunrise. Laughter. You tried to get away from the fogs that are stifling us all, away past books and houses to the truth. You were looking for a real home." "'I fail to see the connection,' said Leonard, hot with stupid anger. "'So do I.' There was a pause. "'You were that last Sunday. You are this to-day. Mr. Bast, I and my sister have talked you over. We wanted to help you. We also supposed you might help us. We did not have you here out of charity, which bores us, but because we hoped there would be a connection between last Sunday and other days. What is the good of your stars and trees, your sunrise and the wind, if they do not enter into our daily lives? They have never entered into mine, but into yours we thought, haven't we all to struggle against life's daily greyness? against pettiness, against mechanical cheerfulness, against suspicion. I struggle by remembering my friends. Others I have known by remembering some place, some beloved place or tree. We thought you one of these." "'Of course, if there's been any misunderstanding,' mumbled Leonard, "'all I can do is to go. But I beg to state—' He paused. Ahab and Jezebel danced at his boots and made him look ridiculous. You are picking my brain for official information. I can prove it. I—' He blew his nose and left them. "'Can I help you now?' said Mr. Wilcox, turning to Margaret. "'May I have one quiet word with him in the hall?' "'Helen, go after him. Do anything, anything to make the noodle understand.' Helen hesitated. "'But really,' said their visitor, "'ought she to?' At once she went. He resumed. I would have chimed in, but I felt that you could polish him off for yourselves. I didn't interfere. You were splendid, Miss Schlegel, absolutely splendid. You can take my word for it, but there are very few women who could have managed him. Oh, yes, said Margaret distractedly. Bowling him over with those long sentences was what fetched me, cried Evie. Yes, indeed, chuckled her father. All that part about mechanical cheerfulness! Oh, fine!" "'I'm very sorry,' said Margaret, collecting herself. "'He's a nice creature, really. I cannot think what set him off. It has been most unpleasant for you.' "'Oh, I didn't mind.' Then he changed his mood. He asked if he might speak as an old friend, and, permission given, said, "'Oughtn't you really to be more careful?' Margaret laughed, though her thoughts still strayed after Helen. "'Do you realize that it's all your fault?' she said. "'You're responsible.' "'I?' "'This is the young man whom we were to warn against the Porphyrian. We warn him, and look!' Mr. Wilcox was annoyed. "'I hardly consider that a fair deduction,' he said. "'Obviously unfair,' said Margaret. "'I was only thinking how tangled things are. It's our fault, mostly, neither yours nor his." "'Not his?' "'No.' "'Miss Schlegel, you are too kind.' "'Yes, indeed,' nodded Evie, a little contemptuously. "'You behave much too well to people, and then they impose on you. I know the world and that type of man, and as soon as I entered the room I saw you had not been treating him properly. You must keep that type at a distance. Otherwise they forget themselves. Sad, but true. They aren't our sort, and one must face the fact." "'Yes. Do admit that we should never have had the outburst if he was a gentleman.' "'I admit it willingly,' 
said Margaret, who was pacing up and down the room. A gentleman would have kept his suspicions to himself. Mr. Wilcox watched her with a vague uneasiness. "'What did he suspect you of?' "'Of wanting to make money out of him.' "'Intolerable brute! But how are you to benefit?' "'Exactly! How indeed! Just horrible, corroding suspicion! One touch of thought or of good will would have brushed it away! Just the senseless fear that does make men intolerable brutes. I come back to my original point. You ought to be more careful, Miss Schlegel. Your servants ought to have orders not to let such people in." She turned to him frankly. "'Let me explain exactly why we like this man and want to see him again.' That's your clever way of thinking. I shall never believe you like him." "'I do. Firstly, because he cares for physical adventure, just as you do. Yes, you go motoring and shooting. He would like to go camping out. Secondly, he cares for something special in adventure. It is quickest to call that special something poetry. Though he's one of that writer sort." "'No, oh no. I mean, he may be, but it would be loathsome stuff. His brain is filled with the husks of books, culture. Horrible! We want him to wash out his brain and go to the real thing. We want to show him how he may get upsides with life. As I said, either friends or the country, some—she hesitated—either some very dear person or some very dear place seems necessary to relieve life's daily grey, and to show that it is grey. If possible, one should have both. Some of her words ran past Mr. Wilcox. He let them run past. Others he caught and criticized with admirable lucidity. "'Your mistake is this, and it is a very common mistake. This young bounder has a life of his own. What right have you to conclude that it is an unsuccessful life, or, as you call it, grey? "'Because, one minute, you know nothing about him. He probably has his own joys and interests—wife, children, snug little home. That's where we practical fellows," he smiled, are more tolerant than you intellectuals. We live and let live, and assume that things are jogging on fairly well elsewhere, and that the ordinary plain man may be trusted to look after his own affairs. I quite grant—I look at the faces of the clerks in my own office and observe them to be dull, but I don't know what's going on beneath. So, by the way, with London. I have heard you rail against London, Miss Schlegel. And it seems a funny thing to say, but I was very angry with you. What do you know about London? You only see civilization from the outside. I don't say in your case, but in too many cases that attitude leads to morbidity, discontent, and socialism." She admitted the strength of his position, though it undermined imagination. As he spoke, some outposts of poetry, and perhaps of sympathy, fell ruining and she retreated to what she called her second line, to the special facts of the case. "'His wife is an old bore,' she said simply. "'He never came home last Saturday night because he wanted to be alone, and she thought he was with us.' "'With you?' "'Yes,' Evie tittered. "'He hasn't got the cosy home that you assumed. He needs outside interests.' "'Naughty young man!' cried the girl. "'Naughty!' said Margaret, who hated naughtiness more than sin. "'When you're married, Miss Wilcox, won't you want outside interests?' "'He has apparently got them,' put in Mr. Wilcox slyly. "'Yes, indeed, father.' "'He was tramping in Surrey, if you mean that,' said Margaret, pacing away rather crossly. "'Oh, I dare say! Miss Wilcox, he was!' Mm -hmm from Mr. Wilcox, who thought the episode amusing, if risqué. With most ladies he would not have discussed it, but he was trading on Margaret's reputation as an emancipated woman. "'He said so, and about such a thing he wouldn't lie.' They both began to laugh. "'That's where I differ from you. Men lie about their positions and prospects, but not about a thing of that sort.' He shook his head. "'Miss Schlegel, excuse me, but I know the type.' I said before, he isn't a type. He cares about adventures, rightly. He's certain that our smug existence isn't all. He's vulgar and hysterical and bookish, but I don't think that sums him up. There's manhood in him as well. 
"'Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. He's a real man.' As she spoke, their eyes met, and it was as if Mr. Wilcox's defences fell. She saw back to the real man in him. Unwittingly she had touched his emotions. A woman and two men. They had formed the magic triangle of sex, and the male was thrilled to jealousy, in case the female was attracted by another male. Love, say the ascetics, reveals our shameful kinship with the beasts. Be it so. One can bear that. Jealousy is the real shame. It is jealousy, not love, that connects us with the farmyard intolerably, and calls up visions of two angry cocks and a complacent hen. Margaret crushed complacency down because she was civilized. Mr. Wilcox, uncivilized, continued to feel anger long after he had rebuilt his defences, and was again presenting a bastion to the world. "'Miss Schlegel, you're a pair of dear creatures, but you really must be careful in this uncharitable world. What does your brother say?' "'I forget. Surely he has some opinion. He laughs, if I remember correctly.' "'He's very clever, isn't he?' said Evie, who had met and detested Tibby at Oxford. "'Yes, pretty well. But I wonder what Helen's doing.' "'She is very young to undertake this sort of thing,' said Mr. Wilcox. Margaret went out into the landing. She heard no sound, and Mr. Bast's topper was missing from the hall. "'Helen!' she called. "'Yes,' replied a voice from the library. "'You in there?' "'Yes. He's gone some time.' Margaret went to her. "'Why, you're all alone,' she said. "'Yes. It's all right, Meg. Poor, poor creature. Come back to the Wilcoxes and tell me later. Mr. W. much concerned, and slightly titillated. Oh, I've no patience with him. I hate him. Poor dear Mr. Bast! He wanted to talk literature, and we would talk business. Such a muddle of a man, and yet so worth pulling through. I like him extraordinarily. "'Well done,' said Margaret, kissing her. "'But come into the drawing-room now, and don't talk about him to the Wilcoxes. Make light of the whole thing.' Helen came and behaved with a cheerfulness that reassured their visitor. This hen, at all events, was fancy-free. "'He's gone with my blessing,' she cried. "'And now for puppies!' As they drove away, Mr. Wilcox said to his daughter, "'I am really concerned at the way those girls go on. They are clever as you make em but unpractical. God bless me! One of these days they'll go too far. Girls like that oughtn't to live alone in London. Until they marry, they ought to have someone to look after them. We must look in more often. We're better than no one. You like them, don't you, Evie?" Evie replied, "'Helen's right enough, but I can't stand the toothy one. And I shouldn't have called either of them girls.' Evie had grown up handsome. Dark-eyed, with the glow of youth under sunburn, built firmly and firm-lipped, she was the best the Wilcoxes could do in the way of feminine beauty. For the present, puppies and her father were the only things she loved, but the net of matrimony was being prepared for her and a few days later she was attracted to a Mr. Percy Cahill, an uncle of Mrs. Charles, and he was attracted to her. End of chapter 16 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 17 The age of property holds bitter moments, even for a proprietor. When a move is imminent, furniture becomes ridiculous, and Margaret now lay awake at nights wondering where, where on earth they and all their belongings would be deposited in September next. Chairs, tables, pictures, books, that had rumbled down to them through the generations, must rumble forward again like a slide of rubbish to which she longed to give the final push, and send toppling into the sea. But there were all their father's books. They never read them, but they were their father's, and must be kept. There was the marble-top chiffonier, their mother had set store by it, they could not remember why. Round every knob and cushion in the house sentiment gathered, a sentiment that was at times personal, but more often a faint piety to the dead, 
a prolongation of rites that might have ended at the grave. It was absurd, if you came to think of it. Helen and Tibby came to think of it. Margaret was too busy with the house-agents. The feudal ownership of land did bring dignity, whereas the modern ownership of movables is reducing us again to a nomadic horde. We are reverting to the civilization of luggage, and historians of the future will note how the middle classes accreted possessions without taking root in the earth, and may find in this the secret of their imaginative poverty. The Schlegels were certainly the poorer for the loss of Wickham Place. It had helped to balance their lives, and almost to counsel them. Nor is their ground landlord spiritually the richer. He has built flats on its site, his motor-cars grow swifter, his exposures of socialism more trenchant. But he has spilt the precious distillation of the years, and no chemistry of his can give it back to society again. Margaret grew depressed. She was anxious to settle on a house before they left town to pay their annual visit to Mrs. Munt. She enjoyed this visit, and wanted to have her mind at ease for it. Swanage, though dull, was stable, and this year she longed more than usual for its fresh air, and for the magnificent downs that guarded on the north. But London thwarted her. In its atmosphere she could not concentrate. London only stimulates, it cannot sustain and Margaret, hurrying over its surface for a house without knowing what sort of house she wanted, was paying for many a thrilling sensation in the past. She could not even break loose from culture, and her time was wasted by concerts which it would be a sin to miss, and invitations which it would never do to refuse. At last she grew desperate. She resolved that she would go nowhere and be at home to no one until she found a house, and broke the resolution in half an hour. Once she had humorously lamented that she had never been to Simpson's restaurant in the Strand. Now a note arrived from Miss Wilcox, asking her to lunch there. Mr. Cahill was coming, and the three would have such a jolly chat, and perhaps end up at the Hippodrome. Margaret had no strong regard for Evie, and no desire to meet her fiancé, and she was surprised that Helen, who had been far funnier about Simpson's, had not been asked instead. But the invitation touched her by its intimate tone. She must know Evie Wilcox better than she supposed, and declaring that she simply must, she accepted. But when she saw Evie at the entrance of the restaurant, staring fiercely at nothing after the fashion of athletic women, her heart failed her anew. Miss Wilcox had changed perceptibly since her engagement. Her voice was gruffer, her manner more downright, and she was inclined to patronize the more foolish virgin. Margaret was silly enough to be pained at this. Depressed at her isolation, she saw not only houses and furniture, but the vessel of life itself slipping past her, with people like Evie and Mr. Cahill on board. There are moments when virtue and wisdom fail us, and one of them came to her at Simpson's in the Strand. As she trod the staircase, narrow but carpeted thickly, as she entered the eating-room, where saddles of mutton were being trundled up to expectant clergymen, she had a strong, if erroneous, conviction of her own futility— and wished she had never come out of her backwater, where nothing happened except art and literature, and where no one ever got married or succeeded in remaining engaged. Then came a little surprise. Father might be of the party. Yes, father was. With a smile of pleasure she moved forward to greet him, and her feeling of loneliness vanished. "'I thought I'd get round if I could,' said he. "'Evie told me of her little plan, so I just slipped in and secured a table.' always secure a table first. Evie, don't pretend you want to sit by your old father, because you don't. Miss Schlegel, come in my side, out of pity. My goodness, but you look tired. Been worrying round after your young clerks? No, after houses, said Margaret, edging past him into the box. I'm hungry, not tired. I want to eat heaps. That's good. What do you have? Fish pie, said she, with a glance at the menu. "'Fish pie? Fancy coming for fish pie to Simpson's. It's not a bit the thing to go for here.' "'Go for something for me, then,' said Margaret, pulling off her gloves. Her spirits were rising, and his reference to Leonard Bast had warmed her curiously. "'Saddle of mutton,' said he, after profound reflection, "'and cider to drink. That's the type of thing. I like this place for a joke once in a way. It is so thoroughly old English. Don't you agree?' "'Yes,' said Margaret, who didn't. 
The order was given, the joint rolled up, and the carver, under Mr. Wilcox's direction, cut the meat where it was succulent, and piled their plates high. Mr. Cahill insisted on sirloin, but admitted that he had made a mistake later on. He and Evie soon fell into a conversation of the, "'No, I didn't! Yes, you did!' type conversation, which, though fascinating to those who are engaged in it, neither desires nor deserves the attention of others. "'It's a golden rule to tip the cava. Tip everywhere's my motto.' "'Perhaps it does make life more human.' "'Then the fellows know one again. Especially in the East. If you tip, they remember you from year's end to year's end.' "'Have you been in the East?' "'Oh, Greece, and the Levant. I used to go out for sport and business to Cyprus. Some military society of a sort there. A few piastres, properly distributed, help to keep one's memory green. But you, of course, think this shockingly cynical. How's your discussion society getting on? Any new utopias lately? No, I'm house-hunting, Mr. Wilcox, as I've already told you once. Do you know of any houses? I'm afraid I don't. Well, what's the point of being practical if you can't find two distressed females a house? We merely want a small house with large rooms and plenty of them. Evie, I like that. Miss Schlegel expects me to turn house agent for her. What's that, father? I want a new home in September, and someone must find it. I can't. Percy, do you know of anything? <laughs> can't say I do, said Mr. Carhill. How like you! You're never any good. Never any good. Just listen to her. Never any good. Oh, come! Well, you aren't. Miss Schlegel, is he? The torrent of their love, having splashed these drops at Margaret, swept away on its habitual course. She sympathized with it now, for a little comfort had restored her geniality. Speech and silence pleased her equally, and while Mr. Wilcox made some preliminary inquiries about cheese, her eyes surveyed the restaurant— and admired its well-calculated tributes to the solidity of our past. Though no more old English than the works of Kipling, it had selected its reminiscences so adroitly that her criticism was lulled, and the guests whom it was nourishing for imperial purposes bore the outer semblance of Parson Adams or Tom Jones. Scraps of their talk jarred oddly on the ear. "'Right you are. I'll cable it out to Uganda this evening,' came from the table behind. "'Their emperor wants war. Well, let him have it,' was the opinion of a clergyman. She smiled at such incongruities. "'Next time,' she said to Mr. Wilcox, "'you shall come to lunch with me at Mr. Eustace Miles's.' "'With pleasure.' "'No, you'd hate it,' she said, pushing her glass towards him for some more cider. "'It's all proteids and bodybuildings, and people come up to you and beg your pardon, but you have such a beautiful aura.' A what? Never heard of an aura. Oh, happy, happy man! I scrub at mine for hours. Nor of an astral plane? He had heard of astral planes, and censured them. Just so. Luckily it was Helen's aura, not mine, and she had to chaperone it and do the politenesses. I just sat with my handkerchief to my mouth till the man went. <laughs> Funny experiences seem to come to you two girls. No one's ever asked me about my— what do you call it? Perhaps I've not got one. You're bound to have one, but it may be such a terrible colour that no one dares mention it. Tell me, though, Miss Schlegel, do you really believe in the supernatural and all that? Mm, too difficult to question. Why is that? Gruyere or Stilton? Uh, Gruyere, please. Better have Stilton. <laughs> Stilton. Because, though I don't believe in auras, and I think theosophy's only a half-way house, yet there may be something in it all the same," he concluded, with a frown. Not even that. It may be half-way in the wrong direction. I can't explain. I don't believe in all these fads, and yet I don't like saying that I don't believe in them. He seemed unsatisfied, and said, So you wouldn't give me your word that you don't hold with astral bodies and all the rest of it? "'I could,' said Margaret, surprised that the point was of any importance to him. "'Indeed I will. When I talked about scrubbing my aura, I was only trying to be funny. But why do you want this settled?' "'I don't know.' "'Now, Mr. Wilcox, you do know.' "'Yes, I am. No, you're not. 
burst from the lovers opposite. Margaret was silent for a moment, and then changed the subject. "'How's your house?' "'Much the same as when you honoured it last week. I don't mean Ducey Street. Howard's End, of course.' "'Why, of course? Can't you turn out your tenant and let it to us? We're nearly demented.' "'Let me think. I wish I could help you. But I thought you wanted to be in town. One bit of advice. Fix your district, then fix your price, and then don't budge. That's how I got both Ducey Street and Onerton. I said to myself, I mean to be exactly here. And I was. And Onerton's a place in a thousand. But I do budge. Gentlemen seem to mesmerise houses, cow them with an eye, and up they come, trembling. Ladies can't. It's the houses that are mesmerising me. I've no control over the saucy things. Houses are alive. No? I'm out of my depth, he said, and added, Didn't you talk rather like that to your office boy? Did I? I mean, I did, more or less. I talk the same way to every one, or try to. Yes, I know. And how much do you suppose that he understood of it? That's his lookout. I don't believe in suiting my conversation to my company. One can doubtless hit upon some medium of exchange that seems to do well enough, but it's no more like the real thing than money is like food. There's no nourishment in it. You pass it to the lower classes, and they pass it back to you. And this you call social intercourse, or mutual endeavour, when it's mutual priggishness if it's anything. Our friends at Chelsea don't see this. They say one ought to be at all costs intelligible, and sacrifice— "'Lower classes,' interrupt Mr. Wilcox, as it were, thrusting his hand into her speech. "'Well, you do admit that there are rich and poor. That's something.' Margaret could not reply. Was he incredibly stupid, or did he understand her better than she understood herself? "'You do admit that, if wealth was divided up equally, in a few years there would be rich and poor again just the same. The hard-working man would come to the top, the wastrel sink to the bottom. Every one admits that. Your socialists don't. My socialists do. Yours mayn't, but I strongly suspect yours of not being socialists, but nine-pins, which you have constructed for your own amusement. I can't imagine any living creature who would bowl over quite so easily." He would have resented this had she not been a woman. But women may say anything, it was one of his holiest beliefs, and he only retorted with a gay smile, "'I don't care. You've made two damaging admissions, and I'm heartily with you in both.' In time they finished lunch, and Margaret, who had excused herself from the Hippodrome, took her leave. Evie had scarcely addressed her, and she suspected that the entertainment had been planned by the father. He and she were advancing out of their respective families towards a more intimate acquaintance. It had begun long ago. She had been his wife's friend, and as such he had given her that silver vinaigrette as a memento. It was pretty of him to have given that vinaigrette, and he had always preferred her to Helen, unlike most men. But the advance had been astonishing lately. They had done more in a week than in two years, and were really beginning to know each other. She did not forget his promise to sample Eustace Miles, and asked him as soon as she could secure Tibby as his chaperone. He came, and partook of body-building dishes with humility. Next morning the Schlegels left for Swanage. They had not succeeded in finding a new home. End of chapter 17 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 18 As they were seated at Aunt Julie's breakfast-table at the bays, parrying her excessive hospitality and enjoying the view of the bay, a letter came from Margaret and threw her into perturbation. It was from Mr. Wilcox. It announced an important change in his plans. Owing to Evie's marriage, he had decided to give up his house in Ducey Street, and was willing to let it on a yearly tenancy. It was a business-like letter, and stated frankly what he would do for them, and what he would not do. Also, the rent. If they approved, Margaret was to come up at once. The words were underlined, as is necessary when dealing with women, and to go over the house with him. If they disapproved, a wire would oblige, 
as he should put it into the hands of an agent. The letter perturbed, because she was not sure what it meant. If he liked her, if he had manoeuvred to get her to Simpson's, might this be a manoeuvre to get her to London, and result in an offer of marriage? She put it to herself as indelicately as possible, in the hope that her brain would cry, "'Rubbish! You're a self-conscious fool!' But her brain only tingled a little, and was silent, and for a time she sat gazing at the mincing waves, and wondering whether the news would seem strange to the others. As soon as she began speaking, the sound of her own voice reassured her. There could be nothing in it. The replies also were typical, and in the buff of conversation her fears vanished. "'You needn't go, though,' began her hostess. "'I needn't, but hadn't I better? It's really getting rather serious. We let chance after chance slip, and the end of it is that we shall be bundled out bag and baggage into the street. We don't know what we want. That's the mischief with us.' "'No, we have no real ties,' said Helen, helping herself to toast. "'Shan't I go up to town to-day, take the house if it's the least possible, and then come down by the afternoon train to-morrow and start enjoying myself? I shall be no fun to myself or others, until this business is off my mind.' "'But you won't do anything rash, Margaret.' "'There's nothing rash to do.' "'Who are the Wilcoxes?' said Tibby, a question that sounds silly, but was really extremely subtle, as his aunt found to her cost when she tried to answer it. "'I don't manage the Wilcoxes. I don't see where they come in.' "'No more do I,' agreed Helen. "'It's funny that we just don't lose sight of them. Out of all our hotel acquaintances, Mr. Wilcox is the only one who has stuck. It is now over three years, and we have drifted away from far more interesting people in that time.' "'Interesting people don't get one houses. "'Meg, if you start in your honest English vein, I shall throw the treacle at you.' "'It's a better vein than the cosmopolitan,' said Margaret, getting up. "'Now, children, which is it to be? "'You know the Ducie Street house. "'Shall I say yes, or shall I say no?' "'Tibby, love, which? "'I'm specially anxious to pin you down.' Mm, "'It all depends on what meaning you attach to the word possible. It depends on nothing of the sort. Say yes. Say no. Then Margaret spoke rather seriously. I think, she said, that our race is degenerating. We cannot settle even this little thing. What will it be like when we have to settle a big one? It will be as easy as eating, returned Helen. I was thinking of father— How could he settle to leave Germany as he did, when he had fought for it as a young man, and all his feelings and friends were Prussian? How could he break loose with patriotism, and begin aiming at something else? It would have killed me. When he was nearly forty, he could change countries and ideals. And we, at our age, can't change houses. It's humiliating! Your father may have been able to change countries, said Mrs. Munt, with asperity, and that may or may not be a good thing. But he could change houses no better than you can, in fact, much worse. Never shall I forget what poor Emily suffered in the move from Manchester. "'I knew it,' cried Helen. "'I told you so. It is the little things one bungles at. The big, real ones are nothing when they come.' "'Bungle, my dear, you are too little to recollect. In fact, you weren't there.' But the furniture was actually in the vans and on the move before the lease for Wickham Place was signed, and Emily took train with Baby, who was Margaret then, and the smaller luggage for London without so much as knowing where her new home would be. Getting away from that house may be hard, but it is nothing to the misery that we all went through getting you into it. Helen, with her mouth full, cried, And that's the man who beat the Austrians, and the Danes, and the French, and who beat the Germans that were inside himself, and we're like him. "'Speak for yourself,' said Tibby. "'Remember that I am cosmopolitan, please.' Helen may be right. "'Of course she's right,' said Helen. Helen might be right, but she did not go up to London. Margaret did that. An interrupted holiday is the worst of the minor worries, and one may be pardoned for feeling morbid when a business letter snatches one away from the sea and friends. She could not believe that her father had ever felt the same. Her eyes had been troubling her lately, 
so that she could not read in the train, and it bored her to look at the landscape which she had seen but yesterday. At Southampton she waved to Frida. Frida was on her way down to join them at Swanage, and Mrs. Munt had calculated that their trains would cross. But Frida was looking the other way, and Margaret travelled on to town feeling solitary and old-maidish. How like an old maid to fancy that Mr. Wilcox was courting her! She had once visited a spinster, poor, silly, and unattractive, whose mania it was that every man who approached her fell in love. How Margaret's heart had bled for the deluded thing! How she had lectured, reasoned, and in despair acquiesced! "'I may have been deceived by the curate, my dear, but the young fellow who brings the midday post really is fond of me, and has, as a matter of fact—' It had always seemed to her the most hideous corner of old age, yet she might be driven into it herself by the mere pressure of virginity. Mr. Wilcox met her at Waterloo himself. She felt certain that he was not the same as usual. For one thing, he took offence at everything she said. "'This is awfully kind of you,' she began. "'But I'm afraid it's not going to do. The house has not been built that suits the Schlegel family.' "'What? Have you come up determined not to deal?' "'Not exactly.' "'Not exactly. In that case, let's be starting.' She lingered to admire the motor, which was new and a fairer creature than the vermilion giant that had borne Aunt Julie to her doom three years before. "'Presumably it's very beautiful,' she said. "'How do you like it, Crane?' "'Come, let's be starting,' repeated her host. "'How on earth did you know that my chauffeur was called Crane?' "'Why, I know Crane. I've been for a drive with Evie once.' I know that you've got a parlour-maid called Milton. I know all sorts of things." "'Evie,' he echoed in injured tones. "'You won't see her. She's gone out with Carhill. It's no fun, I can tell you, being left so much alone. I've got my work all day, indeed a great deal too much of it, but when I come home in the evening I tell you I can't stand the house." "'In my absurd way I'm lonely, too,' Margaret replied. "'It's heartbreaking to leave one's old home. I scarcely remember anything before Wickham Place, and Helen and Tibby were born there. Helen says, "'You too feel lonely?' "'Horribly. "'Hullo! Parliament's back!' Mr. Wilcox glanced at Parliament contemptuously. The more important ropes of life lay elsewhere. "'Yes, they are talking again,' said he. "'But you were going to say—' "'Only some rubbish about furniture.' Helen says it alone endures while men and houses perish, and that in the end the world will be a desert of chairs and sofas. Just imagine it, rolling through infinity with no one to sit upon them. Your sister always likes a little joke. She says yes, my brother says no, to Ducie Street. It's no fun helping us, Mr. Wilcox, I assure you. You are not as unpractical as you pretend. I shall never believe it. Margaret laughed, but she was quite as unpractical. She could not concentrate on details. Parliament, the Thames, the irresponsive chauffeur, would flash into the field of house-hunting, and all demand some comment or response. It is impossible to see modern life steadily, and see it whole, and she had chosen to see it whole. Mr. Wilcox saw steadily. He never bothered over the mysterious or the private. The Thames might run inland from the sea, the chauffeur might conceal all passion and philosophy beneath his unhealthy skin. They knew their own business, and he knew his. Yet she liked being with him. He was not a rebuke, but a stimulus, and banished morbidity. Some twenty years her senior, he preserved a gift that she supposed herself to have already lost, not youth's creative power, but its self-confidence and optimism. He was so sure that it was a very pleasant world. His complexion was robust, his hair had receded but not thinned, the thick moustache and the eyes that Helen had compared to brandy-balls had an agreeable menace in them, whether they were turned towards the slums or towards the stars. Some day, in the millennium, there may be no need for his type. At present, homage is due to it from those who think themselves superior, and who possibly are. "'At all events, you responded to my telegram promptly,' he remarked. "'Oh, even I know a good thing when I see it. "'I'm glad you don't despise the goods of this world.' "'Heavens, no! 
Only idiots and prigs do that. I am glad, very glad, he repeated, suddenly softening and turning to her, as if the remark had pleased him. There is so much cant talked in would-be intellectual circles. I am glad you don't share it. Self-denial is all very well as a means of strengthening the character. But I can't stand those people who run down comforts. They usually have some axe to grind. Can you? Comforts are of two kinds," said Margaret, who was keeping herself in hand. Those we can share with others, like fire, weather, or music, and those we can't. Food, for instance. It depends. I mean reasonable comforts, of course. I shouldn't like to think that you— He bent nearer. The sentence died unfinished. Margaret's head turned very stupid, and the inside of it seemed to revolve like the beacon in a lighthouse. He did not kiss her, for the hour was half-past twelve, and the car was passing by the stables of Buckingham Palace. But the atmosphere was so charged with emotion that people only seemed to exist on her account, and she was surprised that Crane did not realize this and turn round. Idiot though she might be, surely Mr. Wilcox was more—how should one put it—more psychological than usual. Always a good judge of character for business purposes. He seemed this afternoon to enlarge his field, and to note qualities outside neatness, obedience, and decision. "'I want to go over the whole house,' she announced when they arrived. "'As soon as I get back to Swanage, which will be to-morrow afternoon, I'll talk it over once more with Helen and Tibby, and why are you yes or no?' "'Right. The dining-room.' And they began their survey. The dining-room was big, but over-furnished. Chelsea would have moaned aloud. Mr. Wilcox had eschewed those decorative schemes that wince, and relent, and refrain, and achieve beauty by sacrificing comfort and pluck. After so much self-color and self-denial, Margaret viewed with relief the sumptuous dado, the frieze, the gilded wallpaper, amid whose foliage parrots sang. It would never do with her own furniture, but those heavy chairs, that immense sideboard loaded with presentation plate, stood up against its pressure like men. The room suggested men, and Margaret, keen to derive the modern capitalist from the warriors and hunters of the past, saw it as an ancient guest-hall, where the Lord sat at meat among his thanes. Even the Bible, the Dutch Bible that Charles had brought back from the Boer War, fell into position. Such a room admitted loot. Now the entrance hall. The entrance hall was paved. Here we fellows smoke. We fellows smoked in chairs of maroon leather. It was as if a motor-car had spawned. "'Oh, jolly!' said Margaret, sinking into one of them. "'You do like it,' he said, fixing his eyes on her upturned face, and surely betraying an almost intimate note. "'It's all rubbish not making oneself comfortable, isn't it?' "'Yes, semi-rubbish. Are those Crookshanks?' "'Gilray's. Shall we go on upstairs? Does all this furniture come from Howard's End? The Howard's End furniture has all gone to Oniton. Does, however, I am concerned with the house, not the furniture. How big is this smoking room? Thirty by fifteen. No, wait a minute. Fifteen and a half. Ah, oh, well, Mister Wilcox, aren't you ever amused at the solemnity with which we middle classes approach the subject of houses? They proceeded to the drawing-room. Chelsea managed better here. It was sallow and ineffective. One could visualize the ladies withdrawing to it, while their lords discussed life's realities below to the accompaniment of cigars. Had Mrs. Wilcox's drawing-room looked thus at Howard's end? Just as this thought entered Margaret's brain, Mr. Wilcox did ask her to be his wife, and the knowledge that she had been right so overcame her that she nearly fainted. But the proposal was not to rank among the world's great love-scenes. "'Miss Schlegel,' his voice was firm, "'I have had you up on false pretenses. I want to speak about a much more serious matter than a house.' Margaret almost answered, "'I know.' "'Could you be induced to share my—' "'Is it probable?' "'Oh, Mr. Wilcox,' she interrupted, holding the piano and averting her eyes. I see, I see, I will write to you afterwards, if I may. He began to stammer. 
Miss Schlegel, uh, Margaret, you don't understand. Oh, yes, indeed, yes, said Margaret. I am asking you to be my wife. So deep already was her sympathy, that when he said, I am asking you to be my wife, she made herself give a little start. She must show surprise if he expected it. An immense joy came over her. It was indescribable. It had nothing to do with humanity, and most resembled the all-pervading happiness of fine weather. Fine weather is due to the sun, but Margaret could think of no central radiance here. She stood in his drawing-room happy, and longing to give happiness. On leaving him, she realized that the central radiance had been love. "'You aren't offended, Miss Schlegel?' "'How could I be offended?' There was a moment's pause. He was anxious to get rid of her, and she knew it. She had too much intuition to look at him as he struggled for possessions that money cannot buy. He desired comradeship and affection, but he feared them, and she, who had taught herself only to desire, and could have clothed the struggle with beauty, held back, and hesitated with him. "'Good-bye,' she continued. "'You will have a letter from me. I am going back to Swanage to-morrow.' "'Thank you.' "'Good-bye, and it's you, I thank.' "'I may order the motor round, mayn't I?' "'That would be most kind.' "'I wish I had written instead. Ought I to have written?' "'Not at all.' "'There's just one question.' She shook her head. He looked a little bewildered, and they parted. They parted without shaking hands. She had kept the interview, for his sake, in tints of the quietest grey yet she thrilled with happiness ere she reached her own house. Others had loved her in the past, if one may apply to their brief desires so grave a word, but those others had been ninnies, young men who had nothing better to do, old men who could find nobody better. And she had often loved, too, but only so far as the facts of sex demanded, mere yearnings for the masculine, to be dismissed for what they were worth with a smile. Never before had her personality been touched. She was not young, or very rich, and it amazed her that a man of any standing should take her seriously. As she sat trying to do accounts in her empty house, amidst beautiful pictures and noble books, waves of emotion broke, as if a tide of passion was flowing through the night air. She shook her head, tried to concentrate her attention, and failed. In vain did she repeat— but I've been through this sort of thing before." She had never been through it. The big machinery, as opposed to the little, had been set in motion, and the idea that Mr. Wilcox loved obsessed her before she came to love him in return. She would come to no decision yet. "'Oh, sir, this is so sudden!' That prudish phrase exactly expressed her when her time came. Premonitions are not preparation. She must examine more closely her own nature and his. She must talk it over judicially with Helen. It had been a strange love scene, the central radiance unacknowledged from first to last. She, in his place, would have said, Ich liebe dich, but perhaps it was not his habit to open the heart. He might have done it if she had pressed him, as a matter of duty, perhaps. England expects every man to open his heart once— but the effort would have jarred him, and never, if she could avoid it, should he lose those defences that he had chosen to raise against the world. He must never be bothered with emotional talk, or with a display of sympathy. He was an elderly man now, and it would be futile and impudent to correct him. Mrs. Wilcox strayed in and out, ever a welcome ghost, surveying the scene, thought Margaret, without one hint of bitterness. End of chapter 18 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 19 If one wanted to show a foreigner England, perhaps the wisest course would be to take him to the final section of the Purbeck Hills, and stand him on their summit, a few miles to the east of Corfe. Then system after system of our island would roll together under his feet. Beneath him is the valley of the Frome, and all the wild lands that come tossing down from Dorchester, black and gold, to mirror their gorse in the expanses of pool. 
The valley of the store is beyond, unaccountable stream, dirty at Blandford, pure at Wimborne, the store sliding out of fat fields to marry the Avon beneath the tower of Christchurch. The valley of the Avon, invisible, but far to the north the trained eye may see Clearbury Ring that guards it, and the imagination may leap beyond that on to Salisbury Plain itself, and beyond the plain to all the glorious downs of central England. Nor is suburbia absent. Bournemouth's ignoble coast cowers to the right, heralding the pine-trees that mean, for all their beauty, red houses and the stock exchange, and extend to the gates of London itself. So tremendous is the city's trail. But the cliffs of fresh water it shall never touch, and the island will guard the island's purity till the end of time. Seen from the west, the white is beautiful beyond all laws of beauty. It is as if a fragment of England floated forward to greet the foreigner, chalk of our chalk, turf of our turf, epitome of what will follow. And behind the fragment lies Southampton, hostess to the nations, and Portsmouth, a latent fire, and all around it, with double and treble collision of tides, swirls the sea. How many villages appear in this view! How many castles! How many churches, vanished or triumphant! How many ships, railways, and roads! What incredible variety of men working beneath that lucent sky to what final end! The reason fails, like a wave on the Swanage beach. The imagination swells, spreads, and deepens, until it becomes geographic, and encircles England. So Frieda Mosbach, now Frau Architect Liesig, and mother to her husband's baby, was brought up to these heights to be impressed, and after a prolonged gaze, she said that the hills were more swelling here than in Pomerania, which was true, but did not seem to Mrs. Munt apposite. Pool Harbour was dry, which led her to praise the absence of muddy foreshore at the Friedrich Wilhelmsbad, Rugen, where beech-trees hang over the tideless Baltic, and cows may contemplate the brine. Rather unhealthy, Mrs. Munt thought this would be, water being safer when it moved about. "'And your English lakes, Windermere, Grasmere, are they then unhealthy?' "'No, Frau Liesig, but that is because they are fresh water and different. Salt water ought to have tides, and go up and down a great deal, or else it smells. Look, for instance, at an aquarium. An aquarium? Oh, Mrs. Munt! You mean to tell me that fresh aquariums stink less than salt? Why, when Victor, my brother-in-law, collected many tadpoles— You are not to say stink, interrupted Helen. At least you may say it, but you must pretend you are being funny while you say it. Then smell— and the mud of your pool down there, does it not smell, or may I say, stink, ha-ha? There always has been mud in Pool Harbour, said Mrs. Munt, with a slight frown. The rivers bring it down, and a most valuable oyster fishery depends upon it. Yes, that is so, conceded Frida, and another international incident was closed. Bournemouth is— resumed their hostess, quoting a local rhyme to which she was much attached. "'Bournemouth is, pool was, and Swanage is to be the most important town of all, and biggest of the three. "'Now, Frau Liesig, I have shown you Bournemouth, and I have shown you pool, so let us walk backward a little, and look down again at Swanage.' "'Aunt Julie, wouldn't that be Meg's train?' A tiny puff of smoke had been circling the harbour, and now was bearing southwards towards them over the black and the gold. "'Oh, dearest Margaret, I do hope she won't be overtired.' "'Oh, I do wonder. I do wonder whether she's taken the house. I hope she hasn't been hasty.' "'So do I. Oh, so do I.' "'Will it be as beautiful as we can place?' Frida asked. I should think it would. Trust Mr. Wilcox for doing himself proud. All those Ducie Street houses are beautiful in their modern way, and I can't think why he doesn't keep on with it. But it's really for Evie that he went there, 
And now that Evie's going to be married— Ah! You've never seen Miss Wilcox, Frida. How absurdly matrimonial you are! But sister to that Paul! Yes. And to that Charles, said Mrs. Munt, with feeling. Oh, Helen! Helen, what a time that was! Helen laughed. Meg and I haven't got such tender hearts. If there's a chance of a cheap house, we go for it. Now look, Frau Liesig, at my niece's train. You see, it is coming towards us, coming, coming, and when it gets to cough, it will actually go through the downs on which we are standing, so that, if we walk over, as I suggested, and look down on Swanage, we shall see it coming on the other side. Shall we? Frida assented, and in a few minutes they had crossed the ridge and exchanged the greater view for the lesser. Rather a dull valley lay below backed by the slope of the coastward downs. They were looking across the Isle of Purbeck and on to Swanage, soon to be the most important town of all, and the ugliest of the three. Margaret's train reappeared as promised, and was greeted with approval by her aunt. It came to a standstill in the middle distance, and there it had been planned that Tibby should meet her, and drive her and a tea-basket up to join them. "'You see,' continued Helen to her cousin, the Wilcoxes collect houses as your victor collects tadpoles. They have one, Ducey Street, two, Howard's End, where my great rumpus was, three, a country seat in Shropshire, four, Charles has a house in Hilton, and five, another near Epsom, and six, Evie will have a house when she marries, and probably a pied à terre in the country, which makes seven. Oh, yes, and Paul, a hut in Africa, makes eight. I wish we could get Howard's End— that was something like a dear little house. Didn't you think so, Aunt Julie? "'I had too much to do, dear, to look at it,' said Mrs. Munt, with a gracious dignity. "'I had everything to settle and explain, and Charles Wilcox to keep in his place, besides. It isn't likely I should remember much. I just remember having lunch in your bedroom.' "'Yes, so do I. But, oh, dear, dear, how dead it all seems!' And in the autumn there began this anti-Pauline movement, you and Frida and Meg and Mrs. Wilcox, all obsessed with the idea that I might yet marry Paul. "'You yet may,' said Frida despondently. Helen shook her head. "'The great Wilcox peril will never return. If I'm certain of anything, it's of that.' "'One is certain of nothing but the truth of one's own emotions.' The remark fell damply on the conversation. But Helen slipped her arm round her cousin, somehow liking her the better for making it. It was not an original remark. Nor had Frida appropriated it passionately, for she had a patriotic rather than a philosophic mind. Yet it betrayed that interest in the universal which the average Teuton possesses, and the average Englishman does not. It was, however illogically, the good, the beautiful, the true, as opposed to the respectable, the pretty, the adequate. It was a landscape of Bocklands, beside a landscape of Laders, strident and ill-considered, but quivering into supernatural life. It sharpened idealism, stirred the soul. It may have been a bad preparation for what followed. "'Look!' cried Aunt Julie, hurrying away from generalities over the narrow summit of the down. Stand where I stand, and you will see the pony-cart coming. I see the pony-cart coming. They stood and saw the pony-cart coming. Margaret and Tibby were presently seen coming in it. Leaving the outskirts of Swanage, it drove for a little through the budding lanes, and then began the ascent. "'Have you got the house?' they shouted, long before she could possibly hear. Helen ran down to meet her. The high road passed over a saddle— and a track went thence at right angles along the ridge of the down. "'Have you got the house?' Margaret shook her head. "'Oh, what a nuisance! So we are as we were.' "'Not exactly.' She got out, looking tired. "'Some mystery,' said Tibby. "'We are to be enlightened presently.' Margaret came close up to her, and whispered that she had had a proposal of marriage from Mr. Wilcox. Helen was amused. 
She opened the gate on to the downs so that her brother might lead the pony through. "'It's just like a widower,' she remarked. "'They've cheek enough for anything, and invariably select one of their first wives' friends.' Margaret's face flashed despair. "'That type—' She broke off with a cry. "'Meg, not anything wrong with you.' "'Wait one minute,' said Margaret, whispering always. "'But you've never conceivably—you've never—' She pulled herself together. "'Tibby, hurry up through. I can't hold this gate indefinitely. "'Aunt Julie! I say, Aunt Julie, make the tea, will you, and Frida— "'We've got to talk houses, and I'll come on afterwards.' And then, turning her face to her sisters, she burst into tears. Margaret was stupefied. She heard herself saying, "'Oh, really?' She felt herself touched with a hand that trembled. "'Don't!' sobbed Helen. "'Don't! Don't, Meg! Don't!' She seemed incapable of saying any other word. Margaret, trembling herself, led her forward up the road, till they strayed through another gate on to the down. "'Don't! Don't do such a thing! I tell you not to! Don't! I know! Don't!' "'What do you know?' "'Panic and emptiness,' sobbed Helen. "'Don't!' Then Margaret thought, "'Helen is a little selfish. I have never behaved like this when there has seemed a chance of her marrying.' She said, "'But we would still see each other very often, and—' "'It's not a thing like that!' sobbed Helen. And she broke right away, and wandered distractedly upwards, stretching her hands towards the view, and crying. "'What's happened to you?' called Margaret, following through the wind that gathers at sundown on the northern slopes of hills. "'But it's stupid!' And suddenly stupidity seized her— and the immense landscape was blurred. But Helen turned back. "'Meg! I don't know what's happened to either of us,' said Margaret, wiping her eyes. "'We must both have gone mad!' Then Helen wiped hers, and they even laughed a little. "'Look here, sit down.' "'All right. I'll sit down, if you'll sit down. There. One kiss. "'Now whatever, whatever is the matter?' I do mean what I said. Don't. It wouldn't do. Oh, Helen, stop saying don't. It's ignorant. It's as if your head wasn't out of the slime. Don't is probably what Mrs. Bast says all the day to Mr. Bast. Helen was silent. Well? Tell me about it first. And meanwhile, perhaps, I'll have got my head out of the slime. That's better. Well, where shall I begin? When I arrived at Waterloo—no, I'll go back before that, because I'm anxious you should know everything from the first. The first was about ten days ago. It was the day Mr. Bast came to tea and lost his temper. I was defending him, and Mr. Wilcox became jealous about me, however slightly. I thought it was the involuntary thing, which men can't help any more than we can. You know, at least I know in my own case, when a man has said to me— so-and-so's a pretty girl. I am seized with a momentary sourness against so-and-so, and long to tweak her ear. It's a tiresome feeling, but not an important one, and one easily manages it. But it wasn't only this in Mr. Wilcox's case, I gather now. Then you love him? Margaret considered. It is wonderful knowing that a real man cares for you, she said. The mere fact of that grows more tremendous. Remember, I've known and liked him steadily for nearly three years. But loved him? Margaret peered into her past. It is pleasant to analyse feelings while they are still only feelings, and unembodied in the social fabric. With her arm round Helen, and her eyes shifting over the view, as if this county or that could reveal the secret of her own heart, she meditated honestly, and said, No. "'But you will?' "'Yes,' said Margaret. "'Of that I'm pretty sure. "'Indeed, I began the moment he spoke to me.' "'And have settled to marry him. "'I had, but am wanting a long talk about it now. "'What is it against him, Helen? "'You must try and say.' "'Helen, in her turn, looked outwards. 
"'It is ever since Paul,' she said finally. "'But what has Mr. Wilcox to do with Paul?' "'But he was there. They were all there that morning when I came down to breakfast, and saw that Paul was frightened, the man who loved me frightened, and all his paraphernalia fallen, so that I knew it was impossible, because personal relations are the most important thing for ever and ever, and not this outer life of telegrams and anger.' She poured the sentence forth in one breath, but her sister understood it, because it touched on thoughts that were familiar between them. "'That's foolish. In the first place, I disagree about the outer life. Well, we've often argued that. The real point is that there is the widest gulf between my love-making and yours. Yours was romance. Mine will be prose. I'm not running it down, a very good kind of prose but well considered, well thought out. For instance, I know all Mr. Wilcox's faults. He's afraid of emotion. He cares too much about success, too little about the past. His sympathy lacks poetry, and so isn't sympathy, really. I'd even say—she looked at the shining lagoons—that spiritually he's not as honest as I am. Doesn't that satisfy you? No, it doesn't said Helen. It makes me feel worse and worse. You must be mad. Margaret made a movement of irritation. I don't intend him, or any man, or any woman, to be all my life. Good heavens, no. There are heaps of things in me that he doesn't, and shall never understand. Thus she spoke before the wedding ceremony and the physical union, before the astonishing glass shade had fallen that interposes between married couples in the world. She was to keep her independence more than do most women as yet. Marriage was to alter her fortunes rather than her character, and she was not far wrong in boasting that she understood her future husband. Yet he did alter her character, a little. There was an unforeseen surprise, a cessation of the winds and odours of life, a social pressure that would have her think conjugally. "'So with him,' she continued, "'there are heaps of things in him.' more especially things that he does, that will always be hidden from me. He has all those public qualities which you so despise and enable all this." She waved her hand at the landscape, which confirmed anything. "'If Wilcoxes hadn't worked and died in England for thousands of years, you and I couldn't sit here without having our throats cut. There would be no trains, no ships to carry us literary people about in, no fields even, just savagery. No, perhaps not even that. Without their spirit, life might never have moved out of protoplasm. More and more do I refuse to draw my income and sneer at those who guarantee it. There are times when it seems to me, and to me, and to all women, so one kissed Paul. That's brutal, said Margaret. Mine is an absolutely different case. I've thought things out. It makes no difference thinking things out. They come to the same. Rubbish! There was a long silence, during which the tide returned into Pool Harbor. One would lose something, murmured Helen, apparently to herself. The water crept over the mud flats towards the gorse and the blackened heather. Branksy Island lost its immense foreshores, and became a sombre episode of trees. Frome was forced inward towards Dorchester, Storr against Wimborne, Avon towards Salisbury, and over the immense displacement the sun presided, leading it to triumph ere he sank to rest. England was alive, throbbing through all her estuaries, crying for joy through the mouths of all her gulls, and the north wind, with contrary motion, blew stronger against her rising seas. What did it mean? For what end are her fair complexities, her changes of soil, her sinuous coast? Does she belong to those who have moulded her and made her feared by other lands, or to those who have added nothing to her power, but have somehow seen her, seen the whole island at once, lying as a jewel in a silver sea, sailing as a ship of souls, with all the brave world's fleet accompanying her towards eternity? End of chapter 19 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End 
by E. M. Forster. Chapter 20 Margaret had often wondered at the disturbance that takes place in the world's waters, when love, who seems so tiny a pebble, slips in. Whom does love concern beyond the beloved and the lover? Yet his impact deluges a hundred shores. No doubt the disturbance is really the spirit of the generations, welcoming the new generation, and chafing against the ultimate fate, who holds all the seas in the palm of her hand. But love cannot understand this. He cannot comprehend another's infinity. He is conscious only of his own, flying sunbeam, falling rose, pebble that asks for one quiet plunge below the fretting interplay of space and time. He knows that he will survive at the end of things, and be gathered by fate as a jewel from the slime, and be handed with admiration round the assembly of the gods. Men did produce this, they will say, and saying they will give men immortality. But meanwhile, what agitations meanwhile! The foundations of property and propriety are laid bare, twin rocks. Family pride flounders to the surface, puffing and blowing, and refusing to be comforted. Theology, vaguely ascetic, gets up a nasty groundswell. Then the lawyers are aroused, cold brood, and creep out of their holes. They do what they can. They tidy up property and propriety, reassure theology and family pride. Half guineas are poured on the troubled waters, the lawyers creep back. And if all has gone well, love joins one man and woman together in matrimony. Margaret had expected the disturbance, and was not irritated by it. For a sensitive woman she had steady nerves, and could bear with the incongruous and the grotesque. And besides, there was nothing excessive about her love affair. Good humour was the dominant note of her relations with Mr. Wilcox, or, as I must now call him, Henry. Henry did not encourage romance, and she was no girl to fidget for it. An acquaintance had become a lover, might become a husband, but would retain all that she had noted in the acquaintance, and love must confirm an old relation, rather than reveal a new one. In this spirit she promised to marry him. He was in Swanage on the morrow, bearing the engagement ring. They greeted one another with a hearty cordiality that impressed Aunt Julie. Henry dined at the Bays, but he had engaged a bedroom in the principal hotel. He was one of those men who knew the principal hotel by instinct. After dinner he asked Margaret if she wouldn't care for a turn on the parade. She accepted, and could not repress a little tremor. It would be her first real love scene. But as she put on her hat she burst out laughing. Love was so unlike the article served up in books. The joy, though genuine, was different the mystery an unexpected mystery. For one thing, Mr. Wilcox still seemed a stranger. For a time they talked about the ring. Then she said, "'Do you remember the embankment at Chelsea? It can't be ten days ago.' "'Yes,' he said, laughing. "'And you and your sister were head and ears deep in some quixotic scheme. Ah, well.' "'I little thought then, certainly. Did you?' I don't know about that. I shouldn't like to say. Why, was it earlier? she cried. Did you think of me this way earlier? How extraordinarily interesting, Henry, tell me. But Henry had no intention of telling. Perhaps he could not have told, for his mental states became obscure as soon as he had passed through them. He misliked the very word interesting, connoting it with wasted energy and even with morbidity. Hard facts were enough for him. I didn't think of it, she pursued. No, when you spoke to me in the drawing-room, that was practically the first. It was all so different from what it's supposed to be. On the stage, or in books, a proposal is—how shall I put it? A full-blown affair, a kind of bouquet. It loses its literal meaning. But in life, a proposal really is a proposal. By the way— A suggestion, a seed, she concluded and the thought flew away into darkness. "'I was thinking, if you didn't mind, that we ought to spend this evening in a business talk. There will be so much to settle.' "'I think so, too. Tell me, in the first place, how did you get on with Tibby?' "'With your brother?' "'Yes, during cigarettes.' "'Oh, very well.' "'I am so glad,' 
she answered, a little surprised. "'What did you talk about?' "'Me, presumably.' "'About Greece, too.' "'Greece was a very good card, Henry. Tibby's only a boy still, and one has to pick and choose subjects a little. Well done.' I was telling him I have shares in a currant farm near Kalamata. What a delightful thing to have shares in! Can't we go there for our honeymoon? What to do? To eat the currants. And isn't there marvellous scenery? Moderately, but it's not the kind of place one could possibly go to with a lady. Why not? No hotels. Some ladies do without hotels. Are you aware that Helen and I have walked alone over the Apennines, with our luggage on our backs? I wasn't aware, and if I can manage it, you will never do such a thing again." She said more gravely, "'You haven't found time for a talk with Helen yet, I suppose?' "'No.' "'Do, before you go. I am so anxious you two should be friends.' "'Your sister and I have always hit it off,' he said negligently. "'But we're drifting away from our business. Let me begin at the beginning. You know that Evie is going to marry Percy Carhill. Dolly's uncle. Exactly. The girl's madly in love with him. A very good sort of fellow. But he demands, and rightly, a suitable provision with her. And in the second place, you will naturally understand, there is Charles. Before leaving town, I wrote Charles a very careful letter. You see, he has an increasing family, and increasing expenses— and the I and W.A. is nothing particular just now, though capable of development." "'Poor fellow!' murmured Margaret, looking out to sea, and not understanding. "'Charles being the elder son, some day Charles will have Howard's end. But I am anxious, in my own happiness, not to be unjust to others.' "'Of course not,' she began, and then gave a little cry. "'You mean money! How stupid I am! Of course not!' Oddly enough, he winced a little at the word. "'Yes, money, since you put it so frankly. I am determined to be just to all. Just to you, just to them. I am determined that my children shall have no case against me.' "'Be generous to them,' she said sharply. "'Bother justice!' "'I am determined, and have already written to Charles to that effect. But how much have you got?' "'What?' "'How much have you got a year?' I've six hundred. My income? Yes. We must begin with how much you have, before we can settle on how much you can give Charles. Justice and even generosity depend on that." "'I must say, you're a downright young woman,' he observed, patting her arm and laughing a little. What a question to spring on a fellow! Don't you know your income? Or don't you want to tell it me? I— That's all right. Now she patted him. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. I can do the sum just as well by proportion. Divide your income into ten parts. How many parts would you give to Evie? How many to Charles? How many to Paul? The fact is, my dear, I hadn't any intention of bothering you with details. I only wanted to let you know that—well, that something must be done for the others. And you've understood me perfectly. So let's pass on to the next point. Yes, we've settled that said Margaret, undisturbed by his strategic blunderings. "'Go ahead. Give away all you can, bearing in mind I've a clear six hundred. "'What a mercy it is to have all this money about one!' "'We've none too much, I assure you. You're marrying a poor man.' "'Helen wouldn't agree with me here,' she continued. "'Helen daren't slang the rich, being rich herself, but she would like to. There's an odd notion that I haven't yet got a hold of running about at the back of her brain, that poverty is somehow real. She dislikes all organization, and probably confuses wealth with the technique of wealth. Sovereigns in a stocking wouldn't bother her. Checks do. Helen is too relentless. One can't deal in her high-handed manner with the world. There's this other point, and then I must go back to my hotel and write some letters. What's to be done now about the house in Ducey Street? Keep it on. At least, it depends. When do you want to marry me?" She raised her voice, as too often, and some youths who were also taking the evening air, overheard her. "'Getting a bit hot, eh?' said one. Mr. Wilcox turned on them, and said sharply, "'I say!' There was silence. 
"'Take care I don't report you to the police!' They moved away quietly enough, but were only biding their time, and the rest of the conversation was punctuated by peals of ungovernable laughter. Lowering his voice and infusing a hint of reproof into it, he said, "'Evie will probably be married in September. We could scarcely think of anything before then.' "'The earlier the nicer, Henry. Females are not supposed to say such things, but the earlier the nicer.' "'How about September for us, too?' he asked, rather dryly. "'Right. Shall we go into Ducey Street ourselves in September? Or shall we try to bounce Helen and Tibby into it? That's rather an idea. They are so unbusinesslike. We could make them do anything by judicious management. Look here, yes, we'll do that. And we ourselves could live at Howard's End or Shropshire. He blew out his cheeks. Heavens, how you women do fly round! My head's in a whirl! Point by point, Margaret, Howard's End's impossible. I let it to Hamar Bryce on a three years' agreement last March. Don't you remember? Oniton, well, that is much, much too far away to rely on entirely. You will be able to be down there entertaining a certain amount, but we must have a house within easy reach of town. Only Ducey Street has huge drawbacks. There's a muse behind. Margaret could not help laughing. It was the first she had heard of the muse behind Ducey Street. When she was a possible tenant, it had suppressed itself, not consciously, but automatically. The breezy Wilcox manner, though genuine, lacked the clearness of vision that is imperative for truth. When Henry lived in Ducey Street, he remembered the Muse. When he tried to let, he forgot it. And if any one had remarked that the Muse must be either there or not, he would have felt annoyed, and afterwards have found some opportunity of stigmatizing the speaker as academic. So does my grocer stigmatize me when I complain of the quality of his sultanas and he answers in one breath that they are the best sultanas, and how can I expect the best sultanas at that price? It is a flaw inherent in the business mind, and Margaret may do well to be tender to it, considering all the business mind has done for England. Yes, in summer especially, the muse is a serious nuisance. The smoking-room, too, is an abominable little den. The house opposite has been taken by operatic people— Ducey Street's going down. It's my private opinion. How sad! It's only a few years since they built those pretty houses. So things are moving. Good for trade. I hate this continual flux of London. It is an epitome of us at our worst. Eternal formlessness. All the qualities, good, bad, and indifferent, streaming away. Streaming, streaming for ever. That's why I dread it so. I mistrust rivers, even in scenery. Now the sea— High tide, yes. Hoy toyed, from the promenading youths. And these are the men to whom we give the vote, observed Mr. Wilcox, omitting to add that they were also the men to whom he gave work as clerks, work that scarcely encouraged them to grow into other men. However, they have their own lives and interests. Let's get on. He turned as he spoke, and prepared to see her back to the bays. The business was over. His hotel was in the opposite direction, and if he accompanied her, his letters would be late for the post. She implored him not to come, but he was obdurate. A nice beginning, if your aunt saw you slip in alone. But I always do go about alone. Considering I've walked over the Apennines, it's common sense. You will make me so angry. I don't the least take it as a compliment. He laughed and lit a cigar. It isn't meant as a compliment, my dear. I just won't have you going about in the dark. Such people about, too. It's dangerous. Can't I look after myself? I do wish. Come along, Margaret, no wheedling. A younger woman might have resented his masterly ways, but Margaret had too firm a grip of life to make a fuss. She was, in her own way, as masterly. If he was a fortress, she was a mountain peak, whom all might tread, but whom the snows made nightly virginal. Disdaining the heroic outfit, excitable in her methods, garrulous, episodical, shrill, she misled her lover much as she had misled her aunt. He mistook her fertility for weakness. He supposed her as clever as they make em, but no more, not realizing that she was penetrating to the depths of his soul, and approving of what she found there. And if insight were sufficient, if the inner life were the whole of life, their happiness has been assured. They walked ahead briskly. 
The parade and the road after it were well lighted, but it was darker in Aunt Julie's garden. As they were going up by the side paths, through some rhododendrons, Mr. Wilcox, who was in front, said, Margaret, rather huskily, turned, dropped his cigar, and took her in his arms. She was startled and nearly screamed, but recovered herself at once, and kissed with genuine love the lips that were pressed against her own. It was their first kiss, and when it was over he saw her safely to the door and rang the bell for her, but disappeared into the night before the maid answered it. On looking back the incident displeased her. It was so isolated. Nothing in their previous conversation had heralded it, and worse still, no tenderness had ensued. If a man cannot lead up to passion, he can, at all events, lead down from it, and she had hoped, after her complacence, for some interchange of gentle words. But he had hurried away as if ashamed, and for an instant she was reminded of Helen and Paul. End of chapter 20 Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 21 Charles had just been scolding his dolly. She deserved the scolding, and had bent before it, but her head, though bloody, was unsubdued, and her chirrupings began to mingle with his retreating thunder. "'You've woken the baby. I knew you would. rumty foo rackety tackety tomkin "'I'm not responsible for what Uncle Percy does, nor for anybody else or anything, so there!' "'Who asked him while I was away? Who asked my sister down to meet him? Who sent them out in the moat day after day?' "'Charles, that reminds me of some poem.' "'Does it, indeed? We shall all be dancing to a very different music presently. Miss Schlegel has fairly got us on toast.' "'I could simply scratch that woman's eyes out. And to say it's my fault is most unfair. It's your fault, and five months ago you admitted it. I didn't. You did. Toodle, toodle, playing on the poodle, exclaimed Dolly, suddenly devoting herself to the child. It's all very well to turn the conversation, but father would never have dreamt of marrying as long as Evie was there to make him comfortable. But you must needs start matchmaking. Besides, Carhill's too old. "'Of course, if you're going to be rude to Uncle Percy. "'Miss Schlegel always meant to get hold of Howard's End, "'and thanks to you she's got it. "'I call the way you twist things round "'and make them hang together most unfair. "'You couldn't have been nastier if you'd caught me flirting. "'Could he, diddums? "'We're in a bad hole, and must make the best of it. "'I shall answer the pater's letter civilly. "'He's evidently anxious to do the decent thing.' But I do not intend to forget these Schlegels in a hurry. As long as they're on their best behaviour. Dolly, are you listening? We'll behave, too. But if I find them giving themselves airs, or monopolising my father, or at all ill-treating him, or worrying him with their artistic beastliness, I intend to put my foot down, yes, firmly, taking my mother's place. Heaven knows what poor old Paul will say when the news reaches him. The interlude closes. It has taken place in Charles's garden at Hilton. He and Dolly are sitting in deck-chairs, and their motor is regarding them placidly from its garage across the lawn. A short-frocked edition of Charles also regards them placidly. A perambulator edition is squeaking. A third edition is expected shortly. Nature is turning out Wilcoxes in this peaceful abode, so that they may inherit the earth. End of chapter 21 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 22 Margaret greeted her lord with peculiar tenderness on the morrow. Mature as he was, she might yet be able to help him to the building of the rainbow bridge that should connect the prose in us with the passion. Without it we are meaningless fragments, half-monks, half-beasts, unconnected arches that have never joined into a man. With it love is born, and alights on the highest curve, glowing against the grey, sober against the fire. Happy the man who sees from either aspect the glory of these outspread wings. 
the roads of his soul lie clear, and he and his friends shall find easy going. It was hard going in the roads of Mr. Wilcox's soul. From boyhood he had neglected them. I am not a fellow who bothers about my own inside. Outwardly he was cheerful, reliable, and brave, but within all had reverted to chaos, ruled, so far as it was ruled at all, by an incomplete asceticism. Whether as boy, husband, or widower, he had always the sneaking belief that bodily passion is bad, a belief that is desirable only when held passionately. Religion had confirmed him. The words that were read aloud on Sunday to him, and to other respectable men, were the words that had once kindled the souls of St. Catherine and St. Francis into a white-hot hatred of the carnal. He could not be as the saints, and love the infinite with a seraphic ardor, but he could be a little ashamed of loving a wife. Amabat, amare timabat. And it was here that Margaret hoped to help him. It did not seem so difficult. She need trouble him with no gift of her own. She would only point out the salvation that was latent in his own soul, and in the soul of every man. Only connect. That was the whole of her sermon. Only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its height. Live in fragments no longer. Only connect, and the beast and the monk, robbed of the isolation that is life to either, will die. Nor was the message difficult to give. It need not take the form of a good talking. By quiet indications the bridge would be built and span their lives with beauty. But she failed. For there was one quality in Henry for which she was never prepared, however much she reminded herself of it, his obtuseness. He simply did not notice things, and there was no more to be said. He never noticed that Helen and Frida were hostile, or that Tibby was not interested in current plantations. He never noticed the lights and shades that exist in the grayest conversation, the finger-posts, the milestones, the collisions, the illimitable views. Once, on another occasion, she scolded him about it. He was puzzled, but replied with a laugh, "'My motto is concentrate. I've no intention of frittering away my strength on that sort of thing.' "'It isn't frittering away the strength,' she protested. "'It's enlarging the space in which you may be strong.' He answered, "'You're a clever little woman, but my motto's concentrate.' And this morning he concentrated with a vengeance. They met in the rhododendrons of yesterday. In the daylight the bushes were inconsiderable, and the path was bright in the morning sun. She was with Helen, who had been ominously quiet since the affair was settled. "'Here we all are!' she cried, and took him by one hand, retaining her sisters in the other. "'Here we are. Good morning, Helen.' Helen replied, "'Good morning, Mr. Wilcox.' "'Henry, she has had such a nice letter from the queer cross boy. Do you remember him? He had a sad moustache, but the back of his head was young.' I have had a letter, too. Not a nice one. I want to talk it over with you." For Leonard Bast was nothing to him now that she had given him her word. The triangle of sex was broken for ever. "'Thanks to your hint, he's clearing out of the Porphyrian.' "'Not a bad business, that Porphyrian,' he said absently, as he took his own letter out of his pocket. "'Not a bad?' she exclaimed, dropping his hand. Surely, on Chelsea Embankment— Here's our hostess. Good morning, Mrs. Munt. Fine rhododendrons. Good morning, Frau Lisek. We manage to grow flowers in England, don't we? Not a bad business. No. My letter's about Howard's End. Bryce has been ordered abroad and wants to sublet it. I am far from sure that I shall give him permission. There is no clause in the agreement. In my opinion, subletting is a mistake. If he can find me another tenant whom I consider suitable, I may cancel the agreement. Morning, Schlegel. Don't you think that's better than subletting? Helen had dropped her hand now, and he had steered her past the whole party to the seaward side of the house. Beneath them was the bourgeois little bay, 
which must have yearned all through the centuries for just such a watering-place as Swanage to be built on its margin. The waves were colourless, and the Bournemouth steamer gave a further touch of insipidity, drawn up against the pier and hooting wildly for excursionists. "'When there is a sublet, I find that damage—do excuse me, but about the Porphyrion. I don't feel easy. Might I just bother you, Henry?' Her manner was so serious that he stopped, and asked her a little sharply what she wanted. "'You said, on Chelsea Embankment, surely, that it was a bad concern. So we advised this clerk to clear out. He writes this morning that he's taken our advice. And now you say it's not a bad concern.' A clerk who clears out of any concern, good or bad, without securing a berth somewhere else first, is a fool, and I've no pity for him. He has not done that. He's going into a bank in Camden Town, he says. The salary's much lower, but he hopes to manage. A branch of Dempster's bank. Is that all right? Dempster? My goodness me, yes. More right than the Porphyrian? Yes, yes, yes. Safe as houses. Safer. Very many thanks. I'm sorry. If you sublet. If he sublets, I shan't have the same control. In theory, there should be no more damage done at Howard's End. In practice, there will be. Things may be done for which no money can compensate. For instance, I shouldn't want that fine witch elm spoilt. It hangs. <laughs> Margaret, we must go and see the old place some time. It's pretty in its way. We'll motor down and have lunch with Charles. I should enjoy that," said Margaret bravely. What about next Wednesday? Wednesday? No, I couldn't well do that. Aunt Julie expects us to stop here another week at least. But you can give that up now. Er, uh, no," said Margaret, after a moment's thought. Oh, that'll be all right. I'll speak to her. This visit is a high solemnity. My aunt counts on it year after year. She turns the house upside down for us. She invites our special friends. She scarcely knows Frida, and we can't leave her on her hands. I missed one day, and she would be so hurt if I didn't stay the full ten. But I'll say a word to her, don't you bother. Henry, I won't go. Don't bully me. You want to see the house, though? Very much. I've heard so much about it one way or the other. Aren't there pig's teeth in the witch elm? Pig's teeth? And you chew the bark for toothache? What a rum notion! Of course not. Perhaps I have it confused with some other tree. There are still a great number of sacred trees in England, it seems. But he left her to intercept Mrs. Munt, whose voice could be heard in the distance, to be intercepted himself by Helen. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, about the Porphyrian— she began, and went scarlet all over her face. "'It's all right,' called Margaret, catching them up. "'Dempster's bank's better.' "'But I think you told us that the Porphyrian was bad, and would smash before Christmas.' "'Did I? Mm, it was still outside the tariff ring, and had to take rotten policies. Lately it came in. Safe as houses now.' "'In other words, Mr. Bast need never have left it.' No, the fellow needn't, and needn't have started life elsewhere at a greatly reduced salary. He only says reduced, corrected Margaret, seeing trouble ahead. With a man so poor, every reduction must be great. I consider it a deplorable misfortune. Mr. Wilcox, intent on his business with Mrs. Munt, was going steadily on, but the last remark made him say, What? What's that? Do you mean that I'm responsible? You're ridiculous, Helen. You seem to think— He looked at his watch. Let me explain the point to you. It is like this. You seem to assume when a business concern is conducting a delicate negotiation, it ought to keep the public informed stage by stage. The Porphyrian, according to you, was bound to say, I am trying all I can to get into the tariff ring. I am not sure that I shall succeed— but it is the only thing that will save me from insolvency, and I am trying. My dear Helen, is that your point? A man who had little money has less. That's mine. I am grieved for your clerk. But it is all in the day's work. It's part of the battle of life. A man who had little money, 
she repeated, has less, owing to us. Under these circumstances I do not consider the battle of life a happy expression. Oh, come, come, he protested pleasantly. You're not to blame. No one's to blame. Is no one to blame for anything? I wouldn't say that, but you're taking it far too seriously. Who is this fellow? We have told you about the fellow twice already, said Helen. You have even met the fellow. He is very poor, and his wife is an extravagant imbecile. He is capable of better things. We, we, the upper classes, thought we would help him from the height of our superior knowledge, and here's the result. He raised his finger. Now a word of advice. I require no more advice. A word of advice. Don't take up that sentimental attitude over the poor. See that she doesn't, Margaret. The poor are poor, and one sorry for them, but there it is. As civilization moves forward, the shoe is bound to pinch in places, and it's absurd to pretend that any one is responsible personally. Neither you, nor I, nor my informant, nor the man who informed him, nor the directors of the Porphyrian are to blame for this clerk's loss of salary. It's just the shoe pinching. No one can help it, and it might easily have been worse." Helen quivered with indignation. "'By all means, subscribe to charities. Subscribe to them largely. But don't get carried away by absurd schemes of social reform. I see a good deal behind the scenes, and you can take it from me that there is no social question, except for a few journalists who try to get a living out of the phrase. There are just rich and poor, as there always have been and always will be. Point me out a time when men have been equal.' I didn't say. Point me out a time when desire for equality has made them happier. No. No, you can't. There have always been rich and poor. I'm no fatalist. Heaven forbid. But our civilization is moulded by great impersonal forces. His voice grew complacent. It always did when he eliminated the personal. And there will always be rich and poor. You can't deny it. And now it was a respectful voice. And you can't deny that, in spite of all, the tendency of civilization has on the whole been upward. Owing to God, I suppose, flashed Helen. He stared at her. You grab the dollars. God does the rest. It was no good instructing the girl if she was going to talk about God in that neurotic modern way. Fraternal to the last, he left her for the quieter company of Mrs. Munt. He thought, She rather reminds me of Dolly. Helen looked out at the sea. Don't even discuss political economy with Henry, advised her sister. It'll only end in a cry. But he must be one of those men who have reconciled science with religion, said Helen slowly. I don't like those men. They are scientific themselves and talk of the survival of the fittest, and cut down the salaries of their clerks, and stunt the independence of all who may menace their comfort, but yet they believe that somehow good—and it is always that sloppy somehow—will be the outcome, and that in some mystical way the Mr. Basts of the future will benefit because the Mr. Basts of to-day are in pain. He is such a man in theory. But, oh, Helen, in theory! But, oh, Meg, what a theory! Why should you put things so bitterly, dearie? Because I'm an old maid, said Helen, biting her lip. I can't think why I go on like this myself. She shook off her sister's hand and went into the house. Margaret, distressed at the day's beginning, followed the Bournemouth steamer with her eyes. She saw that Helen's nerves were exasperated by the unlucky bast business beyond the bounds of politeness. There might at any minute be a real explosion, which even Henry would notice. Henry must be removed. "'Margaret!' her aunt called. "'Magsy! It isn't true, surely, what Mr. Wilcox says, that you want to go away early next week?' "'Not want,' was Margaret's prompt reply. "'But there is so much to be settled, and I do want to see the Charleses.' "'Going away without taking the Weymouth trip, or even the Lulworth,' said Mrs. Munt, coming nearer. 
without going once more up nine barrows down. I'm afraid so. Mr. Wilcox rejoined her with, Good. I did the breaking of the ice. A wave of tenderness came over her. She put a hand on either shoulder, and looked deeply into the black, bright eyes. What was behind their competent stare? She knew, but was not disquieted. End of chapter 22 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 23 Margaret had no intention of letting things slide, and the evening before she left Swanage she gave her sister a thorough scolding. She censured her, not for disapproving of the engagement, but for throwing over her disapproval a veil of mystery. Helen was equally frank. Yes, she said, with the air of one looking inwards. There is a mystery. I can't help it. It's not my fault. It's the way life has been made. Helen, in those days, was over-interested in the subconscious self. She exaggerated the punch and judy aspect of life, and spoke of mankind as puppets, whom an invisible showman twitches into love and war. Margaret pointed out that if she dwelt on this, she, too, would eliminate the personal. Helen was silent for a minute, and then burst into a queer speech which cleared the air. "'Go on and marry him. I think you're splendid. And if any one can pull it off, you will.' Margaret denied that there was anything to pull off, but she continued, "'Yes, there is. And I wasn't up to it with Paul. I can only do what's easy. I can only entice and be enticed. I can't and won't attempt difficult relations. If I marry, it will either be a man who's strong enough to boss me, or whom I'm strong enough to boss. So I shan't ever marry, for there aren't such men. And heaven help any one whom I do marry— for I shall certainly run away from him before you can say Jack Robinson. There, because I'm uneducated. But you, you're different. You're a heroine. Oh, Helen, am I? Will it be as dreadful for poor Henry as all that? You mean to keep proportion, and that's heroic. It's Greek, and I don't see why it shouldn't succeed with you. Go on and fight with him and help him. Don't ask me for help, or even for sympathy. Henceforward I'm going my own way. I mean to be thorough, because thoroughness is easy. I mean to dislike your husband, and to tell him so. I mean to make no concessions to Tibby. If Tibby wants to live with me, he must lump me. I mean to love you more than ever. Yes, I do. You and I have built up something real, because it is purely spiritual— there's no veil of mystery over us. Unreality and mystery begin as soon as one touches the body. The popular view is, as usual, exactly the wrong one. Our bothers are over tangible things—money, husbands, house-hunting. But heaven will work of itself." Margaret was grateful for this expression of affection, and answered, "'Perhaps. All vistas close in the unseen. No one doubts it but Helen closed them rather too quickly for her taste. At every turn of speech one was confronted with reality and the absolute. Perhaps Margaret grew too old for metaphysics, perhaps Henry was weaning her from them, but she felt that there was something a little unbalanced in the mind that so readily shreds the visible. The businessman who assumes that this life is everything, and the mystic who asserts that it is nothing, fail, on this side and on that, to hit the truth. "'Yes, I see, dear. It's about half-way between,' Aunt Julie had hazarded in earlier years. No. Truth, being alive, was not half-way between anything. It was only to be found by continuous excursions into either realm, and though proportion is the final secret, to espouse it at the outset is to ensure sterility. Helen, agreeing here, disagreeing there, would have talked till midnight— but Margaret, with her packing to do, focused the conversation on Henry. She might abuse Henry behind his back, but please, would she always be civil to him in company? "'I definitely dislike him. But I'll do what I can,' promised Helen. "'Do what you can with my friends in return.' This conversation made Margaret easier. 
Their inner life was so safe that they could bargain over externals in a way that would have been incredible to Aunt Julie, and impossible for Tibby or Charles. There are moments when the inner life actually pays, when years of self-scrutiny, conducted for no ulterior motive, are suddenly of practical use. Such moments are still rare in the West. That they come at all promises a fairer future. Margaret, though unable to understand her sister, was assured against estrangement, and returned to London with a more peaceful mind. The following morning at eleven o'clock she presented herself at the offices of the Imperial and West African Rubber Company. She was glad to go there, for Henry had implied his business rather than described it, and the formlessness and vagueness that one associates with Africa had hitherto brooded over the main sources of his wealth. Not that a visit to the office cleared things up. There was just the ordinary surface scum of ledgers and polished counters, and brass bars that began and stopped for no possible reason, of electric light-globes blossoming in triplets, of little rabbit hutches faced with glass or wire, of little rabbits. And even when she penetrated to the inner depths, she found only the ordinary table and turkey carpet, and though the map over the fireplace did depict a helping of West Africa, it was a very ordinary map. Another map hung opposite, on which the whole continent appeared, looking like a whale marked out for blubber, and by its side was a door, shut, but Henry's voice came through it dictating a strong letter. She might have been at the Porphyrion, or Dempster's Bank, or her own wine merchant's. Everything seems just alike in these days. But perhaps she was seeing the imperial side of the company, rather than its West African, and imperialism always had been one of her difficulties. "'One minute,' called Mr. Wilcox, on receiving her name. He touched a bell, the effect of which was to produce Charles. Charles had written his father an adequate letter, more adequate than Evie's, through which a girlish indignation throbbed and he greeted his future stepmother with propriety. "'I hope that my wife—how do you do—will give you a decent lunch,' was his opening. "'I left instructions, but we live in a rough and ready way. She expects you back to tea, too, after you have had a look at Howard's End. I wonder what you'll think of the place. I wouldn't touch it with tongs myself. Do sit down. It's a measly little place.' "'I shall enjoy seeing it,' said Margaret, feeling for the first time shy. You'll see it at its worst, for Bryce to camp abroad last Monday, without even arranging for a charwoman to clear up after him. I never saw such a disgraceful mess. It's unbelievable. He wasn't in the house a month." "'I've more than a little bone to pick with Bryce,' called Henry from the inner chamber. "'Why did he go so suddenly?' "'Invalid type. Couldn't sleep.' "'Poor fellow!' "'Poor fiddlesticks!' said Mr. Wilcox, joining them. He had the impudence to put up notice-boards, without as much as saying, with your leave, or by your leave. Charles flung them down. "'Yes, I flung them down,' said Charles modestly. "'I've sent a telegram after him, and a pretty sharp one, too. He, and he in person, is responsible for the upkeep of that house for the next three years. "'The keys are at the farm. We wouldn't have the keys.' "'Quite right. Dolly would have taken them, but I was in, fortunately.' "'What's Mr. Bryce like?' asked Margaret. But nobody cared. Mr. Bryce was the tenant, who had no right to sublet. To have defined him further was a waste of time. On his misdeeds they descanted profusely, until the girl who had been typing the strong letter came out with it. Mr. Wilcox added his signature. "'Now we'll be off,' said he. A motor-drive, a form of felicity detested by Margaret, awaited her. Charles saw them in, civil to the last, and in a moment the offices of the Imperial and West African Rubber Company faded away. But it was not an impressive drive. Perhaps the weather was to blame, being grey and banked high with weary clouds. Perhaps Hertfordshire is scarcely intended for motorists. Did not a gentleman once motor so quickly through Westmoreland that he missed it? And if Westmoreland can be missed— it will fare ill with a county whose delicate structure particularly needs the attentive eye. Hertfordshire is England at its quietest, with little emphasis of river and hill. It is England meditative. If Drayton were here with us again to write a new edition of his incomparable poem, he would sing the nymphs of Hertfordshire as indeterminate of feature, with hair obfuscated by the London smoke. 
Their eyes would be sad, and averted from their fate towards the northern flats, their leader not Isis or Sabrina, but the slowly flowing Lee. No glory of raiment would be theirs, no urgency of dance, but they would be real nymphs. The chauffeur could not travel as quickly as he had hoped, for the great north road was full of Easter traffic. But he went quite quick enough for Margaret, a poor-spirited creature, who had chickens and children on the brain. "'They're all right,' said Mr. Wilcox. "'They'll learn, like the swallows and the telegraph wires.' "'Yes, but while they're learning—' "'The boat has come to stay,' he answered. "'One must get about. There's a pretty church, though you aren't sharp enough. Well, look out, if the road worries you, right outward at the scenery.' She looked at the scenery. It heaved and merged like porridge. Presently it congealed. They had arrived. Charles's house on the left, on the right the swelling forms of the six hills. Their appearance in such a neighborhood surprised her. They interrupted the stream of residences that was thickening up towards Hilton. Beyond them she saw meadows and a wood, and beneath them she settled that soldiers of the best kind lay buried. She hated war, and liked soldiers. It was one of her amiable inconsistencies. But here was Dolly, dressed up to the nines, standing at the door to greet them, and here were the first drops of the rain. They ran in gaily, and after a long wait in the drawing-room sat down to the rough-and-ready lunch, every dish in which concealed or exuded cream. Mr. Bryce was the chief topic of conversation. Dolly described his visit with the key, while her father-in-law gave satisfaction by chaffing her and contradicting all she said. It was evidently the custom to laugh at Dolly. He chaffed Margaret, too, and Margaret, roused from a grave meditation, was pleased, and chaffed him back. Dolly seemed surprised, and eyed her curiously. After lunch the two children came down. Margaret disliked babies, but hit it off better with the two-year-old, and sent Dolly into fits of laughter by talking sense to him. "'Kiss them now, and come away,' said Mr. Wilcox. She came, but refused to kiss them. It was such hard luck on the little things, she said, and though Dolly proffered chorley worley and porgly woggles in turn, she was obdurate. By this time it was raining steadily. The car came round with the hood up, and again she lost all sense of space. In a few minutes they stopped, and Crane opened the door of the car. "'What's happened?' asked Margaret. "'What do you suppose?' said Henry. A little porch was close up against her face. "'Are we there already?' "'We are.' "'Well, I never. In years ago it seemed so far away.' Smiling, but somehow disillusioned, she jumped out, and her impetus carried her to the front door. She was about to open it when Henry said, "'That's no good. It's locked. Who's got the key?' As he had himself forgotten to call for the key at the farm, no one replied. He also wanted to know who had left the front gate open, since a cow had strayed in from the road and was spoiling the croquet lawn. Then he said rather crossly, "'Margaret, you wait in the dry. I'll go down for the key. It isn't a hundred yards.' "'Mayn't I come, too?' "'No, I shall be back before I'm gone.' Then the car turned away, and it was as if a curtain had risen. For the second time that day she saw the appearance of the earth. There were the green-gauge trees that Helen had once described. There the tennis lawn. There the hedge that would be glorious with dog-roses in June. But the vision now was of black and palest green. Down by the dell-hole more vivid colors were awakening, and lent lily stood sentinel on its margin, or advanced in battalions over the grass. Tulips were a tray of jewels. She could not see the witch-elm tree, but a branch of the celebrated vine studded with velvet knobs had covered the porch. She was struck by the fertility of the soil. She had seldom been in a garden where the flowers looked so well, and even the weeds she was idly plucking out of the porch were intensely green. Why had poor Mr. Bryce fled from all this beauty? For she had already decided that the place was beautiful. "'Naughty cow! Go away!' cried Margaret to the cow, but without indignation. Harder came the rain, pouring out of a windless sky, and spattering up from the notice-boards of the house-agents, which lay in a row on the lawn where Charles had hurled them. She must have interviewed Charles in another world, where one did have interviews. How Helen would revel in such a notion! Charles dead! 
all people dead, nothing alive but houses and gardens, the obvious dead, the intangible alive, and no connection at all between them. Margaret smiled. Would that her own fancies were as clear-cut! Would that she could deal as high-handedly with the world! Smiling and sighing, she laid her hand upon the door. It opened. The house was not locked up at all. She hesitated. Ought she to wait for Henry? He felt strongly about property, and might prefer to show her over himself. On the other hand, he had told her to keep in the dry, and the porch was beginning to drip. So she went in, and the draught from inside slammed the door behind. Desolation greeted her. Dirty fingerprints were on the hall windows, flue and rubbish on its unwashed boards. The civilization of luggage had been here for a month, and then decamped. Dining-room and drawing-room, right and left, were guessed only by their wallpapers. They were just rooms where one could shelter from the rain. Across the ceiling of each ran a great beam. The dining-room and hall revealed theirs openly, but the drawing-rooms was match-boarded, because the facts of life must be concealed from ladies. Drawing-room, dining-room, and hall. How petty the names sounded! Here were simply three rooms where children could play, and friends shelter from the rain. Yes, and they were beautiful. Then she opened one of the doors opposite—there were two—and exchanged wallpapers for whitewash. It was the servant's part, though she scarcely realized that, just rooms again, where friends might shelter. The garden at the back was full of flowering cherries and plums. Farther on were hints of the meadow, and a black cliff of pines. Yes, the meadow was beautiful. Penned in by the desolate weather, she recaptured the sense of space which the motor had tried to rob from her. She remembered again that ten square miles are not ten times as wonderful as one square mile, that a thousand square miles are not practically the same as heaven. The phantom of bigness which London encourages was laid for ever when she paced from the hall at Howard's End to its kitchen, and heard the rains run this way and that where the watershed of the roof divided them. Now Helen came to her mind, scrutinizing half Wessex from the ridge of the Purbeck Downs, and saying, you will have to lose something." She was not so sure. For instance, she would double her kingdom by opening the door that concealed the stairs. Now she thought of the map of Africa, of empires, of her father, of the two supreme nations, streams of whose life warmed her blood, but mingling had cooled her brain. She paced back into the hall, and as she did so, the house reverberated. "'Is that you, Henry?' she called. There was no answer, but the house reverberated again. "'Henry, have you got in?' But it was the heart of the house beating, faintly at first, then loudly, martially. It dominated the rain. It is the starved imagination, not the well-nourished, that is afraid. Margaret flung open the door to the stairs. A noise, as of drums, seemed to deafen her. A woman— an old woman was descending, with figure erect, with face impassive, with lips that parted and said dryly, "'Oh! Well, I took you for Ruth Wilcox.' Margaret stammered, "'Aye! Mrs. Wilcox! Aye!' "'In fancy, of course, in fancy. You had her way of walking. Good day.' and the old woman passed out into the rain. End of chapter 23 Domain For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 24 It gave her quite a turn, said Mr. Wilcox, when retailing the incident to Dolly at tea-time. "'None of you girls have any nerves, really. Of course, a word from me put it all right. But silly old Miss Avery! She frightened you, didn't she, Margaret? There you stood, clutching a bunch of weeds. She might have said something, instead of coming down the stairs with that alarming bonnet on. I passed her as I came in, enough to make the car shy. I believe Miss Avery goes in for being a character. Some old maids do he lit a cigarette. It is their last resource. Heaven knows what she was doing in the place. 
But that's Bryce's business, not mine. I wasn't as foolish as you suggest, said Margaret. She only startled me, for the house had been silent so long. Did you take her for a spook? asked Dolly, for whom spooks and going to church summarized the unseen. Not exactly. She really did frighten you said Henry, who was far from discouraging timidity in females. Poor Margaret! And very naturally! Uneducated classes are so stupid!" "'Is Miss Avery uneducated classes?' Margaret asked, and found herself looking at the decoration scheme of Dolly's drawing-room. "'She's just one of the crew at the farm. People like that always assume things. She assumed you'd know who she was. She left all the hounds and keys in the front lobby and assumed that you'd see them as you came in, and that you'd lock up the house when you'd done, and would bring them on down to her. And there was her niece hunting for them down at the farm. Lack of education makes people very casual. Hilton was full of women like Miss Avery once. I shouldn't have disliked it, perhaps. Or Miss Avery giving me a wedding present, said Dolly. Which was illogical, but interesting. Through Dolly, Margaret was destined to learn a great deal. But Charles said I must try not to mind, because she had known his grandmother. As usual, you've got the story wrong, my good Dorothea. I mean great-grandmother, the one who left Mrs. Wilcox the house. Weren't both of them and Miss Avery friends when Howard's End, too, was a farm? Her father-in-law blew out a shaft of smoke. His attitude to his dead wife was curious. He would allude to her and hear her discussed, but never mentioned her by name. Nor was he interested in the dim, bucolic past. Dolly was, for the following reason. Then hadn't Mrs. Wilcox a brother? Or was it an uncle? Anyhow, he popped the question, and Miss Avery, she said no. Just imagine if she'd said yes, she would have been Charles's aunt. Oh, I say, that's rather good. Charlie's aunt. I must chaff him about that this evening. And the man went out and was killed. Yes, I'm certain I've got it right now. Tom Howard, he was the last of them. I believe so, said Mr. Wilcox, negligently. I say, Howard's end, Howard's ended, cried Dolly. I'm rather on the spot this evening, eh? I wish you'd ask where the cranes ended. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, how can you? Because if he has had enough tea, we ought to go. Dolly's a good little woman," he continued, but a little of her goes a long way. I couldn't live near her if you paid me." Margaret smiled. Though presenting a firm front to outsiders, no Wilcox could live near, or near the possessions of, any other Wilcox. They had the colonial spirit, and were always making for some spot where the white man might carry his burden unobserved. Of course Howard's end was impossible, so long as the younger couple were established in Hilton. His objections to the house were plain as daylight now. Crane had had enough tea, and was sent to the garage, where their car had been trickling muddy water over Charles's. The downpour had surely penetrated the six hills by now, bringing news of our restless civilization. "'Curious mounds,' said Henry. "'But in with you now, another time.' He had to be up in London by seven, if possible by six-thirty. Once more she lost the sense of space. Once more, trees, houses, people, animals, hills, merged and heaved into one dirtiness, and she was at Wickham Place. Her evening was pleasant. The sense of flux which had haunted her all the year disappeared for a time. She forgot the luggage and the motor-cars, and the hurrying men who know so much and connect so little. She recaptured the sense of space, which is the basis of all earthly beauty, and starting from Howard's End, she attempted to realize England. She failed. Visions do not come when we try, though they may come through trying. But an unexpected love of the island awoke in her, connecting on this side with the joys of the flesh, on that with the inconceivable. Helen and her father had known this love. Poor Leonard Bast was groping after it. But it had been hidden from Margaret till this afternoon. It had certainly come through the house, and old Miss Avery. Through them, the notion of through persisted. Her mind trembled toward a conclusion which only the unwise have put into words. Then, veering back into warmth, 
It dwelt on ruddy bricks, flowering plum-trees, and all the tangible joys of spring. Henry, after allaying her agitation, had taken her over his property, and had explained to her the use and dimensions of the various rooms. He had sketched the history of the little estate. "'It is so unlucky,' ran the monologue, "'that money wasn't put into it about fifty years ago. Then it had four—five times the land, thirty acres at least. One could have made something out of it then—a small park, or at all events shrubberies, and rebuilt the house farther away from the road. What's the good of taking it in hand now? Nothing but the meadow left, and even that was heavily mortgaged when I first had to do with things. Yes, and the house, too. Oh, it was no joke." She saw two women as he spoke, one old, the other young, watching their inheritance melt away. She saw them greet him as a deliverer. "'Mismanagement did it. Besides, the days for small farms are over. It doesn't pay, except with intense cultivation. Small holdings back to the land. Ha! Ah, philanthropic bunkum! Take it as a rule that nothing pays on a small scale. Most of the land you see—they were standing at an upper window, the only one which faced west—belongs to the people at the park. They made their pile over copper. Good chaps. Avery's farm, Sishes, what they call the common, where you see that ruined oak, one after the other fell in, and so did this, as near as is no matter. But Henry had saved it, without fine feelings or deep insight, but he had saved it, and she loved him for the deed. When I had more control I did what I could. Sold off the two and a half animals, and the mangy pony, and the superannuated tools, pulled down the outhouses, drained, thinned out I don't know how many gulder roses and elder trees, and inside the house I turned the old kitchen into a hall, and made a kitchen behind where the dairy was. A garage and so on came later. But one could still tell it's been an old farm. And yet it isn't the place that would fetch one of your artistic crew." No, it wasn't. And if he did not quite understand it, the artistic crew would still less. It was English, and the witch-elm that she saw from the window was an English tree. No report had prepared her for its peculiar glory. It was neither warrior, nor lover, nor god. In none of these roles did the English excel. It was a comrade, bending over the house strength and adventure in its roots, but in its utmost fingers tenderness, and the girth that a dozen men could not have spanned, became in the end evanescent, till pale bud clusters seemed to float in the air. It was a comrade. House and tree transcended any similes of sex. Margaret thought of them now, and was to think of them through many a windy night and London day, but to compare either to man to woman always dwarfed the vision. Yet they kept within limits of the human. Their message was not of eternity, but of hope on this side of the grave. As she stood in the one, gazing at the other, truer relationship had gleamed. Another touch, and the account of her days finished. They entered the garden for a minute, and to Mr. Wilcox's surprise she was right. Teeth! Pig's teeth could be seen in the bark of the witch-elm tree, just the white tips of them showing. "'Extraordinary!' he cried. "'Who told you?' "'I heard of it one winter in London,' was her answer, for she, too, avoided mentioning Mrs. Wilcox by name. End of chapter 24 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 25 Evie heard of her father's engagement when she was in for a tennis tournament, and her play went simply to pot. That she should marry and leave him had seemed natural enough. That he, left alone, should do the same was deceitful, and now Charles and Dolly said it was all her fault. "'But I never dreamt of such a thing,' she grumbled. Dad took me to call now and then, and made me ask her to Simpson's. Well, I'm altogether off, Dad." It was also an insult to their mother's memory. There they were agreed, and Evie had the idea of returning Mrs. Wilcox's lace and jewellery, as a protest. Against what it would protest she was not clear, but being only eighteen, the idea of renunciation appealed to her, 
the more as she did not care for jewellery or lace. Dolly then suggested that she and Uncle Percy should pretend to break off their engagement, and then perhaps Mr. Wilcox would quarrel with Miss Schlegel and break off his, or Paul might be cabled for. But at this point Charles told them not to talk nonsense. So Evie settled to marry as soon as possible. It was no good hanging about with these Schlegels eyeing her. The date of her wedding was consequently put forward from September to August, and in the intoxication of presents she recovered much of her good humour. Margaret found that she was expected to figure at this function, and to figure largely. It would be such an opportunity, said Henry, for her to get to know his set. Sir James Bitter would be there, and all the Cahills and the Fussells, and his sister-in-law, Mrs. Warrington Wilcox, had fortunately got back from her tour around the world. Henry she loved, but his set promised to be another matter. He had not the knack of surrounding himself with nice people. Indeed, for a man of ability and virtue, his choice had been singularly unfortunate. He had no guiding principle beyond a certain preference for mediocrity. He was content to settle one of the greatest things in life haphazard, and so, while his investments went right, his friends generally went wrong. She would be told, "'Oh, so-and-so's a good sort, a thundering good sort,' and find, on meeting him, that he was a brute or a bore. If Henry had shown real affection, she would have understood, for affection explains everything. But he seemed without sentiment. The thundering good sort might at any moment become a fellow for whom I never did have much use, and have less now, and be shaken off cheerily into oblivion. Margaret had done the same as a schoolgirl. Now she never forgot any one for whom she had once cared. She connected, though the connection might be bitter, and she hoped that some day Henry would do the same. Evie was not to be married from Ducie Street. She had a fancy for something rural, and besides, no one would be in London then, so she left her boxes for a few weeks at Oniton Grange, and her bands were duly published in the parish church, and for a couple of days the little town, dreaming between the ruddy hills, was roused by the clang of our civilization, and drew up by the roadside to let the motors pass. Oniton had been a discovery of Mr. Wilcox's, a discovery of which he was not altogether proud. It was up towards the Welsh border, and so difficult of access that he had concluded it must be something special. A ruined castle stood in the grounds. But having got there, what was one to do? The shooting was bad, the fishing indifferent, and womenfolk reported the scenery as nothing much. The place turned out to be in the wrong part of Shropshire, damn it! and though he never damned his own property aloud, he was only waiting to get it off his hands, and then to let fly. Evie's marriage was its last appearance in public. As soon as a tenant was found, it became a house for which he never had had much use, and had less now, and, like Howard's end, faded into limbo. But on Margaret, Oniton was destined to make a lasting impression. She regarded it as her future home, and was anxious to start straight with the clergy, etc., and, if possible, to see something of the local life. It was a market-town, as tiny a one as England possesses, and had for ages served that lonely valley, and guarded our marches against the Celt. In spite of the occasion, in spite of the numbing hilarity that greeted her as soon as she got into the reserved saloon at Paddington, her senses were awake and watching, and though Oniton was to prove one of her innumerable false starts, she never forgot it, nor the things that happened there. The London party only numbered eight, the Fussells, father and son, two Anglo-Indian ladies named Mrs. Plinlimmon and Lady Edser, Mrs. Warrington Wilcox and her daughter, and lastly the little girl, very smart and quiet, who figures at so many weddings, and who kept a watchful eye on Margaret, the bride-elect. Dolly was absent, a domestic event detained her at Hilton, Paul had cabled a humorous message. Charles was to meet them with a trio of motors at Shrewsbury. Helen had refused her invitation. Tibby had never answered his. The management was excellent, as was to be expected with anything that Henry undertook. One was conscious of his sensible and generous brain in the background. They were his guests as soon as they reached the train, a special label for their luggage, a courier, a special lunch, they had only to look pleasant, and, where possible, pretty. Margaret thought with dismay of her own nuptials, presumably under the management of Tibby. 
Mr. Tybalt Schlegel and Miss Helen Schlegel request the pleasure of Mrs. Plinlimmon's company on the occasion of the marriage of their sister Margaret. The formula was incredible, but it must soon be printed and sent, and though Wickham Place need not compete with Oniton, it must feed its guests properly and provide them with sufficient chairs. Her wedding would either be ramshackly or bourgeois, she hoped the latter. Such an affair as the present, staged with a deftness that was almost beautiful, lay beyond her powers and those of her friends. The low, rich purr of a great western express is not the worst background for conversation, and the journey passed pleasantly enough. Nothing could have exceeded the kindness of the two men. They raised windows for some ladies, and lowered them for others. They rang the bell for the servant. They identified the colleges as the train slipped past Oxford. They caught books or bag-purses in the act of tumbling to the floor. Yet there was nothing finicky about their politeness. It had the public-school touch, and, though sedulous, was virile. More battles than Waterloo have been won on our playing-fields, and Margaret bowed to a charm of which she did not wholly approve, and said nothing when the Oxford colleges were identified wrongly. Male and female created he them. The journey to Shrewsbury confirmed this questionable statement, and the long glass saloon, that moved so easily and felt so comfortable, became a forcing-house for the idea of sex. At Shrewsbury came fresh air. Margaret was all for sight-seeing, and while the others were finishing their tea at the Raven, she annexed a motor and hurried over the astonishing city. Her chauffeur was not the faithful crane, but an Italian, who dearly loved making her late. Charles, watch in hand, though with a level brow, was standing in front of the hotel when they returned. It was perfectly all right, he told her. She was by no means the last. And then he dived into the coffee-room, and she heard him say, For God's sake, hurry the women up. We shall never be off. And Albert Fussell reply, Not I. I've done my share. And Colonel Fussell opined that the ladies were getting themselves up to kill. Presently Myra, Mrs. Warrington's daughter, appeared, and as she was his cousin, Charles blew her up a little. She had been changing her smart travelling hat for a smart motor hat. Then Mrs. Warrington herself, leading the quiet child. The two Anglo-Indian ladies were always last. Maids, courier, heavy luggage, had already gone on by a branch line to a station nearer Oniton. But there were five hat-boxes and four dressing-bags to be packed, and five dust-cloaks to be put on, and to be put off at the last moment, because Charles declared them not necessary. The men presided over everything with unfailing good humour. By half-past five the party was ready, and went out of Shrewsbury by the Welsh Bridge. Shropshire had not the reticence of Hertfordshire. Though robbed of half its magic by swift movement, it still conveyed the sense of hills. They were nearing the buttresses that force the Severn eastern, and make it an English stream, and the sun, sinking over the sentinels of Wales, was straight in their eyes. Having picked up another guest, they turned southward, avoiding the greater mountains, but conscious of an occasional summit, rounded and mild, whose colouring differed in quality from that of the lower earth, and whose contours altered more slowly. Quiet mysteries were in progress behind those tossing horizons. The West, as ever, was retreating with some secret, which may not be worth the discovery, but which no practical man will ever discover. They spoke of tariff reform. Mrs. Warrington was just back from the colonies. Like many other critics of empire, her mouth had been stopped with food, and she could only exclaim at the hospitality with which she had been received, and warn the mother country against trifling with young titans. "'They threaten to cut the painter!' she cried. "'And where shall we be then? "'Miss Schlegel, you'll undertake to keep Henry sound about tariff reform. "'It is our last hope.' "'Margaret playfully confessed herself on the other side, "'and they began to quote from their respective handbooks, "'while the motor carried them deep into the hills. "'Curious, these were, rather than impressive, "'for their outlines lacked beauty, "'and the pink fields, on their summit, "'suggested the handkerchiefs of a giant spread out to dry. "'An occasional outcrop of rock,' an occasional wood, an occasional forest, treeless and brown, all hinted at wildness to follow, but the main colour was an agricultural green. The air grew cooler, they had surmounted the last gradient, and Oniton lay below them with its church, its radiating houses, its castle, its river-girt peninsula. Close to the castle was a grey mansion, 
unintellectual but kindly, stretching with its grounds across the peninsula's neck, the sort of mansion that was built all over England in the beginning of the last century, while architecture was still an expression of the national character. That was the Grange, remarked Albert, over his shoulder, and then he jammed the brake on, and the motor slowed down and stopped. I'm sorry, he said, turning around. Do you mind getting out by the door on the right? Steady on. What's happened? asked Mrs. Warrington. Then the car behind them drew up, and the voice of Charles was heard saying, Get out the women at once. There was a concourse of males, and Margaret and her companions were hustled out and received into the second car. What had happened? As it started off again, the door of a cottage opened, and a girl screamed wildly at them. What is it? the ladies cried. Charles drove them a hundred yards without speaking. Then he said, It's all right. Your car just touched a dog. But stop! cried Margaret, horrified. It didn't hurt him. Didn't really hurt him? asked Myra. No. Do please stop! said Margaret, leaning forward. She was standing up in the car, the other occupants holding her knees to steady her. I want to go back, please. Charles took no notice. We've left Mr. Fussell behind, said another, and Angelo and Crane. Yes, but no woman. I expect a little of— Mrs. Warrington scratched her palm. Will be more to the point than one of us. The insurance company sees to that, remarked Charles, and Albert will do the talking. I want to go back, though, I say, repeated Margaret, getting angry. Charles took no notice. The motor, loaded with refugees, continued to travel very slowly down the hill. "'The men are there,' chorused the others. "'Men will see to it.' "'The men can't see to it. Oh, this is ridiculous. Charles, I ask you to stop.' "'Stopping's no good,' drawled Charles. "'Isn't it?' said Margaret, and jumped straight out of the car. She fell on her knees, cut her gloves, shook her hat over her ear. Cries of alarm followed her. "'You've hurt yourself!' exclaimed Charles, jumping after her. "'Of course I've hurt myself,' she retorted. "'May I ask what? There's nothing to ask,' said Margaret. "'Your hand's bleeding.' "'I know. I'm in for a frightful row from the pater. You should have thought of that sooner, Charles.' Charles had never been in such a position before. It was a woman in revolt who was hobbling away from him, and the sight was too strange to leave any room for anger. He recovered himself when the others caught them up, their sort he understood. He commanded them to go back. Albert Fussell was seen walking towards them. "'It's all right,' he called. "'It wasn't a dog, it was a cat.' "'There!' exclaimed Charles triumphantly. "'It's only a rotten cat.' "'Got room in your car for a little un? I caught as soon as I saw it wasn't a dog. The chauffeurs are tackling the girl.' But Margaret walked forward steadily. Why should the chauffeurs tackle the girl? Ladies sheltering behind men, men sheltering behind servants. The whole system's wrong, and she must challenge it. Miss Schlegel, upon my word, you've hurt your hand. I'm just going to see, said Margaret. Don't you wait, Mr. Fussell. The second motor came round the corner. It is all right, madam, said Crane in his turn. He had taken to calling her madam. What's all right? The cat— Yes, madam. The girl will receive compensation for it. She was a very rude girl, said Angelo, from the third motor, thoughtfully. Wouldn't you have been rude? The Italian spread out his hands, implying that he had not thought of rudeness, but would produce it if it pleased her. The situation became absurd. The gentlemen were again buzzing round Miss Schlegel with offers of assistance, and Lady Edser began to bind up her hand. She yielded, apologizing slightly, and was led back to the car, and soon the landscape resumed its motion, the lonely cottage disappeared, the castle swelled on its cushion of turf, and they had arrived. No doubt she had disgraced herself. But she felt their whole journey from London had been unreal. They had no part with the earth and its emotions. They were dust, and stink, and cosmopolitan chatter, and a girl whose cat had been killed had lived more deeply than they. "'Oh, Henry!' she exclaimed. "'I have been so naughty!' For she had decided to take up this line. "'We ran over a cat. 
Charles told me not to jump out, but I would, and look. She held out her bandaged hand. Your poor Meg went such a flop. Mr. Wilcox looked bewildered. In evening dress he was standing to welcome his guests in the hall. Thinking it was a dog, added Mrs. Warrington. Ah, dog's a companion, said Colonel Fussell. A dog will remember you. Have you hurt yourself, Margaret? Not to speak about, and it's my left hand. Well, hurry up and change. She obeyed, as did the others. Mr. Wilcox then turned to his son. Now, Charles, what's happened? Charles was absolutely honest. He described what he believed to have happened. Albert had flattened out a cat, and Miss Schlegel had lost her nerve, as any woman might. She had been got safely into the other car, but when it was in motion had leapt out, again, in spite of all that they could say. After walking a little on the road, she had calmed down, and had said that she was sorry. His father accepted this explanation, and neither knew that Margaret had artfully prepared the way for it. It fitted in too well with their view of feminine nature. In the smoking-room, after dinner, the Colonel put forward the view that Miss Schlegel had jumped it out of devilry. Well he remembered as a younger man in the harbour of Gibraltar once, how a girl, a handsome girl, too, had jumped overboard for a bet. He could see her now, and all the lads overboard after her. But Charles and Mr. Wilcox agreed it was much more probably nerves in Miss Schlegel's case. Charles was depressed. That woman had a tongue. She would bring worse disgrace on his father before she had done with them. He strolled out to the castle mound to think the matter over. The evening was exquisite. On three sides of him a little river whispered, full of messages from the west. Above his head the ruins made patterns against the sky. He carefully reviewed their dealings with this family, until he fitted Helen and Margaret and Aunt Julie into an orderly conspiracy. Paternity had made him suspicious. He had two children to look after, and more coming, and day by day they seemed less likely to grow up rich men. "'It is all very well,' he reflected, "'the pater saying that he will be just to all. But one can't be just indefinitely. Money isn't elastic. What's to happen if Evie has a family? And come to that, so may the pater. There'll not be enough to go round, for there's none coming in, either through Dolly or Percy. It's damnable.' He looked enviously at the Grange, whose windows poured light and laughter. First and last, this wedding would cost a pretty penny. Two ladies were strolling up and down the garden terrace, and as the syllables, imperialism, were wafted to his ears, he guessed that one of them was his aunt. She might have helped him, if she too had not had a family to provide for. "'Every one for himself,' he repeated, a maxim which had cheered him in the past but which rang grimly enough among the ruins of Oniton. He lacked his father's ability in business, and so had an ever higher regard for money. Unless he could inherit plenty, he feared to leave his children poor. As he sat thinking, one of the ladies left the terrace and walked into the meadow. He recognized her as Margaret by the white bandage that gleamed on her arm, and put out his cigar lest the gleam should betray him. She climbed up the mound in zigzags, and at times stooped down as if she was stroking the turf. It sounds absolutely incredible, but for a moment Charles thought that she was in love with him, and had come out to tempt him. Charles believed in temptresses, who are indeed the strong man's necessary compliment, and having no sense of humour he could not purge himself of the thought by a smile. Margaret, who was engaged to his father, and his sister's wedding-guest, kept on her way without noticing him, and he admitted that he had wronged her on this point. But what was she doing? Why was she stumbling about amongst the rubble and catching her dress in brambles and burrs? As she edged round the keep she must have got to leeward and smelt his cigar smoke, for as she exclaimed, "'Hello! Who's that?' Charles made no answer. "'Saxon or Celt!' she continued, laughing in the darkness. "'But it doesn't matter. Whichever you are, you will have to listen to me. I love this place. I love Shropshire. I hate London.' I am glad that this will be my home. Ah, dear! She was now moving back towards the house. What a comfort to have arrived! That woman means mischief, thought Charles, and compressed his lips. In a few minutes he followed her indoors, as the ground was getting damp. Mists were rising from the river, and presently it became invisible, though it whispered more loudly. There had been a heavy downpour in the Welsh hills. 
End of chapter 25